All right, if folks could take their seats, we'll get started. We don't want to run behind like we did yesterday. So before we get started, I will ask our executive director if there are any announcements. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman and council members. Uh, no announcements for me this morning, but thank you. All right, then we'll get started without any further ado, and I'll pass the gavel to Vice Chair Brad Pettinger. Okay, thank you, Chair Grolnick, and good morning, everyone. Um, with that, I'll turn to um, Jim Seeger to start us off on uh, F1. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Just uh, getting the technology straightening out here a little bit this morning. So is this ready to project when I get there? Yes. Okay, and then I share here, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, and uh, thanks for indulging a little delay there. So we're here to talk about uh, equity and environmental justice. Um, equity and environmental justice about, is about taking underserved communities into account uh, and when providing them and, and in fact all communities, everyone, uh, fair treatment and meaningful involvement uh, in our process. One of the questions that's come up uh, in our advisory body discussions has been, well, what are underserved communities? Looking to the uh, draft NIF NIMPS uh, policy and, and uh, paraphrasing, uh, they're communities that have been systematically denied full opportunity to be part, to take part in economic, social, and cultural life. This includes uh, folks in geographic communities, groups that share particular characteristics, histories, and identities, and the NIMS draft policy identifies that in the fishery context, it might include subsistence fisheries, uh, fishing vessel crews, processing workers, and tribal uh, folks are also uh, mentioned. So this is something that is uh, regionally specific, obviously. So every area is going to have, every region of the country may, may have different uh, underserved communities that uh, need to be taken into account, uh, to, again, to ensure that everyone has fair and meaningful involvement uh, in the processes and is treated equitably. Uh, the draft uh, NIMS EEG, EEJ strategic plan was uh, prevented to our advisory bodies last August, and you discussed it at your September council meeting. Uh, in response, you wrote a letter. Uh, there's a link to that letter uh, that's in your situation summary. And you also asked the staff to develop a report on what the council already does that relates to EEJ concerns. After finalization of the NIMS national policy, NIMS plans to develop regional implementation plans. This agenda item was scheduled in anticipation that the NIMS national policy would be finalized. Um, that's not yet happened. I understand that may be a few weeks off. So the focus on this meeting and what you'll see in your um, actions in your situation summary is first to consider how does the council want to participate in development of the regional implementation plans? And then the second of your action items in the situation summary is, is the question of whether the um, report that provides the list of council EEJ related activities is complete or needs any adjustments. And that report is provided as attachment one, and I'll go over that in, in just a few minutes here. And then after looking at that, then asking the question, you know, independent of the NIMS regional plans, does the council want to have its own process to consider making changes in response to EEJ related concerns? Mr. Chairman, with that, I'll just take a moment here um, and uh, just step through the attachment one that the council asked us to develop. 
and I am going to just project that as I as I talk through it here. Is it? There we go. So in this attachment is a listing of what the council is already doing, and it, it gives us a starting point. Um, the next step might be to evaluate how these how these um, things that are already being done are working and decide you know what else you might want to do. So the idea of the national EEG strategy as specified by NIMPS is not simply to rebrand what's already been doing, but to consider ways to improve. So attachment one is organized into um, is organized around the uh, six EEJ objectives. Oh, I see. You can't see what I'm doing. Is it is there, is there just a way? Okay. Um, is organized around the six EEJ objectives. Uh, the first of these is internal operations and an empowering environment. So the actual title here is, is an empowering environment. Um, there we go. But it really relates to what, what we're doing internally in, in connection with uh, EEJ. It includes ensuring staff has the training capacity and resources needed to take EEJ considerations into account in their day-to-day -day operations, and that the composition of the staff itself reflects the diversity of communities that are served. Your letter back to NIMS on uh, EEJ concerns uh, indicated that you're interested in, in training and that these would require resources. Um, and the council uh, staff uh, hiring policy or identifies itself as an equal opportunity employer. So those are the kind of two things under this uh, uh, item, this first objective that we have within the council framework already. So moving uh, then to the next objective, starting on page two of the attachment is to incorporate EEJ in mandated and mission related policies. Um, the NIMS draft strategic plan notes that uh, some laws uh, don't provide much room for EEJ considerations like the Endangered Species Act, while others rely highly heavily on social considerations. Um, in the second paragraph on page two there under this objective, you'll see there's a link to the uh, CCC work group report on uh, equity and environmental justice. And in that report, you will find uh, that the group went through the Magnuson Act and uh, identified uh, provisions of the Magnuson Act that uh, address or relate to EEJ, both uh, in terms of things that are mandated, uh, such as including tribal representation, as well as things where there's uh, options. For, well, the council has to consider it, but it can be they can be handled in different ways, such as the consideration of uh, fishing communities. Uh, and taking into account social factors when defining stock management units. Moving on down then, the next objective relates to research and monitoring at the bottom of page two. And NIMS, there, NIMS identifies four aspects of research and monitoring relevant to EEJ. The first is simply the need to identify um, and understand and to serve communities. So research dedicated to that. The second is prioritization of research ad addressing concerns of underserved communities to make sure that their, their needs are not overlooked. Third is engagement of underserved communities in development and production of the needed research. And finally is, is where, where the social research is being conducted, make sure, making sure that uh, or reducing the bias in that research. Within the council arena, the uh, council research and data needs currently identify the need for more information on crew members and individual participants. And that information might be useful in identification of underserved communities. Additionally, staff has tentatively asked advisory bodies to take into account EEJ uh, considerations in the next update of the council research and data needs. The next objective relates to outreach and engagement. The draft EEJ strategy emphasizes two-way information sharing, building relationships, and efforts that are highly customized and consistent, long-term, and flexible. Much of the council um, facilitated outreach and relation relationship building occurs in meetings like this, in advisory bodies away from council meetings, uh, in field hearings, 
um, and, and so forth. At the same time, for those that are new to the process, approaching the council and advisory body members uh, is somewhat, can be somewhat of an intimidating situation for them. Online hearings may provide a more convenient opportunities for some uh, to participate, but communication there obviously is more of a one, uh, one way in nature. Uh, to varying degrees, council and advisory bodies all, members also reach out and interact with constituents between council meetings. I also want to note that in your, the following agenda item, you'll be taking up uh, issues related to the council efficiencies that will uh, uh, overlap with some of these concerns here in your deliberations there. Uh, the next objective on the bottom of page three relates to the distribution of uh, benefits. Uh, this uh, NIMS objective of, <clears throat> Uh, considers fishery allocations, both direct and indirect. And obviously, the council uh, takes um, is a body that takes actions that are allocative in nature. They're guided by the principles of the EEJ as whether, well as other applicable law. And you have Council Operating Procedure 27 uh, that was implemented in the last couple of years, which provides triggers for the review of all direct allocations. And there's, these reviews are intended to provide an opportunity to revisit allocation policies, potentially including consideration of EEJ uh, issues during those re-evaluations. <laughs> then moving to the uh, top of the final page here, outreach and engagement, or excuse me, uh, inclusive governments. This relates to opportunities for broad and diverse participation, including through direct representation on committees and uh, in public comment. Uh, in general, uh, the council is dedicated to, per, uh, to pursuing a, a professional and harassment-free environment as uh, you discussed at your uh, March meeting. And you, this is a topic you began to address then and are c intend to uh, continue to address. With respect to your advisory bodies, the council's committed to the principle of diversity and interest in receiving is interest in receiving nominations of a broad spectrum from a broad spectrum of people, and that's a statement that is in the solicitation that goes out for nominations. Uh, you also have dedicated seats for different groups, including the tribes. Council runs an open process; all meetings are open um, and uh, announced in advance. With respect to accessibility, we have a 508 compliant website, which means uh, that it is accessible to people with disabilities. And uh, all meetings with 10 days advance notice, you can get sign language interpretation and auxiliary aids. And then occasionally we do outreach, including uh, bilingual flyers or uh, working with Sea Grant to try to uh, um, get more, uh, get information about council activities more dispersed into communities. So that's just a quick overview then of attachment one. And with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, that completes uh, the introductory comments to see if there's any comments or questions about the process and where we're going. Uh, the next step here will be to hear from National Marine Fisheries Service about uh, where they are in the EEJ process. Thank you, Jim. Questions for Jim on his uh, overview? Uh, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning. Thank you, Jim, for a great report. That's pretty inclusive or pretty comprehensive. I have a question on the outreach and engagement. When we talked about this the last time at the council, we specifically mentioned MREP as a tool that the council uses, the council participates in, helps staff, and, and helps bring it. So I look at it as a council tool, and I think it's probably one of the most valuable things we can to get people included into this process. I was surprised not to see any mention of it in your report. But it, was there a reason why it wasn't mentioned? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. Dooley. Um, I was, first of all, uh, right, MRAP, we talked about that in September. We really highlighted that in the uh, letter that we wrote to National Marine Fisheries Research and em emphasized the importance of MRAP. Um, I was looking here more towards uh, things that were in policy documents uh, as opposed to uh, things that we do within the context of those documents. But I can certainly agree with you that MREP might be something to, to add to the report because it is a council uh, staff activity uh, and, and council member and advisory body activity and, and the council is dedicated to that process. Thank you, Joe. I didn't mean this as any criticism at no. all. I just wanted to make a note that it needed, I think it should Good be point. added, so thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, anyone else? Oh, Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. 
Um, thanks, Jim and council staff for pulling this together. I think this is a great start and it's really useful to have something to um, kick off these discussions. Um, can you share your process a little bit about how you pulled this report together? Um, equity and environmental justice in particular have uh, you know, a deep theoretical history and there's, there's a lot there. So I'd just like to learn a little bit more about how this report was brought together. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Ridings. Yes, uh, basically we went to the, um, to the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service draft plan uh, draft uh, strategy. Uh, we looked at the goals there, looked at the objectives, uh, decided to organize things around the objectives, looked at each objective, uh, what was in read what was intended uh, by the National Marine Fisheries Service with respect to that objective, and then asked the question, what is the council doing that addresses what the National Marine Fisheries Service has called out was related to that objective? And considered the um, you know various council policy documents and so forth. Uh, consulted with the rest of the council staff uh, to see if any you know to, to uh, try to fill out uh, the document, make sure it was complete. Thank you, Corey. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Thanks, Jim. And with that, we'll turn to uh, Scott Rumsey and Kristen Koch uh, online. Are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? We can, Scott. Welcome. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, I believe Kristen's on the on the phone as well. Um, well, if uh, I see the slides are um, being put up, if you can project the slides, I can uh, walk through them. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, and we can go ahead and advance past the uh, introductory slide. For those that don't know me, I'm Scott Rumsey. I'm the Acting Regional Administrator for the West Coast Region, and I'm joined um, by Kristen Cook, who is uh, the Director of the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. And we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so today I'm going to uh, also follow on um, from that great presentation from Mr. Seeger. Uh, on um, equity and environmental justice and our efforts that in, with respect to planning there. But I'll start off um, overviewing the NOAA Fisheries uh, Strategic Plan and our efforts this year to step that down into a geographic strategic plan for NIMS on the West Coast. Um, describe how this is linked with the EJ strategy and a regional implementation plan and pose some questions uh, for you all on the council as to uh, how we can best engage with the council through that process. Uh, so next slide, please. I'm sorry, you can go ahead and advance to the next one. Um, so this past September, uh, NOAA Fisheries released a new uh, strategic plan um, covering the years 2022 to 2025, um, consistent with previous uh, strategic plans. Um, this one includes goals and strategies that are um, of, of relevance and keen interest to the council, and that includes equity and environmental justice. And then the process now is going to step to the regions to develop regionally focused uh, strategic plans that will tear off of those, uh, tear off of the national strategic plan. Uh, next slide, please. So the National Strategic Plan um, has three overarching goals uh, that should look familiar to you. Um, it includes uh, sustainable fisheries and economic competitiveness in the seafood sector. Um, it includes um, our mission work with respect to protected species and um, recovery under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and also organizational excellence. And within that, we include our, our efforts to improve um, diversity and inclusion and accessibility um, in our workforce, as well as external efforts with respect to equity and environmental justice. Uh, next slide, please. And the National Strategic Plan did include um, some high level goals with respect to EEJ. Um, uh, that includes um, in ensuring the equity and accessibility for tribal and indigenous communities, as well as underserved communities, um, continuing our efforts to improve the 
diversity of our workforce so that we better reflect the communities that we serve, um, as well as improving the equity and inclusion and accessibility of, of the work that we do um, and the services we provide. Um, and it also links to the uh, National Equity and Environmental Justice Strategy that Mr. Cedar just um, summarized um, and, and commits NIMS to implementing that strategy uh, over the coming years. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the next step is for us to step this down to an updated West Coast geographic uh, strategic plan. Um, you may recall that we pre previously went through this effort for the geographic strategic plan covering 2020 through 2023. Um, and the geographic strategic plan um, is comprised of the West Coast uh, region, the regional office, the Northwest and Southwest Fisheries Science Centers, the Office of Law Enforcement, and um, on the Pacific Coast, the Restoration Center under uh, NIMS's Office of, of Habitat Conservation. Um, and so we'll be working through a collaborative process to update that geographic strategic plan, um, ensuring that it's appropriately tiered off the national strategic plan. Um, and, and making sure that we are adequately highlighting local opportunities, challenges, and priorities um, for the West Coast. Uh, we will also be uh, articulating overarching goals with respect to EEJ, um, similar to what, what was conducted um, or articulated in the National Strategic Plan. And also as a companion to this, we will be developing a regional implementation plan for equity and environmental justice, as, as Mr. Seeger highlighted. Uh, next slide, please. So we are currently kicking off our efforts to uh, develop the, the West Coast Geographic Strategic Plan. Um, we'll be pulling that draft together between now and June. Um, we expect to have a very rough draft uh, complete in June. And the question I'll be posing to the council is how would you like to best engage um, in that? You know, we could come back to the council um, in June and you could provide uh, input on a very rough draft, or we could wait till we have a more polished draft for you to provide, provide comment on in September. So that's uh, a choice um, in front of you. Um, our goal is to uh, finalize the geographic strategic plan uh, this fall, incorporating feedback from the council, uh, tribe, states, and other partners, um, and finalize that plan uh, this fall, as I said. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm shifting gears to talk about the um, equity and environmental justice strategy. Um, you may recall that Sam Rauch um, visited the council to discuss this back uh, last June, and then Abigail Harley, uh, Stacey Miller, and Taylor DeBevick from NIMS also visited in um, September of, of last year. Uh, we have a national website and um, other resources um, online describing the strategy. Uh, the executive summary has been translated into 10 or more languages. Um, and Sam Rauch and um, Abigail Harley um, uh, conducted a number of uh, listening, virtual listening sessions, um, uh, soliciting public comment, of which the, the council um, did provide. Um, and now I'm going to um, walk through at the national level um, some of the comments that we um, received. Uh, next slide, please. So in general, we had very strong um, support for development of the national level EEJ strategy. Um, as you can see from this pie chart, um, uh, pretty overwhelmingly um, positive support and development of of the strategy. Uh, next slide, please. And um, I can start walking through at the national level um, what some of the feedback was that we received. Um, acknowledging uh, really the need to develop these regional um, implementation plans, that they're a local 
needs that um, need to be tied in with Mintz's work with respect to equity and environmental justice. Um, you know, affirming that um, we need to make sure that we're engaging um, with more diverse groups in our mission work. Um, uh, that we need to uh, continue to um, recognize the autonomy of um, tribal governments and um, and and other uh, Native American tribes, um, and that is is uh, separate and distinct uh, of a commitment relative to um, uh, tribal treaty and, and and trust obligations of the federal government. Um, and as highlighted also in Mr. Seeger's presentation, there is a need to develop a lot of information and demographic data with respect to underserved communities, with respect to our fisheries um, engagements and in the uh, various uh, fisheries councils across the, nat the nation, um, as well as the demographic um, composition of our agency as well with respect to the communities we serve. Um, there was a lot of feedback with respect to metrics. How are we gonna measure success? Uh, underscoring that the best measures for success will come from the communities we're serving. Um, and also recognizing that, you know, the metrics really need to be uh, responsive to the issues we're, we're trying to address. Um, uh, again, these, these comments were at the national level. There was some concern with barriers to entry for uh, cat share fisheries, um, engagement in the aquaculture industry, um, and concern that uh, protections for threatened and endangered species um, have unequal, um, unequitable impacts on underserved communities. Next slide, please. And then in terms of how we go about um, implementation, uh, the comments just really underscored that we need to communicate early and often with those involved. We absolutely um, need to work uh, through the council and in close coordination with the council um, and recognizing that there's a lot of uh, good work being done. We don't need to reinvent the, the wheel here. Um, but there are organizations out in the community doing this work. Um, and I'd also, you know, note Mr. Dooley's comment that we're already doing important things like uh, MREP that are definitely going to feed into our regional implementation plan going forward. Um, also underscoring the, the need for capacity funding and, and expertise to support this work. Um, I'll note to date that um, NOAA Fisheries has not received additional funding to um, support development of the um, regional uh, EEJ implementation plans. Um, and then uh, underscoring the need to support educational programs and similar opportunities at the grassroots level to in, improve engagement um, uh, by underserved communities. Next slide, please. So the national EEJ strategy, um, uh, as Mr. Seeger uh, indicated earlier, is, is going to be finalized soon, um, hopefully later this spring. Um, the work group is, is currently um, incorporating um, input from the public comments received. And then we're going to shift to developing these regional um, implementation plans. Uh, next slide, please. And here, I just want to, um, you know, be candid that, uh, you know, this this is going to be a challenging phase. As I noted, you know, we we have not received um, additional resources um, in the regions or the centers um, to uh, do this work. We have heard loud and clear from the council that the council is going to need um, additional resources to engage and support us in developing this regional implementation plan. Um, and for us to do this successfully, we, we absolutely need to have 
uh, meaningful engagement and coordination and deliberation um, with the council. Um, we really want to do this right. We don't want uh, this, this initiative to be pushed by um, artificial timelines. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have to go as, as, as fast and deliberately as our, our resources allow and work hand in hand with the council um, in that process. Uh, we do have the benefit that there are other regions and other councils that are ahead of us that had an earlier start and, and have existing expertise and, and capacity. And we stand um, to learn a lot from them to inform um, our efforts. And I'll also note that developing these this regional implementation plan for the West Coast is, is not a one and done thing. Um, equity and environmental justice isn't a destination, but it is something that we will continually uh, work on and reevaluate our, our progress and, and areas for um, improvement. So it, it's gonna be an iterative process. So that's sort of a long way of saying that I think our initial uh, regional implementation plan is gonna be a plan to have a plan. Um, you know, we wanna be very careful because we, realize that we could do more harm um, uh, than good if we get off on the wrong foot. Um, so we want to, you know, work closely with the council to make sure that we're framing the right questions and approach, uh, that we're identifying the expertise and the resources we need to do this right. Um, and, uh, you know, that we are identifying a, a robust engagement strategy um, with underserved communities and, and feeling that with the information and the social science, we need to make sure we are uh, adequately um, identifying and, and engaging with those, those underserved communities. Um, so, so we'll be checking back in with the council, um, you know, as we work on, on this, uh, uh, NOAA Fisheries Headquarters wants us to have a um, initial EEJ implementation plan by the end of the calendar year. Um, again, I think that's really going to um, be an inventory of existing EEJ efforts, including what was just summarized in uh, attachment one by, by Mr. Seeker. We'll be identifying areas for improvement. And then again, what a robust engagement strategy would be and the resources we need to do that right. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the questions for the council today um, with respect to our update to the draft West Coast Geographic Strategic Plan, as I noted earlier, the council has a choice uh, whether you would like us to engage with you in June with a very rough draft so that you could have more time to provide us comment or would it be more effective use of the council's time and, and your uh, busy docket for us to engage in um, September with a more um, polished draft. You know, I'll, I'll just note that I don't expect anything um, really dramatic to change from our from our last geographic strategic plan. I mean, I think our our West Coast priorities um, haven't evolved that much, um, but there may be areas like offshore wind that had mentioned in the last strategic plan that might uh, deserve a little more emphasis in in this iteration. Um, and then also would like to hear from the council on on how you would like us to engage with you as we um, develop our regional implementation plan for, for EEJ. On what frequency would you like check-ins? Should we be working through specific advisory bodies, et cetera? So I will pause there and see if there are any questions or comments or um, Kristen Cook, if you have any commentary or corrections to add, please jump in. Okay. Thank you, Scott, that, for the presentation. Okay. Uh, questions for Scott? Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rumsey, for giving us an update, um, even though the, the finalized strategic strategy isn't done yet. Um, I'm 
apologize for being a little dense. I'm still a little bit confused on the relationship between the West Coast Geographic Strategic Plan and the regional implementation plans for EEJ. Are, are those two items um, being developed together? Are they connected? Um, how as a council should we think about our input for both of those? Now that you aren't being dense at all, and I apologize for not being more clear. Um, uh, they are being developed in parallel, the, the geographic strategic plan and the regional EEJ implementation plan. Um, I think uh, headquarters is, is viewing that that implementation plan will be a companion or an attachment to the geographic strategic plan. Um, uh, so that there is an association there. The regional implementation plan is certainly going to tear off of priorities with respect to EEJ at a high level that are articulated in the geographic strategic plan. Um, but I, I do personally see that the regional implementation plan is, is going to have a life and, and be more iterative and updated at a frequency greater than our geographic strategic plan. Hope that helps. Thank you, Corey. Anyone else? Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Wanted to give other people a moment there. Um, thanks again, Dr. Rumsey. Um, I appreciated that you noted that efforts like this can do more harm than good, and that um, when not done correctly, uh, efforts like this can reinforce existing unjust structures structures and processes. And um, I'm wondering if you could provide a little bit more information for us as we step forward and try to do this work, um, how we can avoid that pitfall um, and how NIMS is trying to avoid that pitfall. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Ms. Ridings. Another excellent question. Um, you know, and, and this is where I hope uh, we can learn a lot from other regions and councils that are ahead of us in this work, like in the Southeast and, and Pacific Islands. I think uh, some of the resources and expertise that they've had with respect to social science uh, and social scientists um, have really helped them uh, better define uh, with respect to, you know, certain management actions or fisheries. Um, you know, who are the underserved communities and, and ensuring that we are engaging appropriately um, with underserved communities and not excluding anyone in that process. That's something I'm, that's a, uh, you know, a, a risk that I want to be sure that we avoid. Um, so, so that's an example. I don't think I have a, a complete um, answer for you, but I, I think for us initially, it's, it's going to be you know, defining the analyses, the questions we need to ask um, so that we're uh, appropriately defining the universe of underserved communities and um, and talking about the, the media, the methods by which we engage those underserved communities in an inclusive and accessible way. I um, hope that helps in answering your question. Corey? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Dr. Rumsey. Just a follow up there. Um, you mentioned social science and social scientists as a way to move forward with this. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, what capacity NIMS is bringing forward on your end in the social sciences to, to be able to do this work? Yeah, and, I, and unfortunately, I don't have a positive answer right now. As I noted earlier, uh, NIMS has not received additional funding to support this work um, on the West Coast. Um, we really have a gap in social science expertise. So, so developing that, bringing that on board is a real priority for us. Um, so how we're going to... Um, conduct those analyses right now, I don't have a good answer to. I'm, I'm hopeful again that we can, you know, rely on on expertise elsewhere in the agency because it's it's not here on the, the West Coast at present. Um, and I'm also hopeful that, you know, some of the 
president's budget request in FY24 that is, is seeking additional funds for EEJ that that will will help us um, down the road. But we we are going to be challenged in having the resources to um, to have that expertise in house right now. So I think we're going to have to create be creative and and tapping that expertise uh, elsewhere in the agency or with partners. Okay. This is Kristen. Can you, hey, Corey, can you hear me? Anyone else? Kristen is trying to talk. Oh, Kristen, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is Kristen on the phone. I, I might just add to what Scott said. I think in the Southwest Center, uh, you know, in both centers, we have a long history of having hired fisheries economists, of course, as some of our, our folks in, in the social science realm. But we really do have a, a dearth of folks with expertise in social, social science, as he said. I think the Northwest Center has two social scientists in positions um, where they're actually practicing social scientists and working for the Northwest Center in those capacities. The Southwest Center doesn't have any. Um, so as Scott mentioned, that's it's a huge gap for us. Um, I do think we have some folks on staff who have social science backgrounds, but don't aren't necessarily in positions where they're practicing that. I myself have some social science background, um, and and then I also think that or I know that in in the Southwest, uh, for example, we have been trying to expand work in this area in some parts of we've been able to do some things, particularly in our, our turtle and protected resources work. And so there may be I'm I'm hoping there are some ways we can we can bring to bear some of the work that we have been able to accomplish in this arena um, and and leverage that and expand it. But as Scott said, the the research later and we'll have to get creative. Okay. Thanks, Kristen. All right, anybody else? Okay. Oop. Lynn Mattis. Dr. Rumsey, getting back to sort of what Corey Ridings was asking about, you said some of the other regions are ahead of us in this process. Have they been able to secure the additional resources to move forward? Um, anything we can learn from them on how to uh, gain those resources and the, ex the additional expertise beyond what is currently available? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, uh, no, none of the other regions have have um, received additional resources for this work. I think, you know, where the Southeast and the Pacific Islands are a little bit ahead of us, it's because um, they already had, um, like with respect to social scientists, you know, more resources in place. Um, there were already initiatives um, through the agency and through the council. Um, to engage, for example, with the recreational fishing community um, or with indigenous communities. Um, and so, so that work really sort of predated the development of the, the NIMS national level um, EEJ strategy. Um, so, uh, so I think we do have a lot to learn from, from those efforts. I personally am not uh, familiar enough with them deeply enough to, to tell you what those things are that we can learn, but um, I think there definitely will um, we will be working with them and already are um, to, to uh, benefit from the lessons learned of, of their efforts. Thank you, Lynn. All right. I'm not seeing any hands, so thank you both for coming and uh, presenting. I appreciate that. And with that, that'll take us to the SSC report and uh, Dan Holland. Dan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. Uh, I would like to uh, the, read into the record uh, agenda item F1B, Supplemental SSC Report 1, Scientific and Stati Statistical Committee Report on Regional Implementation of the National Equity and Environmental Justice Strategy. The SSC discussed the draft report on existing council activities response to equity environmental justice concerns, uh, agenda item F1A, attachment one, and the topic of EEJ in the council in general and the SSC specifically, and offers the following comments. The SSC supports the council's goals and objectives outlined in the draft report and agrees with the assessment that an appropriate response to this initiative by the council will require more resources and professionally facilitated training. 
The SSC also concurs with the NIMPS draft policy regarding the need for new research and data to support this initiative, including collection of demographic information to identify and understand the needs of underserved communities, and once identified, to engage those communities to identify, develop, and potentially co-produce research relevant to their needs and interests. Very little information is currently available to the Council regarding the population of underserved communities who are affected by Council decision making and how members of those communities participate in fishing and seafood industries. Identifying these communities should be a near-term priority. The SSC draws the Council's attention to a survey the Northwest Fisheries Science Center hopes to field this summer, which will collect information from commercial vessel owners to aid in identifying underserved populations and communities. However, this survey will not provide information about fishery stakeholders who are not commercial vessel owners. Information on crew members and participants in West Coast fisheries other than vessel owners and processors is essential, is essential in identifying and responding to underserved populations and communities. The SSC also notes a need to better understand the demographic composition of the various council bodies, which can be compared to recent census data and fishery stakeholders as a way of identifying underserved communities in the council process, uh, for example, underrepresentation by race and or gender. There is a large body of knowledge about the topic of EEJ. Experts on the topic should be contracted to examine how EEJ is accounted for in the current council activities and how the council can better achieve its EEJ objectives. The council should expand expertise on EEJ issues on its staff and advisory bodies. The SSC proposes that experts in EEJ be involved in SSC development of research and data needs this cycle so that we can make progress on these issues as soon as possible. While the SSE can highlight high priority research and data needs topics, the SSE does not have control over who does that research or how underserved communities are actually engaged or included in the research itself. Areas of the draft report where more expertise may help better shape the issue include the section on hiring, which does not examine whether there is bias in the advertising and recruitment for council employment positions and the sections that mentions council policies often take that mentions that council policies often take into consideration community fishing dependence resilience and vulnerability which is not the same as conducting an environmental justice analysis while council and advisory body openings are publicly advertised many people who apply are already involved in the council process or know people who are involved in the council process this means that recruiting and the applicant pool may be more homogeneous than intended to increase diversity, there likely needs to be proactive efforts to engage people not currently involved, rather than simply stating that underrepresented groups are encouraged to apply. Examples of active recruitment efforts include advertising with historically black colleges and universities, minority serving uh, professional societies and tribal entities. The SSC also encourages consideration of representation in addition to specific of representation in addition to specific areas of expertise when reviewing nominations for vacancies in council advisory bodies and committees. Moreover, being a single representative from a particular underrepresented group can have its own challenges and best practices in this area suggest aiming for at least two representatives from underserved communities. The SSE recognizes that this is a long-term task for everyone in the council family and strongly supports the effort. That concludes the SSC statement. I'd be happy to take questions. Okay. Uh, questions for Dan on the SSC report? Corey Writing. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Dr. Holland. Um, in the last part of your statement, it says the SSC also encourages considerations of representation in addition to specific areas of expertise when reviewing nominations for vacancies on council advisory bodies and committees. Um, can you expand a little bit more um, when you're saying addition to specific areas of expertise? Uh, yeah, yes, thank you for the question, Ms. Ridings, through the chair. Uh, when we're, what we're saying, I think, is that typically, at least our practice with the SSC, and I think this is probably true of other groups, as well, advisory bodies as well, is we, we tend to get um, a CV and we look at, at the particular scientific expertise um, or, or maybe management experience that that person has with respect to our particular needs. Um, so for example, in the SSC, we may be looking for someone with assessment experience or oceanography or economics, for example, um, for a particular opening. Um, and that tends to be the focus um, without really 
as much consideration maybe of other issues about represent, rep, rep, representation, um, for example, gender, race, uh, other other issues. Um, so we don't tend to focus on, you know, whether we are getting, you know, a representative body. Um, I would say that I wouldn't say that we never do. I mean, I think that is, you know, that we have had certainly in the SSC we've had discussions about that. Um, but it doesn't tend to be the major the major focus, and we're just suggesting that it should be a consideration as well. Thank you, Corey. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Um, Thank you. Next up, next up will be the uh, GMT and uh, Dr. Kate Richardson. Kate, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the Council. For the record, my name is Kate Richardson, and I will be reading from Agenda Item F1A, the Grandfish Management Team Report on the National Equity and Environmental Justice Strategy. The Grandfish Management Team received a briefing from Pacific Fishery Management Council staff, Dr. Jim Seeger, and reviewed the briefing book items on the implementation of the National Equity and Environmental Justice, or EEJ, strategy. The GMT considers the implementation of an EEJ strategy into council processes to be very important, and in order to do so in a meaningful way, the team has several comments and suggestions. First, given the complexity of EEJ and fisheries management, it will be key to have training and resources that help us develop a shared understanding of the council's EEJ principles and methodologies to identify areas where our current processes can be improved and to help better incorporate EEJ into our work. For example, the council can consider the development of an explicit process tool, such as an equity lens tool. For example, the equity lens for decision-making that's used by the Harvard School of Public Health, which is linked in the document. The GMT recognizes that a shared understanding of EEJ principles across the council, council staff, and advisory bodies will be important in implementing the EEJ strategy. Second, the GMT's ability to provide input on EEJ is informed by our understanding of currently underserved communities on the West Coast. We support the addition of social science studies outlined in the research and monitoring section of attachment one to the council's research and data needs list to provide a useful baseline understanding as well as potential improvements. Specific to the need for research dedicated to identifying and understanding underserved communities, the GMP sees value in better understanding how West Coast fisheries revenues and seafood are currently distributed to various communities, defined socioeconomically, geographically, racially, et cetera, which may better inform our impact analyses to the council. Third, the GMP agrees with the outline of existing council EEJ related activities in attachment one. We note that commercial fisheries provide seafood as a healthy source of protein to many types of communities, whereas recreational fisheries provide direct public access to the resource. Many council actions and discussions involve balancing those two services to the public, which relates to the distributional benefits as outlined in the EEJ strategy and may require further consideration relative to underserved communities. Finally, the GMT notes that as we develop our understanding of EEJ principles and practices, our approach towards EEJ will evolve based on council guidance, experience, and training. And we view incorporating EEJ into our work as an iterative, adaptive process. That concludes my statement. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kate. Uh, questions for Kate on the GMT? Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Katie. Um, I'm noting here in sort of the first half of your statement, um, the development of an explicit process tool such as an equity lens, and then you provided an example um, from public health. And um, I have to say this is really cool. I haven't seen anything quite like this before, so appreciate your group talking about this and bringing it up. Um, is this something that the GMT has used before or uses on a regular basis? Um, and if so, kind of has that been helpful. Um, just any thoughts on your discussion and, and if this is already being used by you is appreciated. Thanks. Through the Vice Chair, thank you, Ms. Writings, for the question. Uh, this is not a tool that we have used uh, to date. However, we thought it would be um, a useful tool in that it gives a sort of um, guide 
to incorporating equity in the decision making. And given that um, our team has varying levels of expertise and training in EEJ, we thought a tool like this might help both our team and the council family as a whole sort of get on the same page with a framework for decision making and considerations around EEJ. Thank you, Corey. Anyone else? Lynn Mattis. And Dr. Richardson, uh, thank you for the report. And I just wanted to quick acknowledge, I'm pretty sure this is Dr. Richardson's first report to us and good job. Okay, thanks, Lynn. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Richardson. And uh, with that, we will go to the GAP report and Merritt McRae. Merritt. Hello, Vice Chair Pettinger, Council Members. I'm Merritt McRae, and I'll be reading from a agenda item F1B, Supplemental GAP Report 1, Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report on Regional Implementation of the National Equity and Environmental Justice Strategy, or EEJ. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel, GAP, received from Jim Seeger and reviewed the report on Pacific Fishery Management Council activities responsive to EEJ and offers the following comments. The GAP found this to be an excellent review of existing council processes that support EEJ currently and consider what more the council process might explore in furthering EEJ goals. It's an excellent review of current council processes that encourage and enable participation by a broad group of stakeholders while recognizing the need to broaden outreach to fishery participants and the public currently underrepresented within the council family. We recommend alignment of efforts made by the Council with the National Marine Fisheries Service or yeah. regional planning process for EEJ and to recognize, account for, and include outside efforts such as those being developed by the Marine Resource Education Program to take advantage of complementary aspects of their respective initiatives. YAP members noted that the importance of providing economically available, highly nutritious seafood products to economically disadvantaged people through commercial and recreational fisheries. Further, we note fish and other wild caught seafood represent a rich source of high quality protein with extremely little alteration of our natural environment in comparison to agricultural impacts on natural ecosystems ashore. The GAP further recognizes and appreciates council and National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration staff and the Council's ongoing efforts to define and identify underserved communities and constituencies within their EEJ work. In particular, the GAP recognizes this need with respect to participation, allocations, regulations, research, and especially the potential for more broad outreach. We note the potential for outreach products to local school districts by offering educational opportunities on fisheries conservation and management and the benefits provided by NOAA, NIMFS, the science centers, the councils, state agencies, and this public process. Thank you. And with that, I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, with that, questions for the GAP report? Krista Swinson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I will admit up front that I have a soft spot for the last paragraph in terms of education um, and outreach in schools. Um, we have a number of council members that have participated in boat to school programs. And I'm just wondering if the gap had any conversation about um, tying seafood products, which you mentioned is highly nutritious in the second to last paragraph with that concept of educational opportunities on fisheries conservation and management. So pairing those together. Uh, through the vice chair, uh, thank you, Krista, for the question. Um, we did, this was something that was brought to the table at the gap by um, past council member Louis Zim. And uh, we all just realized this is a, um, a really important piece. And indeed we did discuss um, connecting the seafood value of our fisheries and the management together. This management process uh, really endeavors to provide affordable seafood 
to a broad range of constituents. And uh, I think it's important that the public understand that and, and knew, knows exactly how to participate in the process if they want to. Krista? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I'll just give the GAP one resource, um, and I guess the public as well. Um, the Oregon Albacore Commission is the host site for the Boat to School program for all of the Oregon fisheries. They did a program about 10 years this ago. This meeting is being and recorded. And continue to work on it part and piece. Um, that is STEM and Common Core, which could be helpful and um, maybe maybe a starting point if people are looking at pursuing that opportunity. Thank you, Krista. Anyone else? Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Merritt. Um, I'm looking at the second paragraph here, and it talks about um, while recognizing the need to broaden outreach to fishery participants and the public currently underrepresented within the council family. Um, did the GAP talk at all about what they thought would be the best way to do that? <laughs> One, thank you for the question, uh, Ms. Writings. Uh, one thought was that a particular a constituency, which appears to be particularly absent from this process, are um, shore-based anglers and, and um, among those are subsistence anglers. Um, <coughs> it wasn't directly discussed, but I know members have participated in, uh, in projects that outreach to the public on uh, fishing structures, public piers, and so forth in the Southern California area. Uh, one particular project uh, by a uh, CCA Cal participant, uh, David Bacon, it's called SAFE, and it um, actually teaches subsisting, subsistence fishing techniques to, to members of the community who might not otherwise actually get out to the shores and, and try it for themselves. Thanks, Corey. All right. Anyone else? I don't see any hands. Merritt, thank you. With that, we'll go to the um, go to the STT and uh, Dr. Alex Safik. Alex. Oh, I did. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I have with me uh, Grace, another representative from the STT. Um, and so I will be reading agenda, um, agenda item F1B, the supplemental STT report one, uh, salmon technical team report on regional implementation of the national equity and environmental justice strategy. The salmon technical team appreciates the opportunity to provide comments on the implementation of the National Marine Fisheries Services draft equity and environmental justice strategy. The STT considers the implementation of the EEJ strategy into council processes and its advisory bodies to be of substantial importance. We recognize that the EEJ strategy is an ongoing and iterative process, and our implementation of it within the STT can be flexible to council guidance, experience, and training. After internal discussion, we acknowledge the following. One, the actions of the council and its advisory bodies have far-reaching impacts on many groups whose representation on the council and or its advisory bodies may not adequately reflect their multifaceted and nuanced perspectives and values. Two, there may be barriers to equitable participation of underrepresented groups in the council process. Three, there is opportunity to expand the council and advisory bodies capacity to incorporate traditional and local ecological knowledge. Given the acknowledgements above, we encourage the council to consider investing resources in independent review from experts in justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion to provide recommendations for improving organizational structure and equitable policies, programs, and practices. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions for the STT report? Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Grace. 
Um, I'm looking at your number two, there may be barriers to equitable participation, dot, dot, dot. Um, did the SDT discuss what some of those barriers were and um, if there are any that are specific to the STT or um, salmon fisheries in general? Thank you. Thank you for the question, uh, Ms. Writings. Um, we did have general discussion. Um, one topic that came forth um, was around um, the um, circumstance of um, financial potential barrier to participate um, in council activities. Um, and so we would like to acknowledge that many uh, underrepresented groups um, come from um, stances of potentially inequitable uh, orientations around having resources available to be able to participate in, in ways that they would like. So um, we identified that as a potential area to, to focus on um, in the future to remedy that. Grace and Sent. Thank you, Corey. Anyone else? Oh, Chris is Vincent. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for coming up. My question and Corey, um, in some ways, beat me to the punch um, in terms of asking on point two. But mine really was more holistic in terms of for the three points that you gave. Could you identify? Um, specific areas, and, and I think you've nailed it on point two, but if you'd like to expand on points one or three, um, if there was discussion you feel comfortable sharing, we would love to hear that as well. Thank you for the question. Um, I will also open this up to Grace as my memory <laughs> of the entirety of the discussion might not be complete. Um, sorry, again, I'm reading through my points here. Uh, so to point one, um, specifically addressing um, the desire to more accurately reflect the multifaceted nuanced perspectives and values of groups. So we wrote that um, to acknowledge that uh, groups are not monoliths of um, opinion, that there is diversity in opinion and perspective within any group. And so we would like to see um, more representation to more accurately encompass all of those viewpoints and those values. Um, we would like to leave it open to the council and have that be an iterative process, an ongoing discussion of how we can do that. I think we can be really creative um, about how we do that, whether it's adding people or perspective, um, working groups, uh, it, it can be really creative in that endeavor. So that was um, to item one. Um, for item three, um, to expand the capacity to incorporate other uh, ways of knowing, essentially. And so a lot of our advisory bodies um, operate on a Western science um, modality or paradigm. Um, and that's wonderful. There is certainly value in that. Um, and I think the STT wanted to convey that there are also other um, ways of knowing um, that are just as uh, valuable and legitimate um, as Western science uh, frameworks that should be uh, incorporated or invited into conversation and into the room of other advising committees. Right. Thank you. And thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Krista. Anyone else? All right. Alex, Grace, thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay. And uh, finally, the uh, Habitat Committee and the Dr. Corey Green. Corey. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the Council. I'm going to be reading agenda item <clears throat> F1B, Supplemental HC Report 1, Habitat Committee Report on Regional Implementation of the National Equity and Environmental Justice Strategy. Jim Seeger of Council staff provided the Habitat Committee with an overview of current Council activities and policies that relate to equity and environmental justice. The HC appreciates these efforts and the current guidance for all advisory bodies to incorporate EEJ considerations into their operations and recommendations. Moving forward, the HC believes that additional clarity and guidance for defining underserved communities is needed to better identify those affected by Council policies.
The AHC discussed the potential for increasing participation and lowering barriers to participation. Council processes are complex and may be intimidating to individuals and groups not previously engaged. In the short term, reaching out with invitations to college students and community groups may be effective in bringing diversity into the council process. Maintaining the option of virtual public comment allows for individuals to participate in the process without the financial and scheduling burden of attending counseling meetings. In the long term, the HC supports a strategic approach for identifying underserved groups, reaching out to groups, and reducing barriers for participation in council processes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Questions for the Habitat Committee? I'm not seeing any, Corey, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, that finishes our, uh, our management team and uh, advisory body reports. It will take us to public comment. I believe we have one. And that would be Michelle Conrad. Michelle. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair and Council Members. I'm Michelle Conrad, and I'm providing testimony on behalf of Ocean Conservancy, and we'll be speaking to the points we made in our letter that we submitted together with Oceana. We appreciate council staff's description of what the council already does in agenda item F1 attachment one, and how that is responsive to EEJ concerns to establish a baseline to allow the council to assess the adequacy of its actions and identify opportunities for improvement. We note that much of uh, what is addressed in attachment one and the staff's suggestions for next steps center more on the equity aspect of EEJ and not necessarily the environmental justice component and that attachment one could benefit from a more social science focused analysis. We think this also highlights the need for social science capacity within the council process to ensure focused attention on EEJ issues uh, continue into the future. For next steps related to attachment one, we recommend the council continue working on the description of the baseline by incorporating advisory body and management team and public feedback, including the specific comments that we provided in our letter and continue uh, that solicitation through the September meeting, at which point the advisory bodies will have had the opportunity to meet and provide comments to the council. We appreciate the update from NIMS on its national strategic plan and the proposed process to develop a West Coast geographic strategic plan, which also touches on EEJ and their plan to develop an EEJ regional implementation plan and the questions posed to the council relative to coordination and engagement on both efforts. Last September, the council discussed and supported the concept of a NIMPS and council a joint working group to address EEJ, but decided to wait for updates from NIMPS on the draft policy and until the development of the regional implementation plan began. We suggest that council staff work with NIMPS to bring suggestions back to the council on what a working group could look like and suggest that could possibly happen in September. As a key NIMPS partner, the topics covered in all core areas of the national EEJ strategy are relevant to the council process. And we believe it would be helpful for the council to think about its activities in the context of those core areas. We recommend that the council use the NIMPS core areas and the applicable questions in each section to guide their discussions through a standing EEJ agenda item until the topics have been satisfactorily addressed and then update the council's policies and procedures accordingly. To that end, we specifically recommend the council consider its EEJ improvements in the context of external services and internal operations, which we expect will have complementary but different implementation actions, and encourage the council to consider and discuss examples of how past decisions could have contributed to environmentally inequitable or unjust outcomes as this understanding is especially critical to achieve growth and effective improvement. We note that in the situation summary, 
It indicates that the Council's process and efficiencies effort under agenda item F2 also includes EEJ principles. However, we believe the importance, scope, and complexity of EEJ issues warrant focused attention, and there is not a complete overlap between these two efforts. While we anticipate that there could be overlap relative to the structure of the council meetings to maintain and enhance remote participation opportunities, we view agenda F2 as being uh, more focused on achieving efficiencies in the process while striving for equity in participation rather than intentionally ensuring equity or environmental justice is achieved by the outcomes. We do not necessarily see the need to develop a separate council EEJ implementation plan, but expect that the strategies and actions to address EEJ, as well as the process and efficiencies items that emerge as part of the NIMS EEJ strategy and the West Coast Regional Implementation Plan, that those would all be captured in the uh, council's policies and procedures. Given the complexity surrounding EEJ issues, we recommend there be crossover between the NIMS regional and council EEJ processes. And as an example, we suggest that the council's executive director or deputy director could participate in uh, both and serve as a liaison. And that would help facilitate the development and execution of best practices uh, in both processes. We also emphasize that NIMPS must provide more resources and funding to assist the councils in making improvements toward EEJ and implementing the national and geographic um, strategic plans and the regional EEJ implementation plans. And we recommend that the council request that NIMPS explore special project funding to support the council in this work. So in summary, um, while we have noted EEJ areas for improvement, we appreciate the progress that has been made and encourage the council to continue to actively work on EEJ, uh, both at the NIMPS regional level and through the council's process. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Questions for Michelle on her testimony? Krista Svitson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you for the testimony and, and thank you for the letter as well. Um, it's helpful to have both. Um, my question is regarding point three, um, which is prioritize EEJ as a standing agenda item until the topics have been satisfactorily addressed. And then the council's policies and procedures are updated accordingly. Um, just in terms of what satisfactorily addressed looks like, could you provide some clarity? Yes, thank you. Um, and we note the NIMPS core areas uh, and the guiding questions that are in the NIMPS sections within their national EEJ strategy um, would be useful to help the council in their discussions as they move forward. And so uh, we view satisfactorily addressed is the council having thoughtful and thorough discussions about each of those um, core areas and the issues associated with EEJ, um, a consideration of reasonable alternatives relative to improving the way that the council does business and identifying some practical ways that the council can change its operations and policies to take EEJ into account. Um, we realize these issues are complicated and that any solutions that the council uh, comes up with will likely take time as well as additional resources. But ultimately, our goal is to get to a place where EEJ considerations are seamless uh, and not uh, an add-on kind of after the fact, but are a part of the process going forward. I hope that answers your question. No, thank you. That was very helpful. Thank you, Krista. Anyone else? Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Michelle. Um, part of this conversation that the council has been having and even the NIMS draft strategy and the CCC document um, that was linked to in the, the staff report um, really combines equity and environmental justice as concepts. Uh, but I noted in your comment letter and, and your comments just now, you talked about them as, as different. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you see as the difference between equity 
and environmental justice. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that environmental justice is, is fairly broad and it includes um, consideration of how uh, all of the people that are affected by the council's uh, decisions relative to the development, uh, implementation, and enforcement of the council's policies uh, and uh, NIMS's regulations. Um, it encompasses how uh, both the, the council's process and the procedure that they go through to ensure fair and meaningful participation in the development and decision making, uh, but it also includes how the outcomes uh, are uh, applied and distributed. And I think the council does a really good job of addressing equity and tries really hard to ensure that the outcomes are fair and equitable. But it, that's usually with a very narrow view of who is being uh, directly affected by the council's policies and decisions. And EEJ expands on that equity to include um, everyone that's affected, and, and those are, you know, the workers in the processing plants, uh, the truck drivers that are transporting fish, the people in the communities that depend on the fishery remaining healthy and viable. And environmental justice is more about um, considering whether past actions have adversely affected certain individuals or communities to an extent that puts them at a disadvantage compared to others. And if so, um, considering how to correct those past um, inequities. And then being thoughtful of how to avoid um, doing the wrong thing in the future by considering impacts more broadly. And some specific examples we provide in our letter of the fisheries decisions that could have disproportionate effects from an environmental justice perspective include like the siting of protected or closed areas to nearby ports and communities, the scheduling of fishing opportunities and seasons and limitations on, on access, either through limited entry or catch share programs and how the, the harvest limits or quotas are distributed. Thanks. Thanks, Corey. Anyone else? All right, thanks, Michelle. Okay, that takes care of public comment and brings us to a council action. I just point out that there's a couple questions at the bottom or the end of the uh, NIMS presentation that uh, I think that is reflected fairly well in the council action. So with that, I'll open the floor for discussion and we'll probably go to a break after that. So uh, anyway. Lynn Mattis. Thank you. Just from the questions that were asked in the advisory body reports, it seems apparent some additional resources are going to be needed as we move forward, both in terms of staff time, tr possibly some training, et cetera. And the council family at NIMS, I think, is going to have to make that commitment for those resources. But how do we balance that with all the other stuff we have on the plate? Um, I know this week the North Pacific Council is meeting and they are having their SSC advisory body and council members go through some cultural awareness training uh, being put on by uh, the first Alaska Institute. But that was a commitment of either a half day or a day's time of the SSC, the advisory bodies and the council members to commit to that half day of training. I don't know if we have the capacity for something like that, but those are things that have been going through my mind as we work through this is balancing all the other things we have to do with the resources to participate in this. So just some thoughts, no question or motion at this point. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Well, I think there's a couple questions there is we want to give input um, or comment on the draft uh, uh, GSP in June and September, I assume we probably do. Um, and then I'll, I'll then we really want to engage with the uh, INDEMPS on the EEJ uh, regional plan. I assume we probably do. So, um, Executive Director Merrick Bird. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, and um, I appreciate Ms. Mattis's comments. Um, I, hmm, how do I say this? 
my personal perspective is that this is a uh, this is an important issue for us to address. As we all know, we have uh, budget limitations and things are getting tighter. And so, as I um, was listening to uh, Mr. Rumsey give the the NIMS presentation, the thought that was occurring to me is one along the lines of strategic partnerships um, and what we can do or what we can do with some uh, NIMS's help uh, or state agencies or what have you to start to connect uh, with other entities that might, might be in a better position, frankly, than uh, council staff um, to do some of these, uh, some of the efforts that we are seeking to, to take. So uh, one example, and I, I've not heard a commitment from this entity at all, but one example that might come to mind are uh, the agents that are employed by Sea Grant. They're located in coastal communities. Uh, the council staff offices are, are not, we're in Portland. And so it, it occurs to me that perhaps this is part of uh, the strategy that NIMS contemplates, that this is part of the strategy that we may contemplate. Um, and how that gets done, I'm not sure, but I'm not sure that we could do it all. And I think we would be better served if we tried to use ourselves as a catalyst perhaps and, and leverage our, our desires uh, through some, str some strategic partnerships. So just some remarks, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Rick. Anyone else? Chris, is Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And I, I'm appreciative of the fact that we're willing to grapple with this, um, both at our level, but also at the national level in terms of um, really what our impacts are on the social side of things in addition to, to just the environment and um, economic opportunity, whether that is commercial, recreational, charter, or, or just the ability to go out and enjoy nature. Um, the piece that I keep circling around is how, how do we um, think about being more inclusive in terms of how we operate um, and uh, that really is for all walks. Um, and so I'm not saying any of these are ideas that we want to move forward with, but I do want to just talk for a couple minutes here about some components. Um, I've had a number of people who have said, you know, it's amazing that we are now allowed to stay home and testify remotely but it would be helpful if we had the ability to listen to the advisory panel components. And I think that that's, it's a mixed bag. I think we have the ability to have a fairly safe space because the people in that room know who the people in that room are. Um, but it also lends itself to, um, is that person who's representing a particular user group effectively representing their stakeholders? Um, it's a paid position essentially being there. So they are not effectively a member of the public. Um, and it also, similar to me being on mic, uh, I, I feel like I'm my best self up here. Uh, I don't tend to swear or say anything untoward. Um, and I think we, in some cases, saw better behavior um, when we were online for stakeholders. And so there, there is kind of a trade-off there. And perhaps we want to consider something like Chatham House Rules, um, which for those of you that aren't familiar with it or, and are more familiar with pop culture, a bit like Fight Club, what stays in the room stays in the room, um, where we, we take some time to um, turn the mics off if we need to have a conversation um with a vote in the room I, I don't know what that looks like but i do think it's something that is worth considering to allow the public more opportunity to understand the process um, i think we really need to consider what equity looks like in the process of becoming an advisory panel member and even a council member um, you know I won't speak for others, but when I started this process, it was, hey, you need to go back to DC. That is a tremendous amount of funding. And where that comes from, maybe it's 
the stakeholder group you belong to. Maybe it's your own personal resources, but not everybody has that ability um, to raise that type of equity or capital. And so um, having a clearer process for that that allows equal opportunity for people that are running for positions, I think would be helpful. And then the last piece I wanna to touch on are communications. Um, I think we all go out and do our best to communicate with the public in this process, um, but that does leave gaps. We don't know who we don't know. And uh, doing a bit of research around that, putting together forms of communication that would be tailored to going out to mass um, channels, I think could be helpful. And I know we are doing that to some extent now, but I think there's always the opportunity to review. I think in terms of how we communicate, um, just using harassment and discrimination, um, which we talked about at the last meeting as an example, that isn't warm and fuzzy. <laughs> and we may want to think about how we're communicating. And I will be the first to say that I'm fairly stodgy in my communication, but um, taking the effort to communicate in a way that is um, modern and appropriate um, and gives people the ability to feel like they want to be a part of that process, I, I think would be helpful as well. And with that, I will wrap up my comments, but just some some things I think we should be grappling with as we move forward um, in addition to those that are outlined in um, our briefing materials and conversations we've had in the past. Thanks, Krista. Anyone else? Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, great discussion. Appreciated the National Marine Fisheries Service presentation on this topic. Um, I find myself uh, uh, thinking about how we how we can make some um, strides forward in terms of the communication and the breadth of of our audience that we are able to reach. Um, I noted, I believe, in Michelle's um, comments that she, I think she said something like. Um, that we have a very narrow um, um, slice, she didn't say slice, of the industry that uh, participate in our, in our uh, advisory panels or that are a part of our process. And I think she, she made a reference to people like truck drivers, for example. And um, when we think about the totality of the of the population that um, our decisions touch, um, it's multi-layered and it goes out um, and encompasses a, a a lot of people from a lot of walks of life. And um, I think if we uh, try to improve upon uh, the, um, the breadth of of our constituents that are impacted by our decisions. Uh, and we try to do it with a, I'll call it a, I don't, I shouldn't say shotgun because, but that a, a big broad um, brush approach, I, with the limited resources we have, I think we'll find ourselves um, that it's gonna be difficult to, to make much of an impact as opposed to thinking about the audience, uh, the breadth of constituents that our current system is able to touch, and then thinking about in some sort of priority order, are there some areas that were that are that's the next layer out, if you will, uh, that we need to touch, that we need to find a way to communicate with more effectively um, than we are now, and so to me the. Um, in order to be effective, in order to have, to make some measurable gains here, I think we have to be strategic in our thinking and focus and focused on in terms of where we put our efforts. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Heather Hall. 
Thank you, Vice Chair. And I, I think I, I hope my comments are going to be somewhat complementary to what uh, Phil started off with there. And I'm thinking about some of the really good um, thought and input that we got from the advisory bodies and the public here on this that um, as was pointed out in the um, comment letter from um, that Michelle uh, commented on really was um, we have attachment one in this agenda item that starts us with the baseline and then where do we go from here and taking that input then from our our advisory bodies and management teams and the public and um, using those as areas for improvement and how we then maybe take that next layer how do we start um, moving forward on this process and um, thinking about this regional implementation plan so um, my suggestion here is to just take use that those advisory body comments and make a compilation of some of the common uh, common input that we heard from them and um, highlighting those areas improve, for improvement. Um, I am also uh, been thinking a lot about the additional resources uh, that comes up and the comment from Merrick and, and Lynn and, and what does that look like? And I heard the, ex, the SSC say, you know, we need additional expertise um, to help really identify some of these data gaps and, and um, how we apply this EEJ um, strategy in the work that we do. So um, I don't have a solution there, but I, I do think it's going to take a lot of um, creative thinking, like you suggested, Merrick, um, to get there. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Heather. Anyone else? Joe Oman. Joe? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, so this topic of EEJ is, is pretty important to uh, tribes. Um, appreciate in the uh, PowerPoint presentation, you know, talked about a number of things. Um, so like slide five talked about, you know, how we manage our fisheries for sustainability and economic uh, benefits, um, how we safeguard our protected species and propel their recovery and having a diverse workforce. Um, and I think also how that might be applied here to the uh, council in relation to you know diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. So those are all key um, themes um, from the tribal perspective. I think you know if we are more diverse, more inclusive, you know our uh, way of dealing with things on fish will be uh, more effective and, and inclusive. Uh, part of the um, you know, concerns, I guess, that I've heard from some of the tribal uh, individuals here in the council process is that, you know, the, the training will be pretty important. I know we've, we've kind of touched upon that on some of the previous comments, but having some uh, experts or other folks who may be skilled in this area to provide some assistance, you know, that might you know, fit under some of... Um, Mark's comments about, you know, strategic partnership, you know, getting some experts here that will help us. And as we do that, we might want to give some thought to, um, you know, you know, in the fishery world, you know, natural resource world, you know, we talk about best management practices, but you know, what could be some best uh, maybe operational practices that we might want to develop here as we um, uh, move forward within this process. Um, to help um, deal with some of these issues, um, you know, now um, and, and as we uh, move forward uh, in this process. And th there was one other thing I think that really struck me, um, and that was from the GAP report. And they uh, noted um, that, you know, the, the fish and other wild-caught seafood uh, represent a rich source of high-quality protein, with extremely little alteration of our natural environment in comparison to agricultural impacts on natural ecosystems ashore. And so how that struck me is, you know, over the, you know, the, the years, you know, that I've been here and, and here more recently, you know, dealing with like, you know, Klamath River 
Falls Nook, Sacramento River, Falls Nook, you know, the Snake River, you know, Puget Sound, you know, these, these stocks that are affected by non-fishing activities. Um, you know, here, of course, you know, we're able to deal with the harvest style, um, but there's a lot of stuff that occurs outside, you know, in the watersheds, in the ecosystems that impact the ability of, say, tribal people to access the resource in the abundances that they would need to, um, you know, meet their, you know, their ceremonial uh, subsistence, commercial and, and other uses. And so I think that that's a pretty key thing that um, we should be pretty mindful of, you know, there's the process piece, you know, how we work together to deal with um, equity and diversity and so forth and accessibility, but there's also a what impacts the fish type of a thing that also can have a pretty significant impact on ability to have, um, you know, the fisheries that would, you know, meet your needs, whatever those needs might be. So. So, for example, for like for you know some tribal fisheries, there might not be any fish returning to have any harvest, and so that really is a direct um, barrier to them to be able to go fish and practice their culture and meet their needs. So, want to provide those comments in the again appreciate you know what what's um, being put forward here, and uh, yeah, hopefully we have some additional work on that. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, Make sure we get back to council action here. Basically, I'm assuming we want to provide, in, if I could, input to NIMPS. I'm assuming we do, number one. But there's also, we're asking for review of attachment one. If people are commenting that, I guess there's a, I'm kind of curious how we're doing on that. Um, if I could, if I could. Uh, Jim, are we, as far as number two in the council action, are we, are we doing good on that so far? Before I go uh, to thank, yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, you've had some discussion on on uh, where you want to go. Some ideas have been presented. Uh, there was an idea of combining, uh, you know, um, the uh, strategic partnerships, uh, taking the advisory body reports, and uh, creating a compilation of those to highlight areas for improvements. Um, I think that would then be brought back to the council at some time. We talked about communications, uh, the number of communications issues, the number of uh, the, the constraints we're under with respect to additional resources and, and getting trainings okay. needed. Uh, and then, um, so you've had a, a number of different uh, ideas that have been put out. Okay. And uh, I don't know if there's more yeah. to come. We're not quite done yet, but I just want to make sure we're, we're getting that because that's the important part. So and with that, if I go to Corey, so Corey, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, given that, I think I'll just build on that. Um, regarding sort of attachment one, I want to again thank Jim and council staff for putting this together. I think that it was responsive to the council request. Um, I also think it has some pretty serious shortcomings. Um, uh, I um, It doesn't really address the history of how we got here. And as our starting document, um, I think that that's something important that needs to be included in this conversation. Um, whether it gets appended to that particular document or is another one, um, if we are going to seriously address environmental justice, we need to think more about the history of the council and fisheries management on the U.S. West Coast. Um, I, I, to sort of blithely state all the good things we do, um, Again, it's a start, it's a baseline, it's a place where we can build discussion from, which is what we're doing today, and I think that is a good thing. Um, but it also can deny the past, it can erase people from the history of West Coast fishing, um, and it largely serves the status quo and highlights privilege for people who are enjoying it today. So I think that part of this process, we need to think about history um, and um, recognize who is not here, and why our management is structured the way that it is, and that that is really fundamental to doing better in the future. Um, you know, I know that history can be uncomfortable, but can also be illuminating, it can be instructive, it can be inspiring. Um, it is also part of the foundation for us to understand how we move forward. So um, I, I think that that's important. Um, also, the document is a really good effort, but it is not necessarily rooted in EJ theory or in social science. Um, we saw those gaps highlighted by a lot of our advisory body and management teams. 
Um, environmental justice is a discipline with a long tradition. Um, and um, that was actually outlined in the CCC document, took a go at that. Um, and there are experts who understand this and we need them. So um, again, that is not meant as a criticism of the staff work around this document, just that it is a start and that it's insufficient. Um, the STT especially noted non-Western ways of knowing. Um, and I think that that's a really important piece to be added to how we move forward with this document. And um, we definitely need that expertise. Um, I'm going to build on that and go to sort of my original point, which was uh, thinking about the resources needed. Um, I appreciate Director Burden's comments on sort of being creative um, and bringing others in. I think that's a really good way to move forward on this. Um, I also, uh, in reading the public comment letter, uh, there's a concept of just sustainability from the environmental justice literature. And it poses that social justice is fundamental to long-term sustainability and it connects the concepts of social justice and environmental sustainability. And I think that is really important for how we move forward with this concept in general, especially in the context of fisheries. Um, it may not be something that happens tomorrow or next year or five years, but I think over the long term, that is something that is gonna be critical to having fisheries on our West Coast. So as we do this work, I understand that there are trade-offs, absolutely, in where we spend our council resources and where NIMP spends its resources, but noting that this is, I think, a core piece of the NIMP's mission and its mandate. So there's, um, I think, many reasons to prioritize this in the work that the council and NIMS is doing. Um, so I'm gonna stop there, thank you. Thank you, Corey. Um, Executive Director of Rick Burton. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, and uh, thank you, Ms. Reitings, for those comments. And thinking about your comments in regards to attachment one, uh, I think there are a couple of things to think through here. One is I think the paper Jim put together was responsive to the council's ask. And the, the suggestions you're making, I'm envisioning more of a diagnosis analytical type document. Would that be a fair way to describe what you see as the next steps on number two here? Thank you, yes, uh, I do. I think that that would be helpful if we could have those resources. Again, I agree with you. I think council staff did as they were directed. Um, just noting that you know, we use best available science in this process and national standard one and national standard eight talk about that in terms of social science and the need to use that and inform how we work. Um, and we saw in a lot of comments today, we don't necessarily have that capacity to do that. Um, Dr. Rumsey talked about that and um, Kristen talked about that. The lack of capacity that even NIMS has to really do this work well and have it be based in science and theory and exist in existing thinking, which does exist. So um, I think that would be a good way to move forward with that document or any other documents that might um, flow from it. Okay, anyone else? Krista? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just want to lend support for Ms. Writing's path forward. I do want to recognize the staff in terms of completeness of attachment one. I think that it is a great starting point. Um, and in terms of completeness of what we do, I was impressed. Um, I'm always impressed, don't get me wrong, but it was nice to see everything in there. Um, and just a shout out for the accessibility in terms of people who are hearing impaired, et cetera. I, I liked seeing that in as a component of that. Um, but I also agree that there needs to be more um, awareness about how we got here and how we built from there. Uh, I do recognize the financial constraints, but agree that this is something that impacts all of our fisheries um, and the way that we manage. Um, and it is a directive that has been prioritized um, by NIMS. And I, I do think that it would be worthwhile to spend the time getting this right so that we have a clear future for all of our stakeholders moving forward. Thank you, Krista. 
Anyone else? Corey. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, in terms of process moving this forward, um, in September when this agenda item um, was up, we discussed the possibility of forming some sort of working group um, to be able to help move this forward. Um, I have to say, I don't know if now is the right time. I noticed in public comment, there was a suggestion to um, possibly just start scoping what that working group might look like. So we could come back perhaps in June to have such a group executed um, to essentially help us with the regional implementation plans that it sounds like if I have my timeline right, we'll be coming back to the council in June. I could be incorrect about that. Um, yeah. Ryan? Yeah, just a clarification to the point um, regarding timeline. So the geographic strategic plan will potentially be available by June or September. That is on a little bit faster timeline than the regional EEJ strategy. So um, they're two separate things. Um, I would think that we would want a more iterative process, or at least we're asking if the council would want a more iterative process, whether it's a working group, whether it's something else, whether it's us just coming back in June or September on the regional EJ side, that would be more of a update and dialogue process. We won't have a document like we will on the strategic plan um, by June for sure. Um, but we may have something like an outline or something like that by September, but that's a, that. I hope that clarifies the timeline of the two things. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Merrick? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. A question for uh, Dr. Seeger then. Um, as we think about the timing of the, the EEJ strategy, or perhaps this is a question to Mr. Wolf, I'm not sure. Um, presumably, if the council wanted to weigh in on that strategy through whatever means, maybe a work group or, or some such thing, we would want that input before the strategy is put out. Or do you see a sequence of steps there that could help with this discussion? Right. Yeah, thank you. So, right, Chair, um, I'll, I'll speak and then um, Dr. Seeger can weigh in as well. Um, from our perspective regarding the strategy itself, right, I think we're very open to this. Like um, you heard uh, Scott say in his presentation, right, this is an iterative process. It's not like the strategic plan, which is a three-year document, which we won't be revisiting for some time, right? So that's separate. We can bring that back in June or September. It's very relevant. It will tie to that. You can make comments on it. But the regional implementation plan, which is more on a calendar year timeline, we recognize mm -hmm. that we want to have this dialogue. We want to have this be an iterative process. So we're very open to how the council wants to engage. Uh, we're not trying to say we've laid out exactly how we want to do this just yet because we're looking for feedback right now. But we have a little bit more flexibility on that time. And, and again, it's a process that even when the strategy is out, it's not set in stone the moment we, we issue it. Does that make sense? OK, thank you. Corey? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I guess with that in mind, I would put out for discussion maybe the possibility of forming a working group or having Dr. Seeger bring back to us some recommendations in June about a working group, um, sort of what the structure of that would be, um, and some ideas about how we can make that most functional and help with the iterative process of getting that first regional implementation plan and then helping the council move forward with this work in the near term future. Yeah. Well, I would think that um, having come back to us in June, we have a lot more information to work with than we have right now. And so I think that that would be my recommendation. And I would say that uh, if somebody thinks different, um, let me know, but I think that's probably the second recommendation you gave as far as having to come back in June with something maybe that would be a better way to do this. Fair enough. Okay. Jim, how are we doing? Besides being an hour late. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. So we have that direction that we just discussed about coming back in June. 
Uh, and then earlier you mentioned uh, we do want to comment on the geographic strategic plan. So that's separate from the environmental justice, but it kind of overlaps a bit. Uh, in June and September was, uh, I heard you say earlier. Um, so I assume we'll be kind of looking at that for the, uh, in the AG uh, and, you know, engaging in the regional plan. Uh, we discussed the, uh, uh, some of the other ideas about compiling, compiling the advisory body documents, uh, looking at the history of how we got here in a diagnostic way, recognizing that would take quite a few resources. Uh, maybe that comes as we develop that, get that working group going and, uh, and see uh, what their guidance is, comes out of that and the strategic partnerships to deal with resource limitations. Uh, I also want to mention that as you um, continue to think about this issue on in that attachment one on page two, there's a link to the CCC working group uh, document on environmental justice. Uh, I didn't highlight it here because we're focused mainly on process, uh, but it does include on pay, uh, a, a section called things councils could do. Uh, with respect to environmental justice, and that's in the body of the document on page 20. And then uh, there's an appendix two in there that it provides examples of things that councils have done already. Uh, and so they, that might provide some, um, uh, some seating for thought uh, about uh, for this work group, as well as any of you who want to take a moment to look at that as to what we might be doing as we uh, move down the line here. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Okay, with that, I think uh, I think we're done with this uh, agenda item, and so we're going to take a ten-minute break. And uh, I guess we're going to pay back for yesterday's uh, abbreviated session. So, anyway, we'll be back here at um, ten o five. The recording has stopped.
This meeting is being recorded. Okay, we take our seats. We'll get started there shortly. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. We had a uh, really good discussion on the F1. And so uh, I would like to point out that uh, there was a, a cell phone did go off, I believe, and uh, there's the Anderson rules in effect. So that guilty party probably should come forward and fess up. And uh, I will fess up myself, actually, in the sense that my uh, my tablet beeped at me and my volume was turned down. So I'm on the hook again for, for June probably. So with that, um, I will turn to executive director, Merrick Burton, uh, to take us off on council meeting the process and efficiencies. Merrick. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Vice chairman. Um, this is agenda item F2 council meeting and process efficiencies. Uh, I'll be, uh, Staffing this one, uh, but asking our deputy uh, Kelly Ames to help from time to time. Uh, so as a quick overview of the situation summary, you'll recall back in uh, September 2022, we brought forth a white paper that was a uh, fairly expansive uh, discussion about uh, some of the things we may have learned during the COVID era, some of the things we're doing now, and asking the question how we could perhaps learn from that become more effective, become more efficient. And that of course dovetails with budgetary considerations. It also dovetails with some of the EEJ discussions that we just uh, touched on here a few minutes ago. So um, the first white paper uh, discussed a couple of things. Uh, one is we touched on the, the issue of remote meeting formats versus hybrid meeting formats versus in-person meeting formats. and uh, some of the trials and tribulations we went through last year and still just a little bit here this year um, as we are uh, figuring that uh, difference in meeting formats out and what the preference is how effective they are what we can do and staff and all those sorts of things we also talked about um, again bigger picture strategic planning and like i indicated here a minute ago uh, this aligns with longer term budget uh, discussions and the council's grant process will begin uh, here shortly. And so these issues come together with our uh, next five year grant period. So during that discussion of the more strategic uh, conversation, I raised the idea of the committee of the whole concept where uh, a committee of council members could meet, develop recommendations about how we might be uh, organizing ourselves and structuring ourselves uh, in the context of our budget and in the context of our ne next grant uh, process. So back in September, uh, your direction to us as staff was to uh, focus first on one uh, bite-sized chunk of the apple that we could take, and that bite-sized chunk was to take up the topic of remote, hybrid, and in-person meeting formats. So we brought that back to you here today in the form of a white paper that outlines some of the things that we've learned as staff and some of the things that we have observed um, and offers up some recommendations and some structure uh, for your consideration uh, and we've received some input from several advisory bodies along those lines too so your task here today uh, is to consider that white paper and any next steps or uh, you know any guidance you have uh, that may be to the contrary or in concurrence with where our head is as staff of course is very welcome and then uh, it is a little bit early days uh, for the June discussion that we have uh, planned on the YAG, where we would start to introduce the more strategic 
uh, strategic view of the world. Uh, I guess just for your benefit, what I would intend to do in June is to bring forth another discussion paper that talks about how we could plan uh, that item and move forward over the next several months there. Any input you have uh, in regards to what you'd like to hear in June that may help you weigh in on that process would be welcome too. So there are a few uh, reference materials. Uh, one is the white paper I've just uh, referenced. We also have several uh, advisory body comments. I believe most of our advisors have weighed in on this item. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to pause there and take any questions. Uh, and then I will move quickly through the white paper just to reorient folks, but happy to pause here if there are any questions. Okay, uh, questions from Eric on the overview. I think you're good. Okay. Thank you. Then moving into agenda item F2 attachment one, I'm not going to read this, but I will just uh, uh, walk you through it for purposes of organization and perhaps refreshing uh, everyone's minds. So the introduction covers some of the history that I already touched on. Um, from there, we jump into a discussion or definition rather of different meeting formats. And in particular, what I'd call out for you is that the term hybrid meeting. Uh, it's used to cover a lot of different types of uh, meeting formats. Um, and we think it's beneficial to be more specific about what we mean. So what you'll see in particular then is we have an in-person meeting definition that should be straight, straightforward. We have a remote meeting definition that should be straightforward. Then we have the next two. One is a hybrid meeting and the other is a live broadcast meeting. So when we refer to a hybrid format, we're thinking of the participants of that body and how they're <laughs> meeting. Uh, so the live broadcast meeting is an in-person meeting that is broadcast <laughs> to folks remotely that may be listening or wishing to participate through a public comment method. method. Um, and then as you'll see, as you go through the paper, there is some uh, discussion about um, the different pros and cons of in-person versus remote versus hybrid meeting formats. Uh, what we have learned, uh, some uh, pontification about um, where we are at as society in terms of expectations, things of that nature. And when I say expectations, I mean expectations about the role of technology, uh, the accessibility through remote uh, formats and what, what have you. There are several bullets toward the end of page three uh, that capture some of our key uh, learnings and trade-offs um, and, and um, where we stand uh, in terms of staff recommendations uh, after that learning experience, especially through the last year. And so I'd orient you to those four uh, recommendations that we have for you all. Following that, we get into issues with the deployment of the hybrid meeting format. Uh, we spent a lot of time focusing on this because we uh, experienced multiple challenges with the hybrid meeting format last year as we tried to execute on this, especially uh, as the case uh, may, may be with our advisory bodies. So I think just about all of us and maybe indeed 100% of us would agree that the way the council ballroom has been run is uh, pretty slick. I think it works pretty well. Uh, we run that with three people. Um, so the advisory bodies are a different uh, different animal. Um, and so we've explored different pieces of technology. And so in that document, you'll see reference to the infamous OWL device uh, that we've all come to, I don't know if appreciate is the right word, but uh, we know of it. Uh, you'll see reference to the mini council ballroom setup. So we tried to uh, essentially take the model that we have here in the ballroom and say, well, what if we had speakers and a soundboard? What if we did that in the SAS? And what if we did that in the in the gap? And we tried that last year, and I don't think we'll do that again. Let's put it that way. And then we have uh, what we call the pucks, which is this anchor work setup, a um, little bit simpler, uh, functionally just stuff similar to the OWL. I know several state agencies also use these, and we've been deploying them in several of our meetings. Um, as you go further through the document, um, what we try to outline is that uh, putting together an effective meeting is really a combination of a variety of factors. Um, so we'll have to think about not only technology, but also the meeting structure, the meeting environment, uh, the meeting purpose, and all of that helps to define when and where we have remote, 
in person when we might entertain hybrid meetings formats and things of that nature and then moving further through the document you eventually get into staff recommendations and so that is characterized in a table uh, starting on the left hand side with council office location uh, NIMS region or science center location hotels and then a remote meeting format and then as you go across that table you'll see the format team members how the public engage uh, and some comments that we all have about about um, those different formats and contexts and then um, you'll get the end of the paper uh, which has some conclusions and a couple of uh, key questions uh, for you all uh, to end the document so uh, mr vice chairman i'm happy to stop again there and answer any questions that anyone has about the staff white paper. Okay, questions for Mary? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Oh, Chair Grolnick. I think I have a question. Um, there, and I'm, I, the reason I say I think I have a question is because I, I looked through this in detail once before and now I'm trying to find the language. There was a reference to, um, in the paper, I can't find it right now, about how it's become more difficult to meet in person um, because of a growing body of participants. Is that in this paper? Am I, did I read that somewhere else? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I'm not recalling that language, Mr. Chairman, but I'll look to uh, Kelly and see if she has a response for you. Thanks, Chair Gronick. On page two, we do note that there are a limited number of hotels that can host meetings as large as ours. So that would be inclusive of all of the space we provide. All right, great. Thank you very much uh, for pointing that out. Um, I guess, and maybe this is more appropriate for discussion rather than a question, but I guess the question is, have we looked back to pre-COVID participation to gauge what our reference point is for whether things have grown larger or not. Because if I look back, say, to our two previous meetings before COVID, everybody was there. <coughs> so I guess I'm trying to find out what our reference point is for that, because that seems to be sort of key to the premise behind some of this discussion. Eric? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. And um, I think we could quickly get into council discussion, but I, I still think we're in a point of clarification here. Uh, the point that we're really trying to make in that section is that um, as we, you know, just this last year, as we send out RFPs for hotels over the coming years, there are, there are very few hotels that respond because our our request is quite large. Um, I, I, I think we'd be lucky to identify two dozen hotels in the entire West Coast that can host us. And so that starts to raise questions. Um, if we wanted to uh, uh, look at other hotels, um, we would have to start down, downsizing our in-person meeting participant pool. And to do that, we would have to think about more of a remote option. And I'm just curious why this is a, seems to be a new phenomenon and we didn't have it before COVID. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm not sure that it is a new phenomenon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's a matter of, uh, we just have a limited number of hotels. It has not become an obstacle yet, but we do find ourselves, uh, you know, when Renee and I are looking at the response to proposals, we think, okay, well, we really have two hotels to choose from, from for this meeting. We have one to choose from from that meeting. And so that starts to raise other questions. You know, uh, if we're interested in cost reductions or cost efficiencies in our meeting places, there's really no competition, uh, right? So it starts to just become, it's not problematic yet. It hasn't prevented us from meeting in a hotel. This hotel here uh, might be the most challenging one uh, because of its size. And as you know, we had to to, uh, had to send some several of our advisors remote in order to fit into this hotel, and that's created some other issues. 
And I would like to avoid that. And I would like to have options. And I think that's where that text is coming from. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, not seeing any, I'll, we'll go to our advisory bodies and um, let's go to the SAS and uh, Richard Heap. Richard, welcome. Uh, members of the council, uh, Richard Heap representing the SAS. I'll be reading from agenda item F2A, the supplemental SAS report um, on council meeting and process efficiencies. The Salmon Advisory Subpanel reviewed and discussed the staff white paper under this agenda item on April 2nd at our SAS meeting. The SAS very much appreciates the work done by staff to reach out to the Salmon teams and the consideration given to our comments with respect to the value of in-person meetings during the salmon season setting process and the difficulty we encountered with trying to conduct hybrid meetings. While the SAS values public participation at our meetings, we feel that in-person attendance is important in helping the public to understand the context of the discussions and decisions. The SAS also recognizes the value of having members of the public in attendance to facilitate the dissemination of information about the Pacific Fisheries Management Council process and the range of issues discussed. The SAS would also point out the value to the council process of having all or most advisory bodies meeting in person at least periodically. The council considers issues at times that involve impacts on salmon by other fisheries and the, that interaction between advisory bodies is valuable in helping to understand complex issues. As an example, the bycatch of salmon in the whiting trawl fishery was an issue that uh, was best understood by both groups after the benefit of discussions between the SAS and the ground fish advisory subpanel. Those discussions were greatly enhanced because of the mutual respect and trust of both groups that had been gained by formal and informal interactions at council meetings. The effectiveness of the council process depends co-equally on the best available science and the strong bonds and relationships developed within advisory bodies. The recent changes in the meeting process are the modern reality, but maintaining strong relationships are vital to the success of the council. Thank you, Richard. Questions on the SAS report? Okay, very good, thank you. Next up is the um, CPS management team report, and Alan Serge, Alan? Microphone. Right. Um, so just for old time's sake, uh, can you hear me? Right. So the CPS management team report on council meeting and process efficiencies. Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team reviewed the staff white paper on formats for council advisory body meetings and received an overview from council staff officer Kit Dahl. The CPSMT discussed the ideas that apply to the format options of council advisory bodies and council meetings. The CPSMT greatly appreciates the work done by council staff in preparing this document and understands more details are to come at the June 2023 meeting. The CPSMT agrees with the proposed guidelines for meeting formats in 2023 put forth by the council where each advisory body will meet in person at least once per year and have in-person meetings when topics that are complex, controversial, and need ongoing exchange among groups are on the agenda. The CPSMT sees value in defining the process by which such determinations will be made more clearly in terms of which parties are involved and timing, et cetera. The CPSMT appreciates the flexibility provided to advisory bodies to, re to allow remote meetings where in-person meetings are not necessary for certain topics, but understands that planning will be needed to determine which meeting format is best for any given CPSMT meeting. As an example, the CPSMT has benefited by having early online meetings to discuss various agenda items, which allowed more time at later in-person meetings for agenda items that required an increased level of interaction and discussion. The CPSMT recommends that council continue that form of meeting efficiency. 
The CPSMT agrees with the format options proposed in Table 1, in, which is in Attachment 1, and that the benefits of expanding remote access to listen to in-person advisory body meetings should be considered. For example, while the team supports a hybrid option, since many advisory bodies have a desire to listen to the SSC, outside advisory body meet members and the public may also wish to participate in other in-person advisory body meetings as well. Overall, the CPSMT supports a council using a mix of concurrent online and in-person meetings formats in the future. The CPSMT also sees value for the council to invest in the technology and personnel capacity needed to use hybrid meeting formats more widely. Although the cost and impact of these hardware and personnel changes are not trivial, this option would benefit the council process by improving public access and transparency. Thank you, Alan. Questions on the management team report? All right, thank you. Next up is the uh, CPSAS report. Thank you, Michael Winooski. Mike, welcome. Microphone, Mike, the microphone. Sorry, it went off. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, council members. I'll be reading from agenda item F2A, Supplemental CPS AS Report 1, April 2023. Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel Report on Council Meetings and Process Efficiencies. The Coastal Pelagic's Species Advisory Subpanel, CPSAS, was briefed on this agenda item by Pacific Fishery and Management Council Staff Officer Jesse Dorpinghaus at our March 30th webinar and offers the following comments. The CPSAS supports the proposed guidelines for meeting formats presented by Council staff. However, we would prefer to meet in person twice a year rather than once a year. With regards to the proposals of council related meeting format options in table one, the CPSAS is supportive of those proposals. However, the CPSAS recommends that the council consider utilizing the in person with web broadcast meetings format more broadly, including with advisory body meetings. We note that this has budget implications and the council would need to consider the trade-offs in expanding this access and the monetary and operational cost to the councils. Yet, the ability for stakeholders to be able to engage with advisory bodies in addition to the council is crucial in our perspective. Fishermen may not be able to listen in and provide comment at the council agenda item time but may be able to listen into the discussions of the advisory bodies to understand the issues and provide comments through that opportunity. Finally, the CPSAS wants to propose that as the strategic planning process continues into June and beyond that, one of the topics of consideration be the overlap of the North Pacific and Pacific Council meetings. Advisory bodies, including CPSAS, have struggled with recent participation, sometimes due to overlapping commitments of the two council meetings, specifically in April. And that concludes our statement. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Questions on the uh, CPSAS report? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, next up would be the uh, GMT and Katie Pearson. Katie? Thank you, Vice Chair Penger, uh, Council Members. My name is Katie Pearson, for the record, and I'll be reading agenda item F2A, Supplemental GMT Report 1, Groundfish Management Team Report on Council Meeting and Process Efficiencies. The Groundfish Management Team reviewed the Pacific Fishery Management Council staff white paper and received a briefing from Mr. Todd Phillips of Council staff. The GMT offers the following thoughts in response to the questions posed in the white paper. The GMT supports maximizing council flexibility and ability to pivot meeting formats to address unforeseen circumstances. For example, family emergencies, sickness, weather events, or COVID outbreaks within council. 
This can be accomplished through the council investing in and allowing advisory bodies access to the two less expensive options, the anchor work uh, um, speakerphone and the meeting owl device. Having these options will help council staff pivot and allow for team per member participation when travel is not an option for them due to unexpected events. That said, the team does not support a planned hybrid approach for GMT members. The GMT remains consistent in our preference that team members meet either all in person or all virtual. If the council decides the team should be virtual, the team hopes to be involved in the process of choosing which meeting or meetings uh, would be best virtual given our expectation of workload and the need to closely collaborate with, for some items. The GMT recommends that the format in person or virtual the council chooses for the team be consistent with the format of the Groundfish Advisory subpanel. In June 2022, the GMT tried the mini ballroom system unsupported by IT staff in the GMT's meeting room, and the technological difficulties outweighed the benefits. Without additional IT support, other ABs may, ha may have similar challenges if they choose to fully adopt this hybrid approach. The GMT acknowledges that the ability to fund technological improvements or additional IT staff may depend on the council's ability to find other cost savings, such as costs associated with AB travel during the meetings, even when meeting is in person. And that concludes our statement. Okay, thank you, Katie. Questions on the uh, GMT report? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Katie. Next up will be the uh, GAP report and uh, Louis Zim. Louis. Well, thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger, members of the council. I will be reading uh, to you agenda item F2, the supplemental GAP report for April 23. Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report on Council Meeting Process and Efficiencies. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel received a briefing on this agenda item from Mr. Brett Weedoff, Pacific Fishery Management Council Staff Officer, and offers the following comments and suggestions. The gap has moved in our September, as noted in our September 22 report, members refer to meet in person when possible, especially when complex or controversial groundfish items are before the council. In-person meetings foster better interpersonal communication and discussion. However, the gap also understands that due to logistics or costs, it is sufficient to meet virtually at times. This works better when GAP members have met in person before and participants have had the chance to get to know new members, such as after new members are approved for new terms. Decisions to conduct virtual meetings for advisory bodies during the council week should be made carefully and in coordination with AB leadership. For example, Specific to the April 23 meeting, the GAP preferred meeting in person due to some important groundfish items on the council agenda. Moreover, the GAP requested an additional meeting day in advance of the council to provide sufficient time to develop informed recommendations and reports for the council. Unfortunately, we could not meet in person due to meeting logistics. We also did not meet a day earlier, result resulting in agenda item discussions the production of five GAP reports and review of more GAP reports the very first day. This creates a burden for GAP members, prevents comprehensive public comment on agenda items, and forces council members to review and consider a slew of comments on the council floor. Online GAP meetings in advance of an in-person meeting during the council week may also be advantageous, especially if it is focused on an agenda item that is complex it requires more time to develop a statement or reaches a broader audience. For example, the GAP benefited from the focus meeting on the non-trawl rockfish conservation area virtual discussion prior to its meeting during the council week. Relative to hybrid meetings, where some GAP members are in person and others online, the GAP does not support hybrid meetings at this time because few efficiencies are gained and technological support for hybrid meetings is costly and temperamental. However, the GAP feels it is worthwhile to continue to explore hybrid options as technology progresses 
and efficiencies can be gained. It is appropriate to keep this as an option if another pandemic or similar situation occurs in the future. In summary, the GAP prefers meeting in person, especially for complex or controversial agenda items. One or two virtual meetings per year may be acceptable, but in consultation with GAP leadership. Hybrid alternatives should continue to be explored as time permits and technology progresses. And that completes my report. Uh, do I have any questions? Okay, not seeing any. Thank you, Louie. Next up is Yvonne Derigny with the EWG report. Yvonne. Good morning. Thank you for having me today. This is Yvonne Derigny from the Ecosystem Work Group. I'll be reading from the Supplemental Ecosystem Report 1. The Ecosystem Work Group discussed council meeting process efficiencies and effectiveness at its meeting on March 6th. 2023 and subsequently reviewed the situation summary and council staff white paper submitted for the April 2023 meeting. The April 2023 council staff white paper mainly addresses the technical challenges and efficiencies of in-person, online, and hybrid meeting formats. The EWG has minor comments on that white paper. While the investment in hybrid meeting equipment may be substantial up front, the savings to count Soul and travel costs from even a few advisory body members would probably pay for that investment within one to two meetings. Hybrid meetings make the council process more accessible to all advisory body members in the event that a member is unable to travel due to health reasons, caretaking responsibilities, etc. Hybrid meetings have also been shown to increase equity in attendance and with the advancements in technology on many fishing vessels may allow for at least some industry representatives to participate even while at sea during fishing seasons. But even as I'm reading that, I'm thinking that may be technologically possible, but physically impossible. The EWG members who attended the council's March 2023 meeting in person were impressed with the sound quality of the equipment used to allow advisory bodies to report remotely on council agenda items. If the council decides to embark on a strategic planning process as suggested in the situation summary for this agenda item, the EWG refers the council and any committees of the whole to the September 2022 EWG report on council meeting efficiencies and effectiveness. Our September 2022 report includes both our recommendations for future EWG meeting operations and recommendations for the proposed strategic planning exercise. A strategic planning process should, at a minimum, include hard looks at modernizing and improving the Council's use of the advance briefing book and advance briefing period, which we call two weeks prior to the Council meeting. EWG advance briefings are regularly attended by 40 to 100 people, while EWG in-person meetings are regularly attended by fewer than five members of the public. Council staff makes recordings of our advance briefings available to the public before the start of in-person meetings, which helps council process participants better understand our written materials. Improving the efficiencies in the annual or biennial management processes in the fishery management plans all of which we happen to have summarized in the appendix to our March report for agenda item H2A. The committee should ask themselves, are our existing management processes and scheduled bit schedules based on the most efficient and effective use of science analyses and public input in the management process, or are they designed to fit into the council's traditional March, April, June, September, November meeting schedule? Could online briefings or council meetings be added to the annual calendar in a way that would allow the council to reduce its in-person meeting time? The amount of council floor time and advisory body time spent on agenda items where no decision is needed. We are uncertain whether the Pacific Council is more gracious and welcoming of a wide range of ocean-related briefings than other fishery management councils, but we suspect that at least some of the non-decision items could be moved to advanced briefing webinars. The EWG again reminds the council that they recently completed a scenario planning exercise around adapting fish stocks and fisheries to climate change and refers the council to the results of the workshops associated with the climate and communities initiative, which included many suggestions for improving council decision making flexibility and nimbleness. It would be unfortunate if the council were to engage in a new strategic planning process and then emerge from that process without making noticeable changes to the efficiency and effectiveness of the council process. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Yvonne. 
Um, the questions on the EWG report? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Next up is uh, Alan Surex uh, with the um, HMS MT report. Alan, you're back. Welcome. Yeah. Yes, hello again. Um, I'll be reading the HMS MT report. I would like to summarize it, but I haven't figured out how. So the HMSMT held a webinar on March 27th to discuss the council staff white paper on formats for advisory body meetings and the future council meeting agenda and workload planning council staff proposal on advisory body meeting formats. One challenge in considering trade-offs between the various formats is that the cost to support virtual meeting time as opposed to travel and per diem for in-person meetings are relatively easy to compare in monetary terms Whereas the relative benefits such as quality of communications or support for representative participation are not easy to quantify. The council may wish to consider quantitative metrics for meeting effectiveness, such as levels of participation among different constituent groups and rates at which the council agenda items can be covered in the different formats as proxies for the relative value of the different formats. After discussion of the pros and cons of the various meeting formats covered in the white paper, the HMSMT recommends the council continue to use a mix of concurrent virtual and in-person meeting formats in the future. In addition to the concurrent virtual and in-person meeting format currently being utilized, the HMSMT proposes a consideration of a split meeting format where ABs meet virtually prior to as well as in person at the council meeting when appropriate. Agenda items that are more administrative in nature or require less interaction with council constituents outside the ABs could be, con could be scheduled for virtual meeting time, reserving in-person meeting time for topics requiring in-person discussion, collaboration, and or con consultation. This split meeting approach could allow for greater scheduling flexibility by planning a sequential virtual meetings for the management teams and advisory sub panels in advance of the council meeting and concurrent in-person meetings for both ABs. This could minimize in-person meeting time and therefore costs and better optimize council staff's time by enabling more engagement with each advisory body, as well as increase the opportunity for discussion between management teams and advisory subpanels by allowing each AB to hear the other's discussion. A potential shortcoming might be the creation of expectations for increased overall meeting time. The HMSMT also urges acknowledgement that it is common for ABs to have overlapping membership and recommends this be taken into account when scheduling AB meeting times and when selecting meeting formats. The HMSMT appreciates council staff attachment three under the April workload planning agenda item and strongly desires that AB meeting formats should be planned as far in advance as possible. The HMSMT supports meeting in person for September and November as scheduled in the, in the report and proposes that the council's workload planning process specifically query the ABs to provide recommendations on meeting format for each meeting based on proposed agenda items. The hybrid AB meeting format as outlined in the staff white paper is not without its own challenges, but it does allow for new opportunities to improve flexibility and efficiency. A hybrid AB meeting format could accommodate AB members who cannot attend in person due to extenuating circumstances. However, the option of attending remotely could potentially reduce in-person meeting participation and may also create a perception of inequity between AB members attending in person and those attending remotely. Cost savings are also limited under the hybrid AB meeting format since meeting space still needs to be allocated for members attending in person. Criteria and an approval process should be developed to authorize remote attendance of AB members in hybrid meetings similar to that of designation of an alternate. The HMSMT considers the split meeting format of virtual and in-person meetings, if thoughtfully planned, to be a better balance of equitable stakeholder engagement and meeting costs and efficiencies than a hybrid meeting format, but does recognize the value and necessity of the hybrid meeting option for special cases, such as engaging with experts or key M AB members that are not able to attend a meeting in person. The HMSMT supports investment in the necessary technology and personal capacity needed for, for limited hybrid meetings, like the hot swapped, to accommodate these special circumstances, but not as a replacement for in-person meetings. There are equity implications of the different meeting formats for various council constituents. For instance, the virtual and hybrid meeting formats make participation less costly for members of the public who cannot afford to attend in person. However, the virtual format may also disadvantage key constituents in the council process who are less comfortable with virtual platforms and may discourage participation. 
The HMSMT has found that our ability to meet effectively in the virtual format is commonly com compromised by distractions and t technical glitches that are generally not present when meeting in person. Additionally, public participation in virtual meetings appears to be reduced in comparison to in-person HMSMT meetings. Thank you, Alan. Questions on the HMSMT report? Krista Smithson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you for the report. It is comprehensive and thorough um, and has a lot of great recommendations. I just am wondering, because you talked about the trade-offs of overlapping memberships, if there was any discussion about um, the benefit of having overlapping memberships. Um, we certainly have seen more of that in recent years um, with people holding positions in multiple advisory bodies and just um, kind of the, the benefit to that, but also the trade-off in terms of meeting time and availability. Right, so we did not actually have a discussion on the benefits of it. Um, um, obviously, this is my second time here on this topic, so I'm one of the people who have overlapping mem membership. Um, and generally speaking, it's, it's kind of you get what you get as far as some, some of the organizations. Um, um, and if overlapping is necessary, then that's what we do. But we didn't specifically say whether it's better or worse, no. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Alan. Okay, next up will be the SSC report and uh, Dr. Holland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'm uh, Dan Holland, Chair of the SSC, and I'll be reading Agenda Item F2, Supplemental SSC Report 1, Scientific and Statistical Committee Report on Council Meeting and Process Efficiencies. The SSC discussed the staff white paper on formats for council advisory bodies. The SSC appreciates the continued opportunity to explore hybrid and remote meeting formats, which increase the accessibility and transparency of SSC meetings. The SSC recognizes the value of meeting in person, particularly for meetings with complex and potentially controversial agenda items. Stock assessment review star panels are an example of one type of meeting ideally held in person. Ultimately, the decision to adopt one format over another must weigh the benefits and costs of each format, which will vary according to the type of and agenda of each meeting. The SSC has the following recommendations. D discretion should be provided to advisory body chairs to determine the best meeting format on a meeting by meeting basis given the expected agenda for the meeting. Suitable technology is required for a hybrid format to be successful. Given limited resource invest resources, investment in technology should prior to prioritize audio quality over video. Mm -hmm. Both direct costs, uh, tra e.g. travel and technology costs, uh, and in-kind costs, um, for example, opportunity costs of people's time should be considered for each format. SSC meetings should be broadcast live publicly for transparency, and the council should continue to offer remote options for reading SSC statements as this allows for subject matter experts to be available for questions. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dan. Questions on the SSC report? Not seeing any. Thank you. Thank you. Next up would be the EC report and uh, Captain Dan Chadwick. Dan. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the council. Dan Chadwick representing the EC, uh, reading from agenda item F2A, supplemental EC report one. The enforcement consultants have reviewed reports associated with agenda item F2, council meeting and process efficiencies, and have the following comments. The EC would like to reiterate our September statement agenda item C3A, that the EC's preference is to meet in person in conjunction with the council meetings. We appreciate the council implementing our recommendation for the March meeting to have the full EC advisory body present for the first three days of the council meeting and allowing all but the chair and vice chair to depart prior to the end of the meeting. The EC notes in agenda item F7 that the number of days the full EC meets in September and November is four. We recommend the EC, other than the chair and vice chair, be permitted to depart after three days. <laughs> EC does see a benefit to a hybrid model that would allow both in-person and virtual participation for EC members, especially during the initial EC meeting prior to the start of each council meeting. The EC is confident they can hold public advisory body meetings 
with the technology currently available to them. For example, our issued laptops and a meeting room address. The EC has observed benefits to the hybrid meetings allowed for other representatives from the enforcement organizations, including EC designees to participate in the council. These representatives also become familiar with the process as well as provide expertise in enforcement aspects of a particular fishery the regular EC representative might not be as familiar with. The EC is supportive of improving council processes and efficiencies where possible while taking into consideration associated costs and effectiveness. The EC looks forward to participating in, the, in this discussion as the council makes for uh, future considerations. And that's the conclusion. Thank you, Dan. Questions on the EC report? Butch Smith. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, a question, uh, Captain Chabak, and I think I heard you say it. Um, you know, I, I during the meeting process, you know, all kinds of different ideas come up and, and things about regulations um, and lines and all that, all that stuff. Um, does the EC or yourself find that um, process to be easier in person versus trying to, you know, play phone tag and, and, and do it that way? Um, and, uh, and if so, could you elaborate a little bit if, if uh, so I know I feel that way, but, 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 you know, you're, you guys are much more professional at your job, um, but but I feel it's invaluable um, that you're here for those kinds of questions. But maybe you, maybe the EC thinks differently. Uh, thank you for the question, through the chair. Definitely in person for for dealing with hot topics is you know we we find it more often and especially in March and April with the with the regulations um, things come up that we need to address quickly and. And have those discussions and face to face. I was just trying to work through something yesterday with our advisory body, and and it proved to be a challenge. And I can imagine other advisory bodies have the same issue, but but especially for us and regulations is is the process moves at a kind of a lightning pace here, um, as we saw yesterday. Um, being being in the room helps us. Thank you, Captain Chadwick, and uh, thank you for not pointing out the hand-holding that I need sometimes to get through pro the process. So th thank you, sir. Thank you, Butch. Heather all. Thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you, Captain Chadwick. I appreciate the EC's report here. Um, I just noted the sentence that says the ET is confident they can hold public advisory body meetings with the technology currently available to them, such as your um, laptops and a meeting room address. And I just wanted to ask if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Um, just, is this something that you've, you've had to do or just how, how does that actually work? Thank you. Thank you for the question through the chair. Most of our public meetings, um, are, are handled with with limited personnel, I guess, or the public attending. And and we have, well, in March we were we were trying to do our best to in, include include one of our members. And and with the Ring Central, for example, just one of those platforms, um, Ring Central and in a in an address, we could allow the public to participate in there. And and all of us have our issued laptops that we have have the ring central um on and and can have them have them up and running and uh mute and and allow for enough um speaker space volume i guess just through our laptops that we can effectively um conduct business and 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 it has worked well thank you thank you heather anyone else okay thank you dan all right, next up will be the Habitat Committee report and uh, Dr. Green. Corey, are you there? Can you hear me? We can. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the council. I'm reading agenda item F2A, 
Supplemental HD Report 1, Habitat Committee Report on Council Meeting and Process Efficiencies. The Habitat Committee reviewed the staff white paper on formats for Pacific Fishery Management Council advisory body meetings and discussed the trade-offs with the different meeting formats, such as technology constraints, costs, equity and environmental justice issues, and member participation. The HD recognizes the value of in-person meetings for encouraging member participation, relationship building, and improved understanding of the council process. The committee also recognizes there are Numerous EEJ issues with requiring in-person meetings without a hybrid option, including family obligations and health considerations. Some of these equity issues are further elevated when in-person meetings are scheduled over the weekend. In general, the committee recommends some combination of in-person and remote meetings and to avoid scheduling remote week meetings over weekends. There were differences in opinions in, on how many meetings per year the HC should meet in person. Most members suggest three to four in-person meetings per year. The HC also recommends that all in-person meetings should include a hybrid option to increase participation for those otherwise unable to attend, allowing all members of the council and the public to participate to the best of their ability to achieve the council's goals should be prioritized over the potential costs associated with a hybrid format, especially since remote and hybrid options will reduce costs associated with travel and lodging. For example, during the March 2023 meeting, a limited hybrid format utilizing pucks worked well in allowing members to participate who are unable to attend in person. However, technology offering video and audio participation is preferred. The committee urges the council to invest in hybrid technology to promote participation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Questions on the Habitat Committee report? You're not seeing any. Thank you, Corey. All right, that takes care of advisory bodies, management teams, and takes us to public comment. I believe we have two. Okay. Can we let that come up? All right. All right, it'll be Brian McLaughlin, followed by Teresa Labriola. So, Brian, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? We can. Chair and council members, my name is Brian McLaughlin. I live in Portland, Oregon. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments this morning. I encourage the council to provide hybrid or at minimum live broadcast remote access to advisory panel meetings, in particular, the salmon advisory subpanel. The staff's white paper does a good job of highlighting the trade-offs of different meeting approaches. So I wanna focus on my personal experience with the council and in particular, the SAS. Prior to the pandemic, I attended council meetings occasionally when they were held in the greater Portland metro area. I don't have the means to travel outside of that area to um, attend council meetings. So I would attend a day or two and I try to time, uh, time it right to be at the SAS meetings, but it was just difficult to do. <clears throat> I found the council and SAS process to be opaque and difficult to penetrate, to really understand it and to effectively participate. Uh, even for a person with my training and professional experience, it was, it was difficult. I've spoken to many other stakeholders, primarily recreation and anglers who feel the same way. So then the pandemic came along. In 2021, the SAS uh, meetings were held remotely. Um, there was an issue of particular interest to me and I was able to structure my schedule to attend most of the SAS meetings at the April uh, meeting. My learning curve was dramatic. I learned a ton about how the seasons were structured, the interest of various groups, of the sectors, regions, how the models impact the process, and the discussion and negotiation dynamics of the SAS. I learned a lot about the people also, both SAS members and public agency staff that are involved in the process. Importantly, I was able to structure my participation and comments to be more thoughtful, more timely, and more effective. I observed that the management measures and seasons were largely decided in the SAS process, so to speak, the cake was baked uh, during the SAS process. And by the time it got to the council, things were already agreed upon. The important discussions, negotiations, and debates happened within the SAS. That's where, to mix metaphors here, the sausage was made. So in my view, it's important that the public have adequate access to SAS meetings. For example, I don't have access to SAS meetings um, this time around, either at March meeting or at this April meeting. When I had access, 
I was able to comment directly to the SAS rather than to the council. So this season, I've testified four times to the council on sandwich management issues. I have received no questions at all. I have no idea how my testimony has been received. That was not my experience when I could comment directly to the SAS. Uh, there was feedback and there was discussion, and I think it was much more productive. I also want to note that providing access to the SAS remotely will further congressional intent. My understanding is that the Magnus and Stevens Act provides that the advisory body proceedings should be open to the public. And while in-person meetings are open to the public technically, there are a lot of barriers, as you've heard others say, to attending in person, time and expense of travel being the most significant one for me. Thus providing remote access, either participatory or live broadcast, will further congressional objectives and the objectives of this council for a more open, transparent, and inclusive process. Finally, I believe that remote access will help foster a more open culture, particularly with the SAS. At the um, 2001 SAS meetings that were conducted remotely in April, the SAS excluded the public from some SAS meetings where SAS business was conducted, including discussions and negotiations regarding structuring seasons and allocating fishing opportunity in the South of Falcon area. I was personally excluded from one meeting even before I uttered a word, and I had to refuse to leave another SAS meeting when the public was requested to leave and other members of the public did. I objected to this and sub subsequently had to appeal to Executive Director Tracy to intercede, which to his credit, he did, instructing the SES not to exclude the public from SAS meetings. The experience that I had exposed, in my view, a culture of conducting SAS substantive business outside the public view. I was told directly by council staff, including Executive Director Tracy, that it was the practice to adjourn SAS meetings, public meetings, and then convene the group at the hotel, restaurant, lounge, pool, et cetera, and to have substantive discussions about and negotiations about the management measures under consideration. So I think it's very important to provide some type of remote access to the SAS proceedings, and this would aid in addressing this cultural concern I have. Um, I urge the council, therefore, to prioritize public access by remote means to the SAS proceedings. And finally, I would also urge the council to also provide some type of remote access to the salmon season meetings that are held between March and April. You heard that there was, it was very poor attendance in Coos Bay, for example. It's three and a half hours to drive there and that three and a half hours back for me and for many people. And I know we just can't do that to you know, provide three or four minutes of testimony. So I think those meetings especially would benefit by some type of remote access. I do appreciate the time uh, you've given me to to um, comment here, and I would just say that remote access will foster more open, transparent, and inclusive council proceedings. It's the way of the future, and, it, and it's worth the council's investment. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Krista Vincent. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you for your testimony today and earlier in the week. Um, you're in luck today, I guess. I do have a question for you. I don't know if you listened to the last agenda item, which was on equity and environmental justice, but I spoke briefly about, um, in that instance, recording advisory meetings, um, but I'm, you've cited um, providing live access, and I'm just wondering if live access is sufficient, um, if recordings would be beneficial, but just getting more feedback into that public process um, to allow engagement and, and understanding for public about what we do here? Well, I think live access would be uh, most important because this is a fast moving process. And if you have live access, you can structure your comments accordingly. Um, although recordings, you know, I have found in many other uh, forms to be very important. People don't always have, their schedules don't always align with uh, the meetings of the SAS. And so if they can, if those uh, meetings were put online, say the night of or the next day, they could go back and they could listen to them. And I've done that a number of times with council meetings that I don't have the time to, to listen to the full council meeting, but 
you know, after I put my daughter to bed, I, I turn it on and I listen to it. And uh, it's very informative that way. So I think, I think both things are important. I prefer live access, but uh, if that can't be done, um, uh, certainly putting recordings up online in a timely manner will be very helpful. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Krista. Chair Grolick. Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. First, uh, Brian, I want to apologize. You got excluded. Um, the public should never be excluded from these meetings um, at all. So I'm glad you spoke up, and I'm, I'm glad that got fixed. Um, with regard to this salmon season setting process this year, were, were you able to reach out to your representative on the SAS? And if so, uh, how did that go for you? Uh, yes, I did. I did talk to uh, Mr. Heap uh, a couple of times. He has been very accessible uh, anytime I've called him and very responsive to, uh, you know, my concerns. But I will say this, you know, um, you know, fishermen, we all tend to have our own point of view, and, and I don't necessarily uh, have the same point of view as Mr. Heap on some of these issues. And so being able to attend uh, remotely or at least hear what's being discussed and exactly why certain choices are made would have been very important. I think it would have been able to inform my uh, testimony to this council more than, uh, than just the, the discussions with Mr. Heap. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Clear writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. McLaughlin, for providing testimony today. Um, just wanting to note that these issues um, are across advisory bodies. It's not just the SAS, uh, but do appreciate you bringing up your personal experience with the SAS and with the council process. 100% um, substantive discussion should not be happening outside of meetings. Um, you know, we do our best to avoid it, but I think it's something to always keep in the front of our minds, and especially as we think about council process, how important that is for um, governance and management best practices. Uh, I've heard from a lot of people in my own experience that this process is, as you noted, very opaque. It is difficult to engage in for anyone without the resources of time or money. Um, and it's a, it's a process that we are trying to solve here. So thank you for helping us do that prior by providing your thoughts and suggestions on how to improve. Thank you, Corey. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Brian. Next up is uh, Teresa Labriola. Teresa? Good morning, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger and members of the council. I'm Teresa Labriola and I represent Wild Oceans. I've been a public participant in the Pacific Council process for more than 10 years attending meetings of the council and your advisory bodies and management teams in person and remotely. And I'd like to provide you with some perspective as a member of the public. Um, first, I'd really like to thank the council staff and management team and advisory bodies for their really thoughtful comments on how to improve their work and also to include the public. Um, advisory bodies and management teams have been described as the maitre d's of the council. And I think Brian's testimony really demonstrated this better than I can describe. Part of their job is to help members of the public learn and about the issues. And it's not a intuitive process when you um, first enter, enter the room. Um, I'd really like to encourage you to think about incorporating virtual meetings or hybrid meetings into the management team and advisory body schedules to provide increased, um, more accessible opportunities for public stakeholders to help them learn about the council priorities, the decision-making process, the um, balancing, and to become knowledgeable participants in the public process. In addition to this, I'd ask you to consider how management team and advisory body meetings can be structured, such as the EWG pre-council briefings, to help the public and members of advisory bodies and management teams to understand and engage in cross-cutting issues. I, I really do find the EWG pre-council meetings um, informative, and I'm always impressed that there are so many people on those virtual meetings. 
Uh, virtual meetings also allow the council to stagger meetings and um, members of the public and members of the management team and advisory panel can attend multiple meetings that may otherwise overlap. I know that when I attend meetings in person, I'm often bouncing between highly migratory species advisory subpanel, the highly migratory species management team, the CPSMT, the CPSAS, the EWG, the council floor. And um, I, I don't get to engage fully in, in any of those um, those meetings. So virtual meetings allow us to stagger the meetings, not only for my benefit, but for members, other members of the public and, um, and, and management team members. Uh, several management teams highlighted that items that are more administrative in nature um, could happen, are, are, are prime for, ha for being scheduled beforehand and reserving in-person meeting times for topics that require more discussion and collaboration. Um, this split meeting approach, I think it could, is great and could provide some scheduling flexibility. But again, I wanna go back to the beginning about um, educating the public. These are also good opportunities to educate them about complex topics. Um, for example, coastal pelagic species essential fish habitat. It's, it's not, not everybody understands essential fish habitat in the process and what the opportunities are. And um, uh, having a, a meeting ahead of time that has a little more of a, a broader background approach can really make the council process um, more inclusive and more welcoming to the public. Uh, virtual meetings that occur before council meetings also facilitate a greater understanding of analyses and trade-offs and recommendations made by, council, by management teams and advisory bodies um, and allow their reports to be issued timely in a timely way. And their reports are often come out a day or maybe the day of the council um, agenda item and, and pre-council meetings that are virtual um, can aid in um, better understanding their deliberative process for both council members and the public. Um, there's one negative component uh, of both virtual and person and in-person meetings that I just wanted to point out, and, and Brian just reminded me of them. And it's the use of Google Docs by either management teams or advisory body members to draft and discuss documents during a meeting. When this is used, um, Basically, as a member of the public, I will be sitting in a meeting and I will spend the majority of the day watching members type to each other on a computer. So there's very, very little interaction, public interaction between members of the team and members of the public, and it's really not an open public process. So regardless of whether your meetings are virtual or in person, this is a disconnect with having a, a public process that I've found over the years. Um, I really appreciated the opportunity to participate remotely. Um, I often find myself in the position of trying to encourage other uh, recreational fishermen to attend meetings. And um, while it's enticing to attend a meeting where there's a high profile issue, it's just as important to get um, the public involved in the process. And I, I think virtual meetings are a lower bar um, to, to that. So I'll just end by saying that you're not the only council or, or public body grappling with new technologies and, and, and ways to expand opportunities and the challenge of virtual meetings. I regularly participate in the Western Pacific Fishery Management Council meetings. And I wouldn't be able to participate in these meetings if I had to travel to Hawaii or Saipan or Samoa. And while trans-Pacific flights are an obvious hurdle, um, the cost of traveling from Oregon to California, as well as the opportunity costs discussed by the SSC provide similar hurdles to participation. Um, I have recently participated in, in hybrid meetings, including the Pacific Sardine Stock Structure Workshop and the North Pacific Albacore Stakeholder Workshop, which are ancillary to the council process. And these were really well-conducted um, hybrid and virtual meetings that were informative. They welcomed the, the public comment and they were productive. And they're maybe an example of how virtual and hybrid meetings shouldn't be exactly the same as an in-person meeting. Maybe there is an opportunity for a little more background uh, and a little more of a, uh, just uh, they, they're, they're not going to be exactly the same. So I'd encourage you to take this opportunity to work to expand public access to fisheries management deliberations and decisions by incorporating and improving your virtual meeting opportunities. And I ask you to consider how virtual meetings can be incorporated in the process and structured to maximize transparency 
and public access to council and advisory body deliberations and to enhance public inclusion and decision making. Thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa. Questions for Teresa on her testimony? Okay. That finishes the public comment. It takes us to council action. Before us. So with that, I'll open the floor for discussion. Chair Grolnick. Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. Um, this, I, I've loved the comments we've received from our management entities and advisory bodies, as well as the public comments. And it, it just illustrates, I think, what a difficult situation we have because there isn't one path we can take that's optimal for every objective. And so we end up having to balance, um, balance these things. Um, I, I wanna address um, the comments regarding the SAS um, mostly because I spent a lot of years on the SAS and years before that I spent as, as a stakeholder. And, um, you know, there are talks in hallways. There are state delegate, you know, state members will, will meet. And I, I just not sure how you, how you can really, uh, you know, those, they're, they're all ad hoc. Um, and so I'm just not sure how, I mean, it'd be great if we could figure out how to do that in a hybrid fashion. I'm just not sure how how that does how that happens. And in regard to Ms. Labriola's comment about folks, you know, on management teams or advisory bodies messaging each other, well, you know, that happens here too, you know. And people, council members at breaks, talk about how to solve problems. And so there's always an aspect of this deliberative process that is facilitated by, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one discussions happening in hallways. And so I don't think there's any, I think we need to recognize that this process is never gonna be as transparent as we would all like. We wanna make sure that we involve the public, we listen to the public, we listen to stakeholders, um, we allow full participation, but it's, it's never going to be possible to make the process perfect for everyone. And I just wanted to just to express that. Thank you, Chair Grolnick, and uh, well said. Um, Butch Smith. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and um, a little bit to what Mark said, and I, and I agree totally. Sometimes we use the terminology SAS or GAP um, members like it's a meeting. And I think that's where the confusion is. It might be the Washington SAS member, the, the Oregon GAP member has to pull out and talk to a bio. It's not a meeting. It's something that, you know, things explode around here like crazy, especially in the salmon uh, from time to time where we're uh, a member of the, of the, of the council, of the, of the subcommittee has to go and, and work things out, not the whole group. And I, and I, and I, can I, you know, I understand what Mr. McLaughlin is, is saying, and we can all, all approve, but this idea that, you know, we're behind the bushes having full SAS meetings is just, is fictional. It's not true. And, uh, um, you know, uh, under my reign of terror, the SAS, and under Richard's reign of terror, I, I know we don't let that happen. We in incorporate everyone and to the table and uh, uh and so i do take some exception that the rumor is that we do everything and that's the farthest from the truth i'm involved in a lot of governmental processes and i can say this is as open as we can make it and and to the point when this council was set up it was set up you know kind of before <laughs> the zoom computer cell phones uh, and, and everything else so you had port and representatives who you went through to, if you couldn't make the meeting to um, convey your wishes and, uh, and let's not get away from, you know, that's why we have sport reps. That's why I have commercial reps. That's why we have NGOs. That's why we, you know, that's why we have try to bring everybody to the table. So it's well represented. And so I think sometimes in this day of high speed media and, 
and getting the answers, you know, as quick as we can, we, we can't lose sight of that this process was set up uh, to represent everybody and not exclude anybody from the beginning. So I just wanted to throw those, uh, those, um, I guess, remarks, um, you know, to what we heard publicly and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, to my council member, Mr. Dooley, Mr. M rep recruiter of the year, I think maybe Brian Laughlin would be do good and, and get, getting in and on a M rep program to, to kind of see and be a little more, not that he isn't, but a little more educated on the process and uh, how, how it works. But anyway, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, for letting me comment. Thank you much. Further discussion? Virgil Moore. Part of mine is a, <clears throat> a question that doesn't need to be answered right now, but it is given our operating procedures, are there any, uh, any needs for the individual committees to ever go into executive session and exclude the public from observing and listening? Certainly we have that as a council. I do not know whether our various committees have that. Uh, ability uh, from a chair standpoint. And uh, if they do, we need to be sure the public fully understands when and how that is done would be the only thing I would state about that. Certainly, if a meeting is ever adjourned with the statement that further discussions can take place on this matter outside of the meeting, that's inappropriate in my mind. Uh, but an adjournment of a meeting with an understanding that individual members will likely continue those discussions without any decision making or deliberation relative to that is essentially what we heard uh, Mark and Butch comment on, and I'm fully supportive of that. And I hope that our public understands that in terms of maintaining both efficiencies in our meetings and decorum that the chairs have to have the opportunity to make decisions about when public input is cut off, but not excluding them from listening in and understanding what's going on in those meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Virgil. <laughs> Krista. Yeah. Um, I, um, I guess I just want to reflect for a minute. I think we heard a lot from our advisory panels um, about not having mixed, meaning I, I don't particularly see that as a majority path forward, meaning most advisory bodies said, hey, we'd rather be in person or we'd rather be remote, but it's challenging to have a mix in terms of capability. So um, just sort of highlighting that. I also want to reflect on um, the feedback that we got from the public today. We may not like what we have heard in some cases, but what our own personal beliefs are, we kind of need to step away from that and say we have um, members of the public, and I will say to those two, because you're probably listening, it was brave of you to come forward. It was a hard thing to do. There are many other people out there that have had experiences that they don't feel comfortable enough coming forward with. Um, and we may not like that perception, um, but it is something that we need to look at in terms of efficiencies and moving forward, both for this topic and for the one prior to. So I just... Um, I just think we need to highlight that and not say, hey, this was this was a one off deal or it was, you know, just a couple of people. My own experience, having been a member of the public, uh, not in Salmon, <laughs> was that I got told I needed to, uh, as a member of the public, sit in the back of the room. And uh, in general, the public didn't say anything. So you know, okay, I'm, I'm one person um, and everybody's experience is different, but I do think clarity for the public, whether that's expanding the MREP program, um, whether it's highlighting through, you know, 
a code of conduct. What that looks like, I don't know, but I do think that it's something we should grapple with based upon commentary today. Thank you, Krista. Lynn? Uh, mine was on a slightly different topic if folks want to continue. That's, that's fine. Okay. Um, just what I heard a lot in the various advisory body reports is we understand the situation we're in these days of hotels, space, budget, and another issue I haven't heard is carbon footprint, our carbon footprint of these meetings. I think that realistically moving forward, we are going to have to have some meetings where not all advisory bodies are in person. But one of the key things I heard in a number of the reports was being strategic about it and having council staff work with the leadership of those particular advisory bodies so that key items, uh, big picture items aren't being discussed when they're remote. As an example, with the gap and gear switching, if PPA was going to be here in April, they wanted to be in person for gear switching for those discussions. That got moved to June, so it was a little more palatable. Um, but I do think this is going to be our future, is looking at having to look at this through what are those trade-offs and just being very strategic and having the ABs involved uh, is, would be a good way to go forward. Thank you, Lynn. Chair Goldick. Yeah, I just want to add some perspective here. And I think that um, trying to improve our process for the public um, is critical to our mission here. But I think we should sit back and compare ourselves to comparable bodies and see how other bodies work. I know that in our state, we have a Fish and Game Commission, and it doesn't have a tiny fraction of the public involvement and transparency that we have here. And you can look at the legislative bodies whether it's in your state or at the national level that doesn't have anywhere near the degree of genuine uh, public participation and transparency we have here. So we, we should always strive to do better, but I do think we need to keep that in perspective um, that we already have one of the better processes, um, quasi-legislative processes that, uh, that we have uh, anywhere in the country. Uh, I just wanted to also touch on, I mean, I think there were really, there's two, two pressure points here. And one is to maximize genuine public participation and having the hybrid process that allows at least, for, at least at the very <laughs> least remote public comment and to, to the extent as possible, um, listening in on or, and or participating in, in advisory body and management and any and management bodies. I, I realize that that's, there's a tremendous technical challenge there, but that we should we should uh, perhaps take a look at. That's one pressure point we have. The other pressure point we have is budget. And so while we can find hotels that can accommodate all of our groups, um, the selection is smaller and therefore the price is higher. But that's something we have accommodated in the past, but we, we we haven't, our council's not seen a funding increase, notwithstanding inflation. So um, that's a genuine constraint we have. So I just wanted to clarify those are, I think I see those as the two pressure points under this agenda item. Thank you, Chair Goldick. Uh, Corey Wright. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, just a couple of comments in response to this discussion. Um, I hear chair's comments about other bodies and i think in terms of comparing us to other councils this is the best council um however i this is still a very opaque process for many people it is still a process that is difficult to engage for many people and there's many reasons for that um and i'm i'm not going to pick on the sas but as i said previously you know there are barriers to entry for many people and i think this efficiencies process is a good way to be thinking about some of that. And I appreciate the staff document on that. Um, but there, it is um, not always transparent and it is not always inclusive. So thinking about these things moving forward is, is really important. Um, you know, and, and thinking about how other bodies work, um, other political bodies, you know, it is not even allowed that members would be able to talk to each other off of the council floor. Um, clearly, we don't adhere to that standard or that practice, but there's a wide range in terms of how political groups govern themselves and how transparency is conducted 
and what is allowed on the floor versus off the floor. Um, I am not a governance and management expert, so I'm not going to claim to have that answer, but I think it's worth considering and just noting that um, there's certainly a spectrum and that is, is something that we could educate ourselves on if we wanted to. Um, finally, while I appreciate the nods to MREP, um, MREP is for fishermen by fishermen. It is not for the public by the public. So while it is a great model for how to better understand, to engage with your government, um, it is not for the public. I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Hey, Corey, Phil Anderson. Um, well, when I first of all, I just want to compliment the staff on the white paper and help trying to bring clarity to some of the terms that we use. Um, uh, so that's very much appreciated. Um, I also, you know, when we started uh, this topic, um, two things I had in my head in particular were touched on by Chairman Gorelnik. One was uh, what budget limitations do we have in terms of meet of having meetings that are include in person for all of our committees and panels. Um, and the second was what limitations do we have in terms of facilities that are able to accommodate that. Um, those are two limiting factors uh, that I that there's some clarity on the facility piece. There's less clarity for me on what the budget limitations are. Um, so, so that is to say that if we wanted to go back to a total to, to pre pandemic, we're in every virtually everything's in person. Do we have the budget wherewithal to support that or not? And if we don't, that's obviously an important consideration of how we're going to move forward and prioritize meetings that are in person versus those uh, that could be held virtually. Um, so that's a point of clarification that I'm not asking for right this second, but in moving forward and thinking about how far do we need to move away from our pre-pandemic model uh, as a result of budget limitations that we have now that we didn't have then. Um, setting that aside, I'm extremely proud of this council and how we operate. Um, we're not perfect, uh, for sure. And as Chairman Gorelnik said, we always need to be looking for ways to improve. And this is an opportunity for us to take a little deeper dive than we do for the most part uh, in terms of looking at how can we improve our process uh, that allows better access to our process by the public. And that's a good thing. Uh, but when you stop and think about the, the geographic area and the number of fisheries and the number of communities that this council covers with, it, with its actions, it's pretty overwhelming. Uh, and, and, and it is difficult for people um, to participate, um, let alone the time commitment, the cost, to follow us and come to our meetings is a is an obstacle. It always has been, uh, and I suspect it always will be. Um, so I think we have we have. Um, if there's anything good that came out of the pandemic, I think we have learned about some tools that are available to us to help make our process more accessible by the public, and to the extent that we can build on that experience and have that as a result, then uh, that's a good thing. And we ought to be exploring that. Um, and my last, I guess my last comment has to do with our, our AP um, process and, I, every, and, and other committees that we establish. Um, 
I think we go out of our way to make sure that we provide for an opportunity for the public that attends those meetings to make comment to the committee. Um, and there are, in some instances, maybe a lot of instances where the way those meetings are, are run don't separate the members of the of the committee from the public that are in the room. They allow the public to engage with the committee as they have that their discussion. <clears throat> but I also think it's totally appropriate if the chairman of their of that committee or sub panel wants to bring the conversation back amongst the members that we have appointed as our advisors to have a discussion and bring forward a recommendation to us. Um, so uh, bottom line on my point here is is um, I think we've learned some things that we can uh, uh, expand our access to, uh, to the public, to our process, and we ought to build on that. Um, um, and, and also recognize that we have a big job to do here that covers a lot of area that makes it very, very difficult to have a process. Um, uh, Ms. Writings has used the word opaque. Um, I don't know that I would use that word. I think uh, um, that our our process we meet five times a year up and down the up and down the coast, and uh, recognize and figuring out ways that we can improve people that can't travel uh, to our meetings to make them feel like they can be a part of our process and have input into our decision making is the important part. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. <clears throat> I just, I agree with the comments that have been made here. I disagree with one, that MREP is for fishermen by fishermen. That's the moniker that's on the website. But I'm intimately involved in, in that, and so are several members of this, in, of this body. And it is inclusive. We take applications from everyone. We try to balance the, the participants. Yes, we would favor probably fishermen over non-fishermen, but there have been plenty of non-fishermen that have attended that over the seven years we've been doing this on the West Coast. And I, I think that it's probably not a good uh, thing to say that it's not for the public because we've had teachers, uh, uh, we've had several different non-fishermen apply and go through the program. So are they not the majority? No, they're not, but it's hard to justify a, a fisheries issue like that or a fisheries training to, to, to include just solely that. It's, it's a balance. There are council members that have attended. There are several agency folks that are up and down. So I would, I would take exception to calling it not inclusive. I think it's been very inclusive. So one other comment here is, um, you know, it's budget. We've got, we've got so much so many budget constraints, and we've heard it many times. But perhaps, you know, with, I mean, with the genie's out of the bottle as far as virtual. <laughs> Since we've went through COVID and come out of it, I don't think we're ever going back. There will be a virtual uh, component. So perhaps we don't need to be meeting in areas that we meet anymore. Maybe we don't, maybe we can go to areas that aren't as expensive. This is a real, where we are today is a pretty darn expensive county and things cost a lot of money here and other places too. But is it necessary to go to the, all the locales? Can we go to, I know I, in the future we're contemplating Fresno, not a, not a port town, but, or even close to it. But maybe there's, maybe we find the places that fit our budget and perhaps that will enable us be, to invest the in more virtual equipment and technology and like Merrick said, staffing, because it it isn't just plop a speaker on the on the table and go at it. There's a lot of work to that and a lot of and staff support. We see it here in this room with you know three people full time 
manning this the virtual stuff we do here. So I'll stop there, but hopefully we can explore those. I guess one final thing, I do agree that this is, we are, we are much like our government. We are representatives. We have, we're chosen to represent different uh, parts of the fishery, different, you know, whether they be states, whether they be, you know, uh, ground fish, trawl, CPS, all those, all those people are representative. They're not, and I know the last time I was in DC, I don't get to help make the soup there. I can go and talk to a, a representative or a senator and they may listen to me or they may not. They may vehemently disagree with me. I don't get to intrude in their decision-making too much. So um, I think we're much modeled to that. We're representatives and we do the best we can. And if we're not doing a good job, I'm certain we won't be here next next term. So, um, so thank you. I appreciate it. And really, I I thank you, Merrick, for the report. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Court. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, just a couple more bits to add on to the conversation here. Um, first, um, thanks for your comments, Phil. I just wanted to. Um, highlight something you said, which was, and appreciate the fact that time and money is always going to be an obstacle, that it's not solvable. And I agree with that. I don't think there's any perfect situation where the council is able to overcome that. Um, I think when I was speaking to that, and when I think about that, I think about it in the context of the point is recognizing that that barrier is there and continually in an ongoing way, thinking about that barrier and what we can do to address it and make sure as our fisheries change, as our world changes, as our coast changes, as the challenges that we're facing changes to make sure that we're including different new people, different new ways of thinking, and that we're addressing that. So I, I just wanted to say that I agree with you on that and appreciate your comments. Um, also, in terms of opacity, uh, I think we do do a good job of our physical locations. We move up and down the coast and it's clear that that's a challenge for council staff <laughs> to make that happen with hotels. And again, there's no perfect location. You know, it'd be wonderful if we could meet in some cases in smaller communities or different locations or mix it up. But that's, I'm not sure that that's something we can do or maybe that's a longer term discussion, but I, there are limitations to that. Um, you know, I think when I use that word, I think a lot about um, advisory bodies those members and folks who are paid to be here and are paid to represent, as Bob noted, um, versus the public and the difference in barriers for entry for those two groups. Um, also, the ability to, um, and we, we heard this in public comment today, the ability to digest and understand council documentation and process is is hard. That's that's hard for people with multiple advanced degrees, you know, let alone people who don't have those degrees and don't have necessarily the time to be able to understand that. And again, there's no perfect solution, but just recognizing the difficulty and being able to engage, even if you do have the time and money, just um, what our documentation can be like is, is what I mean when I use the word opacity. Um, finally, uh, in response to Bob's comment about MRIP, um, yes, the website says for fishermen by fishermen, um, which is where I got that. Um, also, uh, you know, it is from what I understand, and I could stand to be educated about this, you know, it's not public, it is a private process. Um, and it also depends a lot on who, who decides who gets to come to that, you know, and you've spoken a bit to that, um, but how that process is decided and, um, how, how that training is provided is not an open, it's not open to the public. So um, that is where that comment comes from. I think a lot of what's provided in there is obviously of really high quality um, and as a way to engage people. So I just wanted to be clear about that. Thanks. Um, <coughs> thank you, Director Burton. Oh, Heather. Thank you, Vice Chair. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll just make it brief. And I've really appreciated the discussion here um, to Again, the advisory body reports, I um, I think we've seen that the future looks different and it's probably going to include all of these things and then just figuring out or all the, these approaches to meeting and engaging the public, um, it, it will all be included here, um, is at least the way I see it. It's the way I see it. 
uh, when we meet in state um, sponsored meetings. I will always have a, a virtual opportunity for people to um, provide input. I just, there's just no walking back from that. It's been a great thing for our sport um, meetings where we're setting up um, talking about ground fish or talking about halibut before we come to the council meetings. And it was something that I also thought about too. And part of my responsibility as a state manager is helping people understand what those meetings um, provide to the council process and how that all works. So I feel like, you know, I go home with the refreshed reminder of the responsibility I have to make sure that the Washington stakeholders understand how they can contribute to this process and make it, um, less intimidating, which I think it can be. So uh, just a reminder for that. I also wanted to note the ecosystem working groups comments. And I also want to say leadership. I think they've shown us really how effective and valuable these pre uh, meeting presentations can be and that are recorded that we can go look at if you can't uh, participate. Um, going back to some of the initiative uh, work that was done uh, to me. I think that's also a really neat tool that we've learned a lot more about and even the GMT incorporating presentations into the way they present um, statements um, that are really complex, like around the harvest specification process um, was is really been valuable. Um, so I was also just trying to think if there's anything in particular I could offer in terms of guidance and how what the white paper looks like coming back in June, but it's really just uh, trying to incorporate all those different eating options in a way and that that is um, kind of helping us put this puzzle together as we go. I, I know it feels quite big, but no, that's it. Thank you, Vice Chair. Yeah, thank you, Heather. I think it's, it is important, the, the input to the agencies. I mean, it hasn't been really mentioned here around the table. That's a, a very important part. There's multiple ways to input into the system here. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, Eric? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, this has been a really great discussion, and um, I thought I would uh, offer up some of my thoughts about where I see us going and some of the takeaways that uh, I've, I've taken from uh, advisory body comments and conversations with several of you. Um, if, if I reflect on, um, you know, when we first started having this discussion, um, I think there was a lot of divergence about what the future held in store, uh, how much remote setting we were going to be doing, how much in person we were going to be doing all the possibilities of a hybrid meeting format and what have you. And as I hear this discussion and I, I uh, read the advisory body statements, it's my impression that there is a lot of convergence actually in what we all prefer as a meeting format. <clears throat> By and large, there is a lot of value recognized through in-person meetings. There is acknowledgement that remote meetings make sense from time to time and that there are special occasions, I believe, when a hybrid setup makes sense. Uh, and when I think of a hybrid setup, I'm thinking of the meeting, formal meeting participants, some remote, some in person. One example of a, um, a case where that would make sense would be, you know, if we have someone who is caretaking of their elderly parent, perhaps, and they can't make the meeting. Yes, we'll see if we can provide options for them to patch in. And, and that's the kind of thing that I'm envisioning. Um, as I think about where we are now and where we're headed, um, at the moment, as you have seen in the white paper, due to staffing and available technology and the, and the fact that we have multiple concurrent meetings, we're able to host about two hybrid meetings in addition to the ballroom. Um, that's about all we can do and feel confident that that meeting will uh, be successful. There's a possibility that number will go up as, you know, Kelly and I are um, you know, rethinking ways of staff organization. And so one thing that we're exploring now is um, Sandra might not be the only person in that seat going forward. And if we approach things that way, then Chris might not be the only person in that seat going forward. And that would free up somebody to help man some of the hybrid uh, meeting potential. So I can't promise that's where we're going to go, but we're looking into it. And so I think where we're at now is 
um, a fairly decent spot and uh, there are places to uh, entertain and, and manage a hybrid meeting. Um, and hopefully we can get a little bit better at it. And I think like many of you, I don't see us putting that away, that possibility away. So I guess I would ask, uh, let us keep making some steps in that regard, see if we can increase our capacities a bit for some of the hybrid format or at least some of the remote listening capabilities for in-person meeting. Um, and I think we're taking steps in that direction and we're hopeful. There's also questions um, from several of you and several of the advisory bodies about um, when advisory bodies will be in person, when they will be remote. And I can't tell you how much Kelly and I have thrashed about on that question. And um, it's a difficult one. I think where we're at is that we are converging with to some general guidance um, for, you know, in general, what sort of what advisory bodies would tend to be in person more than others. Uh, so one example, looking forward, I do not see the gap being in a remote meeting format in the future. I just think there's too much ground fish. I think the idea of having a remote gap meeting, uh, it's just, it's hard for me to imagine that again. Other groups, and in particular the SSC, uh, has specifically asked to be remote at several occasions. So if you look at those bookends and uh, think about the various advisory bodies, I think what we could put together is some general guidance for, per our advisory bodies. How many meetings a year do we see them being remote? How many meetings a year do we see them being in person? The actual meetings then is something that we would happily consult with those advisory body chairs to uh, specify. That of course, as uh, several of you noted, relates to budget. Um, and so we aren't prepared here to talk about that. Uh, there's been a lot of, a lot of stuff on our plate here uh, over the last fall and spring. But what I've been, what I've been picturing is as we go forward with this uh, more strategic planning session and folding this into our budget planning, uh, I'm picturing a financial spreadsheet that says out of all the advisory bodies being remote and in person, what's the basic annual cost of that. And if we scale some up, scale some down, how does that affect our budget? And that's something that I think is in our future. We're just not prepared to do that at the moment, but it will get to some of the points that a couple of you have raised. So where that leaves us is, uh, I guess there's a mix of suggestions I have for where we're at and where I see us headed and our Kelly and my intention and in moving forward with this. Um, happily take more of your input, if there are things that you would specifically like to see or direction that you would like us to take. Um, but I offer those observations and thoughts and forecasts for what they're worth. So. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. I don't see any other hands. Does that mean we're done with this agenda item? If there are no more comments, um, I think I would maybe offer up a couple of additional remarks about what you would expect in June, just in case there are some additional thoughts about the June item. Um, so what I view June as being is a planning session. And so there are uh, two major parts to the paper that I'm picturing. One is uh, the scope of the discussion. Um, and that scope, uh, I'm envisioning, you know, a series of alternatives, for lack of a better word, going from the low hanging fruit up to more uh, systematic and programmatic views of how we do business and what that might mean for our costs. And then a uh, timeline in terms of how we take this up uh, and a timeline that then gets us to the next five year grant period. Um, so that's what I picture coming back in June with. And then, of course, hearing uh, the reactions from the advisory bodies and allowing you all to read that and consider it ahead of time. Um, so we'd offer that up for your consideration and for the council broadly and all the advisory bodies consideration. Um, if that sounds good to you all, I don't know that I need more guidance, but I do want to be clear that that's what I have in mind. So. Okay. I guess I'm seeing head, head nods around the table. So, all right, let's go with that. And uh, at least we finished this one within the time allotted. So it's perfect. <laughs> So with that, I will hand the gavel back to our chair, and uh, thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, 
Vice Chair Penn, Chair Council, great work on the last two agenda items. Um, Salmon is not ready, it will not be ready until mid afternoon. So we're gonna come back at one o'clock for lunch, uh, from lunch, and we'll get started on ground fish. And um, I'm gonna hand the gavel off right now to Vice Chair Hassamer so he can get started right at one o'clock. So have a good lunch. Lunch break. The recording has stopped.
Test one. Test one, check one.
This meeting is being recorded. One minute warning, please move towards your seats. All right, let's go ahead and get started this afternoon. We are on agenda item G1 NIMS report, and I will turn the microphone to Todd, who is, I believe, on the phone with us. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good afternoon, Council. I hope you all had a good lunch. Um, so for the first item this afternoon, we have agenda item G1, which is the National Marine Fisheries Service Report for ground fish. So the West Coast region is here, and they are here to provide updates to the Council regarding rulemakings and notices posted in the Federal Register, as well as updating the Council on current workload and future rulemakings. Uh, the Council is expected to inform the, excuse me, National Marine Fisheries Service, the region is here to inform the Council on the proposed rule uh, for the listing of sunflower sea star as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Um, additionally, the Northwest Fisheries Science Center is here to discuss uh, ground fish related science and research activities with the Council. Additionally, as you'll note here in your reference materials, which I'll cover in a second, there are two files for you to consider. These are updated versions of the Pacific Halibut Bycatch Report from for 2002 to 2021, and there uh, this information provides updates as well as some corrections to the versions presented to the Council in September of last year. Looking at your reference materials, you have several reports. You have uh, two reports from the region, which is uh, the, the proposed rule to list sunflower sea stars threatened. You also have a recently published ground for this rulemakings and workload. And from the Science Center, you have the two Pacific halibut bycatch reports that I mentioned as well as a presentation that will be given by Craig Russell. Additionally, and finally, you do have a gap report. And with that, your action, like usual, is to provide discussion and guidance. And that, Mr. Vice Chair, concludes my overview. I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Todd. Any questions for Todd on the situation overview? And there are no questions, Todd. So before I turn the floor over to NIMS, I just do want to note Caroline McKnight has joined us at the table here and Corey Niles. And uh, I think those are the two changes in, in addition to uh, Todd Phillips joining us. So I will turn it over to the, the NIMS uh, reports and Mr. Ryan Wolf. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I actually have a very, just a brief report to give. Um, and then I'll be turning it over to um, my colleague to provide a presentation um, on the C-STAR Supplemental Report 1. And then as noted in the uh, SITSUM you know, that we just heard, then uh, Craig Russell will give the Science Center presentation. Regarding our uh, NIMPS Supplemental Report 2, this is just our typical rulemaking and workload report. Looks should look very familiar to you all. It's very brief. Uh, and there's very little new information since the March meeting. Uh, happy to answer any questions, uh, but I wasn't planning to speak to it as it's uh, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I do want to just take a moment to put in a plug uh, for the upcoming Groundfish Endangered Species Workgroup meeting, uh, particularly to boost industry awareness. Uh, the Groundfish Endangered Species Workgroup will be meeting April 12th and 13th, so relatively soon. Uh, it will be a hybrid meeting with options of joining via WebEx or in person at the NIMS West Coast Region office in Seattle. Uh, we welcome industry and public attendance. Uh, you can contact Brian Hooper for my staff if you have any questions. Um, but I would note uh, the way our uh, regional office works in Seattle, if you are planning to attend in person, just please email Brian Hooper. Uh, so that we can add you to the guest list uh, for security reasons so you can get past the guard and get into the building. And that concludes my report. So maybe I'll see if there's any questions on that before I introduce the next uh, presenter. Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Ryan, for the report. I just have a question on the, the first page of your uh, NIMS report too. It says the 2023 Pacific Whiting Harvest Specs proposed rule expected April, but final rule not till May, June, and it's effective upon publication. I'm curious, uh, I know in the past we've had a very minimal uh, amount before the final rule to harvest, but now that we have a May 1st opener and a, a large presence of the fleet probably going to be participating, are we going to be impacted by this delay in the final rule or, or not? Well, to the vice chair, thank you, Mr. Dooley, for the question. No, no impact. We'll issue interim allocations for the fishery to start May 1st. So we shouldn't have any impact. And follow up. Follow -up. Yeah, thank you. And it will be enough to keep us going until the, until the final rule is published. I know in the past we've had that problem where we had to get an exemption to make it work, but uh, just that's just checking. Yeah, to the vice chair. Yes. Okay. Will. Perfect. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Further questions on the first part. Lynn Mattis. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Wolf. I gave you a heads up. I was going to ask this. Uh, the proposed C star rule is placed under NIMS Brownfish report just as a convenient place to put it. Uh, we shouldn't, public and industry shouldn't imply that that means it only could possibly apply to ground fish. It could be to other fisheries as well. This was just a good place to get it, the discussion going. Is that a good assumption? Yeah, thank you. I was about to further question. Um, yes, that's correct. And you'll hear more in the presentation next of, of uh, a little bit about the proposed listing and the potential relevance to ground fish. I'm happy to answer any questions. But of course, as with any new potentially listed species, we would be looking at all FMPs, um, not just here, but throughout the range of the species. So that um, also includes some of our other regional offices. Thank you. Right. Further questions? I don't see any. So Ryan, please continue. Thank you, Chair. And um, but I, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Lowry. He'll be providing a short presentation for Supplemental NIMS Report 1. I believe Sandra and Chris have his presentation and he is online. Just All right, checking. I'm just double checking. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We're just waiting for the presentation to come up. Yep. And I'm doing that now. So you should be able to see my title slide here now, correct? Yes, we can. Please proceed when you're ready. Okay. 
Excellent. Well, members of the council, thank you for taking the time to hear the uh, brief presentation that I've got for you today. Um, first, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'm going to go through a little biological background, and then I'm going to step into specifically what the proposed rule is and what the implications of the proposed rule are, um, should the listing become final. So first off, the Sunflower Sea Star um, has a broad range. As Ryan just said, it's not just the Pacific Council that we're concerned with here, but it's got a range from Unalaska Island in Alaska all the way down to central Baja, Mexico on the Pacific Coast. Uh, but it does have an abundant center off of northern British Columbia and southeast Alaska. The species status is uncontested, so there's not a debate over whether this is a standalone or independent species. And in fact, it's the only species in its genus. So there are no other species with which it's relatively easily confused. Uh, human consumption is do not documented. Um, and this is going back as far as we could in any and all histories that were available to us when we did the status review. But in 2020, the IUCN listed the species as critically endangered. And the primary reason for that was what's called sea star wasting syndrome. This is a disease where the uh, star essentially gets infected, the arm tips curl up, it gets white lesions on its surface, and fairly quickly, within just a matter of days in most cases, it degrades into a pile of just goo. It's sticky connective tissue and silica spicules that make up the organism. So there was a pandemic. Um, the losses were, um, were estimated to reach 90% across the range of the entirety of the species. And this pandemic ran from about 2013 to 17. After that, populations declined in many areas to the point that they, it was no longer considered a pandemic because rapid loss of the population was not occurring. But we're still seeing outbreaks of the disease. And we know that there are stress triggers that cause the disease uh, or that cause these uh, outbreaks of the disease. And some of those are associated with climate change, like warming water, uh, lowering pH, uh, low dissolved oxygen, other factors. So as I said, the pandemic was a hard hit for the species. Uh, the best population estimates that we've got suggest that it was a greater than 90% loss across the whole of the range, but from Cape Flattery southward, so the lower portion of the range, it was as much as 98 or even more percent. So a petition was received by National Marine Fisheries Service in August of 2021 to list this species. So we pulled together a status review team, and all I'd like you to see here is kind of just some color coding, uh, just demonstrating that we truly did try to pull together um, specialists from throughout the range in stock assessment, marine ecology, where possible sea star ecology. We also had several people come in and brief the status review team. So as NIMS always does, we tried to get the best available science and commercial and uh, any and all other information, including tribal information that was available to us. So we had people from the region, people from both the Northwest and Alaska Fishery Science Centers, external staff, and people distributed up and down the West Coast. Jumping straight to our conclusions, after pulling together all of our uh, all available information and doing an analysis of population status of the species, we determined that uh, sea star wasting syndrome and climate change are the two major threats affecting the abundance, productivity, and distribution of the species and that there were no significant portions of the range where that risk was elevated, which might have elevated the proposed uh, level to uh, endangered as opposed to threatened. So as such, we um, found that the risk was moderate for the species throughout the whole of its range, which led us to the final determination after also evaluating any conservation efforts that were ongoing for the species at the state or local level to uh, recommend threatened. And a Federal Register notice was published on this. The initial pre-release was March 15th, but it was formally published in the Register on March 16th of this year. For critical habitat, uh, this species is broadly a generalist. It occurs over mud, uh, sand, rock. It occurs in kelp beds. It occurs in a lot of different areas. And quite frankly, a lot of the information that we had for the species was biased to shallower waters because it was largely from scuba-based surveys. But uh, um, compiling all of the information and looking at essentially every view of the distribution of the species against the habitats that occurred on, it is a generalist, a true generalist, and also consumes a broad variety of prey. So we were unable to identify any specific critical habitat that was really fundamental to the long-term sustainability of the species. So we're not recommending the designation of critical habitat at this time. 
Because this is a threatened listing, there are no take prohibitions that immediately go into effect as it would with an endangered species. There will still be Section 7 consultations, and I'll get to that in just a minute, but for fisheries and dredging and any other activities that might interact with either the habitat or the species, um, there's still Section 7 um, consultations, so it's not completely lacking protection. Um, but there will be no additional rules that we're proposing putting into place, again, recognizing that essentially the disease and climate change factors associated with the disease, the disease are really the big, um, the big threats here. Um, and that by doing anything to regulate fisheries or other activities, we would be adding significant process burden, but not likely um, considerably affecting the conservation of the species. So we do have a public review period that's currently open. Um, it closes on May 15th. And unless we get considerable new additional information there, we don't foresee uh, implementing 4D rules at this time or in the immediate future. Um, Independent of that, though, we have an effort uh, that's ongoing to try and recommend some uh, safe handling practices and get these distributed to um, fisheries observers and anybody engaging in fisheries that come into contact with the species. Um, so this is a kind of a separate activity, but again, non-regulatory. It's just uh, education and outreach, essentially. So what about fisheries impacts? Uh, well, as I said, any a uh, federal fishery or fishery with the federal nexus that uh, occurs between the Aleutian Islands and California uh, will need to have a consultation here. Um, this is, includes benthic trawling, any and all pot-based fisheries for fish and shellfish, um, as you previously pointed out. Um, and the known depth range of the species is to 450 meters deep. So essentially we're looking at all nearshore waters. Um, again, the evaluation there, though, is just whether the activity would risk jeopardy to the species um, after determining whether it would have an effect or not on the species. Uh, to address this, we've developed Section 7 action plans, which were submitted on the, uh, both the West Coast and the Alaska regions, uh, submitted with the proposed listing package. And essentially what this is is just a short list of the proposed action and any fisheries that might interact with the species. And essentially the goal here is to coordinate all of our consultations to make sure that there is no disruption to the fisheries and that we've evaluated this in plenty of time um, so that when the final rule would go to, into effect um, in March of next year, we would be well placed to continue on with fisheries and without any disruption. Uh, obviously the complexity of that consultation really uh, depends on the nature of the fishery. Uh, what we can document about impacts or what we can document about likely overlap between the fishery footprint and the known occurrence of the species. So the final point I'll make real quickly is that this is a long process. Uh, the dates associated with this process specifically for the sunflower sea star are shown at the right, uh, but you know we've been working on this for about a year and a half, uh, but the proposed rule is just out now. Uh, there's a 60-day public comment period and we're doing concurrent peer review at the same time of our status review. Um, so that'll conclude on May 15th, and then between that May 15th deadline and March 16th, which is when the final rule um, would go into effect if it goes into effect as either listed or potentially upgrades to endangered, um, we've got a, a gap there. And again, that's to allow for consultation and uh, uh, integration of public feedback and integration of any new data sets we receive or anything else like that. So with that, I'm happy to take comments. Um, I've also got my email and my counter email up here. Um, so if you'd like to reach out with any particular questions after today or if we don't get to them, I certainly appreciate talking to you and uh, exploring this further. Right, thank you. Are there questions for Mr. Lowry? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Pete. I appreciate it, Mr. Vice Chair. I. Um, I have a question, David, for you. Thank you for the presentation. I noticed in the informational report it, uh, that shows this as well as informational report two, it, it says that their range is out to 1,400 feet deep. Is that different than what you said to us? In, in uh, no, it, I apologize. Um, it's 1,400 feet or 450 meters. So there That's may have been a... a yeah, an error there in one of the documents, but. Oh, okay, gotcha, it's, I didn't, I thought that was fathoms, so, okay, I got oh. <laughs> And then you outlined a series of mitigation 
measures or concerns or you know things that we have to address do they change a lot if it does go to endangered should this continue down that path do we have a different uh perspective on this then or pretty much the same list of mitigation uh, measures i would call them so thank you yeah thank you for that question so um if if new information were to arise that would cause us to change our conclusion and finalize the rule as an endangered rather than threatened, then yes, there would be a whole series of additional uh, layers of uh, essentially concern that, and, and rules and regulations that would kick in. So to take prohibitions would occur. Um, we would need scientific collection permits for a lot of different things. Uh, fisheries permits would be much more complex. Um, at this point, though, I, I don't want it to seem as if we've already reached our final conclusion, but at this point, we think that we've got all the information that's out there. Um, there was a hefty lift that was done prior to our efforts in 2020 by the IUCN, and when we pulled together all of our data, we had over 30, um, 30 different agencies or entities that we were able to pull, dive, and troll, and bycatch data from. So we think we've essentially beat those bushes and we've got all the information that's out there. Uh, but yes, if it were if it were to get upgraded to endangered, it would um, call a, it would invoke a bunch of additional regulations and a bunch of additional uh, permitting requirements. Right. Thank you, Corey Niles. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thanks, Dr. Lowry. Good to hear your voice um, on that question um I, I have not had time to review all your analyses yet if iucn um came out with critically endangered um you're talking about you know the headlines seattle times etc 99 percent decline off like you know, south of uh, cape flattery why why did you all can you elaborate on how you why that, those, those are pretty serious declines is, is it are you, are you concluding threatened given that the the threats have of the disease have backed off a bit or um can you just e explain that a little a little bit more like what is you know what is the chance that um you just kind of spoke to it to your answer to bob but what is what is the chance that this does get uplisted to extinction when you i mean endangered when you when you before you go final with this rule sure uh yeah thank you corey i appreciate it good to hear your voice too um so i'll just say the criteria that are used by the iucn and by the esa assessments are different um and because of those differing criteria and the different grades and kind of scores and tiers that a species can be categorized as um, they reach critically endangered um, on their side, but we couldn't reach that threshold to get to endangered. Part of that is uncertainty about the population assessments. Um, again, much of the data that have been collected have been scuba based and they've been in very shallow water, but there's clear acknowledgement that this species goes to well beyond scuba depths. And um, we just simply didn't have enough information in those deeper waters in many cases. Uh, often that's because the bycatch data that's reported for sea stars is reported as a kind of a conglomerate or, you know, sea stars unidentified in a single category. So the ability to separate out Pycnopodia there just simply wasn't there. Um, so we acknowledging kind of that uncertainty and uncertainty about the um, pandemic status or losses still occurring due to the disease. Uh, we do still see outbreaks, but we also do see healthy populations, and in some areas, healthier populations um, than we see in other other spots. Um, I will say a, another kind of idiosyncrasy of the ESA here that uh, caused us to re reach threatened is that as an invertebrate species, we can't list a distinct population segment. So if it's an acknowledged species, we can't cut up or dice up the um, known range of the species into different distinct population segments. That's not allowed for invertebrates. And so in this case, having to list the whole of the species range, yes, there's been um, more significant losses in the southern portion, but we also had some pretty good demonstration of um, populations that are doing fairly well in the northern reaches. And so even with some of these 90% losses um, in the north, we're actually still seeing, uh, or we're starting to see some rebound, and we're seeing healthy individuals that are not showing signs of the disease in some of the surveyed areas. Thank you. Further questions for Mr. Lowry. Danny Evanson. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, as you just mentioned, Dr. Lowry, we're all in the same boat on this because uh, on the seaboard because this is an invertebrate and it's not possible to list discrete population segments. So even though the population is doing, the, the, the declines are less severe in Alaska, we're all in the same boat on this. Um, so my question to you is, how do you see this affecting federal fisheries since we have bycatch? I mean, the, this, this um, Pycnopodia are fairly ubiquitous and a huge range of habitats and anything that is bottom contact gear has potential to pick them up, particularly pot gear. Um, do you foresee changes to observer programs and uh, to reporting requirements? Yeah, thank you for that question. That actually um, very well leads into some measures that we've already been trying to implement. Um, as I mentioned, the, the data that we often have from bycatch is simply sea star unidentified or a couple of broader categories of sea star. Um, and so we've already started talking with the Protected Resources Division or with the um, Sustainable Fisheries Division about changing the um, the training and the reporting units that are being used to specifically call out Pycnopodia as its own standalone category. Um, and we're not only doing that in or trying to do that in commercial fisheries, but also doing that in recreational and nearshore fisheries as well. Um, and so the goal here is at this point um, to basically try to get better information and more comprehensive information for a broader geographic range, and then consider if any protective regulations are necessary down the road from there. So at this point, we weren't, weren't ready to go forward with any sort of recommendation on additional regulation without knowing more and having more solid footing to stand on there. Right, thank you. Further questions? And I don't see any hands here, Dr. Lowry, so thank you for that presentation. And I will turn back to Ryan Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think now I would yield the floor to Craig Russell to give the Science Center report. Craig, if you're there, uh, your presentation is up now, so you can start whenever you're ready. Thank you and good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair, Council and Council family. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Uh, for the record, my name is Craig Russell uh, with the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, Fishery Resource Analysis and Monitoring Division. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, today, I will provide a brief update on our ground fish related surveys and some related activities. Next slide, please. And this includes our 2023 surveys, a recent survey efficiency workshop, the planned integrated survey, and some good news on funding to support the council's FEP initiative four. And this is a G1B supplemental NWFSC presentation one in the briefing book. Uh, next slide, please. So in short, we are on track for planning and executing our FY23 ground fish surveys. I have no new updates since I last spoke to you in March. Uh, and that includes no new updates on the full four vessel West Coast ground fish bottom trawl survey, the Southern California rockfish hook and line survey, and the joint US Canada integrated ecosystem and Pacific Hakes survey. Uh, we will keep you posted, of course, if we encounter any challenges to successfully executing these surveys. And for those interested, there is additional background information on each of these surveys at the end of the supplemental presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so in March, I shared uh, that members of the Groundfish Survey team and the assessment team were collaborating with the Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey's captains, both past and present, in a workshop to try to improve our survey efficiency. And the goal was to identify cells currently included in the survey sampling frame that can't be sampled by the trawl gear that we use. And by removing these uh, untrawlable cells, we will be improving our survey efficiency by reducing the time searching for towable ground and cells. Uh, with untravel bottom, reducing that time transiting to those cells, and then decreasing the incidence of successful toes. Next slide, please. Uh, this workshop was held last month and was successful, and here are some of the outcomes shown. Um, 376 sites were determined to be untrawlable and were removed from the sampling plan. 
uh, and the participants refine the protocols and set a plan to revisit the process uh, on a regular basis every few years. Uh, and they'll be working to improve their understanding of uh, new and existing uh, cables and pipelines that may be causes for unsuccessful tows. And below are just some conditions used to identify uh, some of these cells uh, in the discussions. And again, I really want to thank the captains uh, who participated in the workshop um, and took the time to, to really try to improve these surveys. Next slide, please. Okay, previously I mentioned efforts of the Northwest and Southwest Fisheries Science Centers to integrate the Joint U.S.-Canada Ecosystem and Pacific Hake Survey and the Coastal Pelagic Surveys in partnership with Canada and Mexico with the goal of 2025. As I've said before, the integrated planning effort is envisioned to ensure that we provide key stock assessment deliverables for Pacific Hake and coastal pelagic species, management strategy evaluations, and ecosystem research and modeling, while also giving us an opportunity to explore ideas for innovations and improvements. We're still planning industry stakeholder events, and we'll aim to hold several hybrid sessions across the region. We're trying to finalize hosting a hybrid outreach event in Seattle on April 19th, an evening session at the June council meeting, and other possibilities, including formal discussions at Whiting Treaty meetings. Uh, anytime we are able to confirm uh, and finalize these details, we'll broadcast them widely, including through council channels. And again, hopefully we'll get something out here soon on the April 19th uh, event as well. And as always, uh, we welcome your suggestions for improved uh, engagement. Next slide, please. And I'll close with some good news on funding to support uh, council initiatives. Uh, recently, the Northwest Fisheries Science Center received funding from NIMS headquarters, uh, which will provide support for an existing contractor and new postdoc uh, salaries for scientific support of the Fishery Ecosystem Plan Initiative 4. Uh, this will help provide assistance with the development of risk tables, species selection framework, uh, and indicator identification uh, among others, um, and we expect the individuals will attend appropriate council meetings, provide assistance to the ecosystem working group, and collaborate with others on this. The current plan is to advertise a postdoc position this summer with the fall 2023 start date, depending on how quickly arrangements can be made and the availability of qualified candidates too. Next slide, please. And that concludes my update. I wanna thank Sandra for advancing the slides today, and thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and council members for your time be happy to try to answer any questions. All right, thank you for that presentation. Greg, any questions? Brett or Brad Pedninger. Yeah, um, the chair, uh, Vice Chair uh, Asmer. Um, Craig, um, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I had the honor of uh, attending that uh, trawl survey efficiencies workshop. And I'd just like to commend the, uh, the survey staff you have there, NIMS, which has been uh, very passionate and uh, dedicated individuals who really want to do a great job. And they're just outstanding individuals across the board. Um, I noticed we went over the entire coast as far as the, every segment, um, you know, all the blocks that are, are surveyed. And in California, I was, it's my understanding that you cannot sell uh, survey fish in California, even though Washington and Oregon, you can. And uh, as my understanding, my initial understanding prior to that workshop was that you were trawling in closed areas and then therefore the California didn't want it unloaded in the state. But from seeing the, from what I saw that the, you, you aren't towing in closed areas um, and um, there's something else, I mean, there's, there's an interpretation because you used to be able to sell fish. And I think that, you know, the budget situation we have going forward and I know in 2001, I believe there was a, 30,000 pound to a patrol for 15 minutes that had to be dumped at sea. And I'm kind of wondering if uh, there's been any action by the uh, Science Center to um, work with the Cal Fishing Game or um, the agencies down there so we could sell that fish because I know California has pretty strong wanton waste laws. And that seems like to me they're promoting wanton waste. And I think we ought to, is there anything, is anything happening there in that end? Because I know there's, there's some pretty big toes that get dumped at sea and they shouldn't be. Uh, through the vice chair, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Pettinger. Um, I'm going to have to look into that uh, and get back to you here. Uh, I'll reach out to our survey lead and, and see where that stands. Um, and appreciate you raising that issue. And thanks again to also for commending our staff uh, and, and their passion, their dedication, and also to you for attending and participating in that meeting. Thank you, Greg. Okay, thank you. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Greg, for the report. 
Appreciate it. I'm, I have a question on the Integrated West Coast Pelagic Survey. And you no noted a few of the meetings that were uh, places that were scheduled. I had the opportunity a couple, a few years ago to actually be on board the Shimada at the dock in Newport and, and view, you know, the, the, their procedures, their nets, all of those things during an MREP. And it would seem to me that from all I've heard so far and all the interaction I've had with many industry folks of, uh, of this integrated uh, survey, I think it would be valuable to have a session, if possible, on that vessel to actually get some input from uh, some actual fishery people that are involved in the fishery. And I think it would be very useful. So just making that suggestion. I know there's, I, I'm really pleased with the, the approach so far that I've seen that it's, you know, it's, it, it's redoing a whole system to get this new integrated survey under, under, underway. I think there's some valuable input that could be received from from industry, and uh, I know you've put, had a lot of that input, but I think there'd be better understanding if they actually could see it firsthand and actually put some input into it. So that's that's mine, and so thank you. Uh, through the, through the vice chair, thank you, Mr. Dooley. I really appreciate that recommendation, and and we're certainly. Uh, working on trying to develop those opportunities for uh, more detailed interactions like that. Okay, thank you. Further questions for Mr. Russell? Chair Gorelnik. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Vice Chair Asmer, and welcome, Craig. Um, going back to your list of surveys, um, I noticed there is, we're gonna be doing the hook and line survey and the bite. Uh, the need to expand that survey to other non-trawlable areas, holding stocks that are important to non-trawl fisheries. Uh, that's a point that's been made repeatedly by the council and others in other venues. Um, what progress, if any, has there been by the Science Center to implement further surveys? Th thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, for the question. Uh, at this point, I have no additional information. I'm going to sound like a broken, broken record from uh, March here. Uh, we are not resourced to move out on this uh, any further at this time. We are where we have time uh, and availability, uh, trying to look at that with the resources we have. Um, I think the workshop results that we were just talking about will help provide some information for us to consider in that. Um, but right now, our staff are, are solely uh, focused on trying to execute the surveys we are resourced for. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Craig, for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to go back to your slide where you were noting from the workshops, uh, one of the considerations for some of the areas was relative to um, closed areas. And I, I was wondering, relative to the hook and line survey and dovetailing here off of um, Mark's comments, um, you know, the council's taken recent action to allow uh, types of non-bottom contact gear inside the RC moving forward as a new package. So uh, I think there's some room to explore expanding that hook and line survey in new ways that maybe haven't been considered in the past. So I think we'd welcome that discussion, um, noting that, you know, budget constraints are always present um, regardless. But thank you for the presentation nonetheless. Uh, through the vice chair, thank you. Uh, Councilmember McKnight, yes, I appreciate that feedback and we'll definitely keep that in mind as we consider uh, options moving forward. Okay, further questions? Corey Niles. Uh, uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Craig. Just uh, not a question, but a comment. Really good news on the, um, so uh, thanks to you and all your staff and, and to folks at NIMS for making the, the funding available for uh, the FEP Initiative 4. Um, you all at the Science Center is really, really are what going to make this initiative work. So that was um, nice to hear and, and, and thank you for bringing that to our attention. Okay, looking around, one more pass here. And Craig, I don't see any more hands, so thanks again for that presentation, giving us that information today. 
And then I will turn back to Ryan to see if there's anything else. Thank you, Mr. Vice That concludes the NIMS report from us. Right, thank you. That will take us to the management and advisor, management team advisory body reports. We have a gap report. Merritt McCray is online. Merritt, are you there? I am here, Vice Chair Hassemer, and I am ready to uh, read into the record our report. Perfect. Go right ahead. All right. I'll be reading from agenda item G1C, supplemental gap report one. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report on the National Marine Fisheries Service Report. The, the GAP received presentations related to this agenda item and offers the following comments and suggestions. NIMP surveys. The GAP appreciates the update about the 2023 National Marine Fisheries Service Survey uh, development and is, is pleased that the survey planning for the West Coast Bottom Trawl Survey, uh, Southern California Hook and Line Survey, and the Pacific Hake Acoustic Survey are all on track as scheduled. Relative to the hook and line survey, the GAP continues to express interest in extending the survey range north of Point Conception in Southern California, and also into nearshore areas because it would provide sorely needed fishery independent data to improve stock assessments and fishery management. Relative to NIMS planning toward an integrated Hake Coastal Pelagic Species, or CPS survey, the GAP continues to call for an open and inclusive planning process for integrated survey development and suggests contingency planning include a potential delay in implementation of an integrated survey beyond 2025 to ensure data integrity is not compromised. non trawl rockfish conser conservation area action. The GAP wishes to thank the Council and all who participated in the years-long process developing the non trawl area management measures and your approval of the package this past March. We recognize the broad support this action has and appreciate the many, many positive public comments that have come in regarding it under B.1 non-agenda non items at this meeting. Renewed spatial access will redistribute fishing effort much more broadly, further supporting our fisheries conservation goals. Potential Endangered Species Act listing for the Sunflower Sea Star. The gap highlights our interest in the proposed ESA listing of the Sunflower Sea Star as threatened. As stated by NIMS, ground fish fisheries have few, if any, interactions with this species or their forage. While the GAP understands that fishery consultants consultations would be required, the GAP does not foresee a need to restrict access to those fisheries in order to further conservation efforts in support of sunflower sea star recovery. This is supported by the NIMS report, which states that NIMS intends to coordinate, quotes, consultations to ensure no disruption to fisheries, unquote. By that, the, quotes, but that the, quotes, complexity of the consultation will, will result on the nature of the fishery and ability to document or predict impacts, unquote. It's a kind of a difficult sentence. The gap would like to note that both Washington State University and Oregon State University have been working on studies related to the sunflower sea star. Additionally, the Nature Conservancy incorporated several of the university's works when it published its Roadmap to Recovery for the Sunflower Sea Star. The combination of all the studies and this roadmap demonstrate effective measures to recover the Sunflower Sea Star. <clears throat> Humpback Whale Fixed Gear Fishery Court Decision. The GAP is very interested in the recent court decision related to the ground fish, fish, fixed gear fisheries and humpback whales. The GAP recognizes that NIMS is still working to understand and respond to the court ruling. The GAP recommends continued close engagement with fishery participants as the process moves forward. Draft Compliance Guide for Open Access Fisheries. The GAP thanks National Marine Fisheries staff and in particular, Lynn Massey and Gretchen Hanshu for their work in creating an open access compliance guide and working with fishery representatives 
to make the new non-trawl electronic logbook as workable as possible. The compliance guide will be an essential component and is greatly appreciated by the GAP, especially as the open access ground fisher fishery may see new entrants due to problematic crab and salmon seasons. Thank you. Um, and with that, I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Merritt. Are there questions on the GAP report? And there are no questions, so again, thank you, Merritt. That completes our advisory body reports, takes us to public comment. Last time I checked, there were none, and that has been confirmed. So that completes all our reports and takes us into council decision. There's no action on this item, and I will look around to see if there are any further hands for discussion on this item or questions. Chair Gorelnik. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. I just wanted to just take this opportunity maybe to ask um, Mr. Wolf. I realized um, hook and line survey is not a product of sustainable fisheries, but um, th there have been a number of discussions with NIMS leadership about the need to expand that survey. Um, and it, it worries me that um, probably a year or more into these discussions, um, staff at the Science Center has not have not received uh, and I guess even even a hint of resources being provided to even study to you know how to expand these and um, we don't have Science Center management here so you're kind of <laughs> on the hook here so I want to know if, if you have any thoughts for the council on how we can make that a reality because there's a there's a huge chunk of the fishery that we manage that simply doesn't get surveyed. Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Chair Grelick, for the question. I'm afraid that's a challenging one for me to answer for reasons that you've outlined. I mean, um, I know that uh, councils raised that a couple times in various fora yourself as well. Um, I know that um, concerns and questions along those lines have been passed on to the leadership, but when it comes to speaking to um, resource allocations from headquarters to the region to the science centers, I don't have any updates on that at this point, um, but this council action is discussion and guidance as appropriate and anything that are taken here, I'm happy to pass back and see if I can get you more information at a future date. Thank you. All right, thank you. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure I don't even need to say this, but uh, I, I know the science centers are very much aware of, of the concern that the Whiting folks have over the integrated survey, the plans for uh, beginning that in 2025. I had a chance to have a good conversation with Dr. Werner here um, eight or 10 days ago about it. And I would just like to offer the same encouragement that Mr. Dooley did in terms of reaching out to the industry and trying to pull them in and have them a part of the uh, design of the net or nets, depending on how many we end up with. Um, I think that'd be really important for them to have some ownership in in uh, the redesign and the effort to integrate the, those two surveys. So, thanks. Further discussion? Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. A question for Ryan and Sheila. I know we had we had an opportunity for a um, brief discussion in our closed session. I don't think any of this information was not public. It sounds like you had folks communicating with the gap well but just I'm thinking on this on the on the the, the lawsuit the court decision that affecting the sable fish uh, you know fixed gear fisheries and next steps on that just to have a little in the discussion um, we know there's a meeting a status conference if I'm remembering correctly at um, huh? sometime this month and um, maybe that's the wrong term for it but that doesn't necessarily mean you'll have an answer at that time and it's anything you could share um, 
for anyone listening here about what what you that we still might be expecting a timeline that's extended Sorry, right I don't know. that meeting. Um, anyway, any any information you could you could provide would be appreciated on yeah what what expectations on timeline could be here. Yeah, to the, to the thank you, uh, Mr. Nice, for the question. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that level of detail at this point. Um, we are reviewing the order. We're determining next steps. You are correct. There is a status conference that is on April 20th, so um, a little over two weeks from now. We will know a little bit more uh, after that, but we're still uh, in the process um, uh, and of course, as things unfold and uh, once NIMS reviews it and um, takes position, we'll be happy to update the council at a future meeting. Right, thank you. Further discussion on this agenda item. And uh, I don't see any more hands. So Todd, I will turn to you and ask if we've completed our business here. Yes, th thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I would say that you've had a very good discussion. You have heard from both the region as well as the Science Center, and you've uh, had some back and forth um, regarding the surveys and other such information. So uh, looking across the agenda and your action here, I believe that you have adequately covered it. And uh, I would recommend that you go ahead and move forward. Thank you. All right, thank you, Todd. With that, that completes G1. We are going to move to E3, our salmon check-in. But before we do that, we need to take a five-minute break to because there are a lot of chairs that need to be changed in the audience here. So let's be back here at 1.55.
All right, thank you everyone. We're back in our chairs and I believe ready to start on E3. So I will turn it to Robin Elke for an introduction. Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Again, agenda item E3. Uh, we have the STT here to give you their summary of the analysis that they ran on the uh, season structures uh, recommended by the SAS yesterday. So I believe uh, Michael Farrell is here to give you that report. All right, I'll look for Dr. O'Farrell. My eyes are failing me. There he is. Good afternoon, Dr. O'Farrell. Hard to miss. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, Council Members. <clears throat> I'll be referring to Agenda Item E3A, Supplemental STT Report 1. Um, the team took into account uh, guidance provided yesterday from the SAS and the Council. Um, you know, all of the management measures uh, are collated in, from pages 2 to 15 and the beginning of our analysis um, table five is on page 16 and starting on that um, <clears throat> um, as I mentioned yesterday uh, there's a number of um, Puget Sound stocks that are still not meeting uh, management objectives uh, though that's um, I know that work is going on with that and this is not an unusual at this stage uh, moving on to page 17, uh, the Thule Chinook uh, exploitation rate is 39.1% um, at this point, um, above the 38% um, maximum for this year. Going further, um, moving down to page 19, Coho stocks. Um, Skagit Coho is has an exploitation rate exceeding 35%. And then a couple things to note um, further down on this page, uh, LCN Coho, the, um, the metric being uh, reported here is total marine and uh, mainstem Columbia River fishery exploitation rate. So that's where, I believe that's the first time that we're showing it in that, in that form. And also for um, Song Coho, um, we have previously just been um, presenting uh, ocean exploitation rates. Now it's total exploitation rates um, uh, presented here. Moving on to table seven, um, this shows the breakdown of uh, exploitation rate impacts on LCN Coho, OCN Coho, and Lower Columbia River, Thule Chinook. Second page of table seven on page 22 um, shows the same breakdown for uh, different parts of the Song Coho um, ESU. And the end of our packet has um, impact uh, tables, uh, appendix tables on impacts for Sacramento River Winter Chinook, Sacramento River Fall Chinook, and Klamath River Fall Chinook. And I think that that does it for my summary of the of our report. Um, I can try to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Dr. O'Farrell on the STT report? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, uh, Dr. O'Farrell. Um, you pointed out uh, on table five, page 19, the uh, Sant Coho projected uh, exploitation rates um, for the Trinity and Klamath and Rogue and other uh, compared to the exploitation rate ceiling. Um, I'm just wondering if you can characterize that 15% uh, for Trinity Natural as projected and the 23 criteria, of course, is less than 16% or equal to 16%. Um, thinking about the proposed fishery structures for California, um, we have no Chinook fishing scheduled, um, to the North Oregon has coho fisheries scheduled, but, um, nothing in the way of Chinook fisheries scheduled. And 
their alternatives um, pre-September. So maybe you can explain a little bit about why this um, projection of 15% is so high. Is it because the only targeted fisheries in the area are coho fisheries and that that number might go down if we had Chinook fisheries scheduled concurrently? Maybe you can just help us understand why the number is so high. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think probably the, the best way to explain this or to gain a little more information about it would be to look at Table 7 on page 22. Um, this has, uh, the, the, there's four columns there. Um, there's Trinity Natural, Klamath Natural, Rogue Natural, and Other Sonk. And, um, and it breaks down the total exploitation rate that you've mentioned previously into its component parts along the coast. And um, ultimately, you know, there is a, for, for example, for Trinity Natural, the total exploitation rate is 15% and 13, and, and then the estuary freshwater component is 13.2%. That's right above the total there. And then the rest of it is um, in the ocean. And you can see the distribution all the way from British Columbia through, um, well, I guess the most Southern place where there's ocean impacts, it would be the region from Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain. Does that answer your question, Marcy? Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Dr. O'Farrell. Um, yes, in part, I guess, um, probably should have started with referencing table seven, but um, the, I guess I'm, I'm just wondering, I think this is the first time we've really looked at these breakouts um, in a table like this, looking at um, the recreational fisheries as an example, I guess, are these, are the impacts 0.7%? Um, is it your understanding or is it possible that those numbers are somewhat higher because there are not Chinook fisheries scheduled? Or would it matter? It's a good question. Um, and I, I guess I'm, I'm going to answer it. Uh, I'll, I'll try a, a general answer. I might, I might need to, look into this and talk to some other people to make me come back with a more complete answer. But for, uh, we do, when there are coho fisheries in, in Oregon, we do assume a higher amount of fishing effort than in ocean fisheries than um, when it's just Chinook only. And so perhaps that has something to do with it, but I think I would need to consult some other folks on the SDT on the, on the breakdown of uh, on the ocean side. Th okay. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Dr. O'Farrell. Appreciate that. Further questions for Dr. O'Farrell on the SDT report? And there are none, so thank you. Uh, we have no other reports on this agenda item. I'll confirm that there is no public comment. I don't see any signed up. And there is no public comment. So that just takes us to provide any needed further guidance to assist the STT in analysis and I'm going to look so I make sure I cover everything from my left to right. I will first uh, look to California. Marcy, if there's any further guidance. Not at this time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll then look to John North. Oregon, any further guidance? Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, none today. Thanks. Thank you. Kyle Addix, Washington. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do have some guidance for the STT. And this is um, speaking relative to agenda item E3A, Supplemental STT Report 1, dated April 3rd, 2023. Implement the following changes. 
at the top of table one, adjust the overall non-Indian Chinook TAC to 80,000 and adjust all corresponding allocations, guidelines, and caps accordingly. <coughs> um, also, if I could, I'd like to make a request of the council if we could keep this agenda item item open and potentially revisit it tomorrow we'll have may have additional ocean guidance may have additional inside fisheries that need to be matched up and modeled um, as the stt does their work and we move towards the end of the week all right thank you uh, i'm just going to look towards doc to dr o'farrell and make sure that guidance is clear and understood getting a head nod that we're good to go with that and then i'll Turn to Joe Oatman, any tribal guidance? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, no further guidance for the Treaty Troll option. All right, thank you. So with that, let me check with Robin first and make sure that uh, we've done everything we need. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, under this agenda item, we have further guidance for the STT and it's my understanding we'll leave the agenda item open in case we uh, need to uh, come back tomorrow with any additional adjustments. Yes, thank you. So I think that concludes everything we need to do then. We will not close this agenda item. It will remain open tomorrow for one last possible check-in. So, thank you. And with that, I will pass the gavel back to our chair. All right, thank you very much, Vice Chair. Asmer, let's take a moment. We're going to be switching uh, back to ground fish here. So I um, have a number of folks here. We're losing our throng of salmon fans from the audience. And we've got staff officer changes and some other seat changes, perhaps. Uh, w whenever you're ready, Dr. Seeger, if you need a few more moments, that's fine too. But if you're ready, you can get started. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're here this afternoon to uh, on agenda item G2 to talk about the trawl cost recovery report. Uh, each year, uh, the council receives a report from NIMS on cost recovery for the trawl catch share program. Uh, the report covers costs uh, and fee collections from the previous year, along with the fee rates for the current year. Uh, and this agenda item provides the council an opportunity to review that report uh, and the cost recovery levels established by NIMS. Additionally, at this meeting, uh, NIMS also is providing a report that addresses questions raised by the council and GAP about accounting for cost savings uh, resulting <coughs> uh, from the program and efficiencies in cost recovery fees uh, and taking those into account in determining the, co the cost recovery fees. Uh, your action here is just to provide comments on the reports you'll be uh, reviewing this afternoon. And uh, with that, I think the next thing you have up is the, um, the National Marine Fisheries Service reports. All right, thank you for the brief overview. I don't imagine any questions, but I'll look around to see if there are. And not seeing any hands, we'll go to Ryan Wolf. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Chris Beagle to prevent, present NIMPS Report 1, the annual trawl rationalization program cost recovery report, and then I'll present the second NIMPS report once that's concluded. And I believe Chris is online and ready. All right. Welcome, Chris. Hello. Can folks hear me? Loud and clear. Great. Uh, as um, said, my name's Chris Beagle. I'm the cost recovery coordinator for the West Coast region, and I'm going to give an overview of our annual cost recovery report. It covers the fee calculation for 2023, as well as the um, cost recovery 2022 payments that have come in. Um, next slide, please. Okay. 
so our fee percentage calculation is based the fee percentage is based upon the direct program costs or DPCs um, divided by the fishery value and that those numbers are capped at 3%. For 2023, shore-based IFQ program uh, was capped at 3%. The catcher processor program is at 0.1% and the mothership program at 1.7. These are very similar to the 2022 fees, fee percentages. Um, however, the catcher processor program went from 0.2 to 0.1%. Um, and I want to note that um, for the 2023 fees, we use the 2021 fishery value as that's the most recent complete set of data we had and the 2022 DPCs. Uh, next slide, please. Here is a breakdown of the 2022 DPCs um, by broken out by the West Coast Regional Office and its um, subsets, Science Center and Office of Law Enforcement. Um, it also includes travel costs and printing costs. Um, a more detailed version of this table uh, is in the report, and you can look at that for uh, to really dig down more deeply into these numbers. Um, for 2022, uh, we included travel costs, and you can see here those are broken down by IFQ catch processor and mothership. And that's based upon the, um, based upon what agenda items were um, being covered and only those that are appropriate were charged to the each of the sectors. The next slide, please. These are the, um, the two main changes for 2022. Uh, direct program costs, as I mentioned, included travel costs that are incremental to the trial rationalization program. Um, specifically, uh, it was a total of uh, $2,319. Uh, you can see it broken out by the sectors. And then <clears throat> you'll see that the catch monitoring program uh, had about a 20% increase from 21 to 22. And that was directly related to staffing changes in the catch monitoring program, it, in which there at times were more than the normal amount of people working on it due to training and getting new staff up to speed. Uh, next slide, please. These are the tasks, the new or ad hoc tasks for the Groundfish Branch, uh, whiting allocation utilization action uh, for Mothership Catch Processor, electronic monitoring rulemakings for IFQ and Mothership, and trial rationalization program review support and planning for all three. Uh, the program review itself was a fairly minor cost, but it was uh, uh, new and we wanted to make sure to have that in there. Next slide, please. These are the newer tasks for the permit monitoring branch. Um, again, electronic monitoring, implementation, responding to data requests and providing information to develop uh, several actions, including gear switching and waiting allocation utilization, as well as the development of online permit applications for first receiver site licenses and new quota share permits and vessel accounts. This is the um, list for the scientific data management branch. I get, once again, implementation of council actions, uh, developing use cases, uh, testing, deployment of database modifications, 
as well as responding to data requests and providing information uh, for development analysis of several actions, including gear switching, wedding allocation utilization. Uh, they are also involved in development of online permit applications for first receiver site licenses and development of the quota share owner survey. Next slide, please. This is the economics and social science research branch. Uh, they were uh, supporting development of analysis uh, for the whiting utilization action, the publication of quota share owner survey tech memos, and quota share ownership analysis in support of Sablefish gear switching actions. Next slide, please. Uh, this is for the Office of Law Enforcement. Uh, they participated in designated programming updates for the online IFQ system. They evaluated uh, enforcement implications in regards to actions. Now, the Office of Law Enforcement uh, has, in the past, their costs have gone up and down fairly significantly. For example, this past uh, year from 2022 to 2023, uh, I'm sorry, from 2021 to 2022, it went up by um, around 98%. And that's purely related to the types of actions they're undertaking. And it can go up and down by that much uh, year to year. These are the fishery values uh, that we used um, to come up with the 2023 fee percentage. As you can see, we used the 2021 landings. So those were our most recent complete data set. Um, for the IFQ program, we used the actual price in PACFIN. And then uh, for catcher processor and mothership, we use the uh, reported price for mother from the mothership annual reports, which this year was an average of 10 cents a pound. And we use that uh, for the catcher processor uh, program as well. Um, from the previous year, the IFQ value went up and mothership and catcher processors stayed basically the same. You can look at tables two and three in the report for the full breakdown uh, of these values. So this is our breakdown uh, for the 2023 fee calculation, where you can see the DPCs, the excessive values, and then the fee percentages you can see here that for the IFQ program, it was 3.5%, which is then capped at three. And then the catch processor was 0.1 and the mothership was uh, 1.7. And then <clears throat> I don't have a slide for it here, but in the report, you will see uh, what was collected in 2022 uh, through the cost recovery fee program. And then I will uh, uh, ask for any questions that you might have. All right, any questions? Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I thank you for the presentation, uh, Chris. Um, just, just to make sure I'm following on the, on the previous slide, the catcher processor in the second last row is 0.1, but then it goes up to 0.2 in the last row. Um, yes, that, that was a, um, a transpositional error. It should, it should be uh, 0.1 in the last uh, column there. Okay. Further questions on the presentation? Bill Anderson. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I didn't get the slide number, but I can, my question was around, um, the catch monitoring program. 
oops, um, had an approximately 20% increase from 21 to 22. And then it says it was, the increase was related to staffing changes within the catch monitor program. And I'm just um, trying to figure out why a change in staff would increase the cost unless you were double filling a position because the person that was in there was either unable to work or you were trying to train a new person coming in before the other person left or something else. Yes, thank you. Um, the yeah the the increase was because there would be more than one person working on the same uh, project uh, as the new person was being trained up um, on the process. Okay, thank you. All right, further questions on the presentation? Not seeing any other hands. Thank you very much. I'll go back to Ryan at this point. Thank you, Chair. One second. Okay. So I'm going to present um, NIMS Report 2 on cost recovery, savings, and efficiencies. In response to interest the Council and the GAP have expressed uh, in the issue of cost savings resulting from perceived efficiencies, of the trawl rationalization program, NIMS went through an exercise of comparing tasks necessary with and without the trawl rationalization program. Uh, this report presents that comparison, uh, and I'm going to summarize. Uh, in the background section, we highlight the trawl program has yielded significant benefits that extend beyond just program participants. However, it has led to a lot of increased tasks for NIMS without eliminating or reducing many. And overall, NIMS costs with rationalization are significantly higher than they would be without it. I would note that many of our costs related to the ground fish trawl fishery are not incremental uh, because they would be necessary without rationalization. Um, for example, the trawl survey, stock assessments, harvest specifications, NIMS GMT time, ESA obligations, and our Office of Law Enforcement VMS monitoring. Uh, and the next section compares the tasks necessary with and without the rationalization program. Uh, and please do keep in mind, as you've heard us at previous um, cost recovery agenda items, note that this comparison is with and without and not before and after. Uh, and for this exercise, uh, we assumed that a contemporary fishery without rationalization would be managed with trip, trip limits and a coastwide RCA. We did explore whether and how to attempt a quantitative cost comparison, but concluded it would be effort intensive and an incremental cost on top, uh, and also uncertain, really due to the need to make numerous assumptions about what a non-rationalized contemporary fishery would look like. Uh, so therefore, we wanted to conduct a qualitative comparison of the tasks grouped by key function which we believe provides a sufficiently comprehensive comparison to identify whether savings are occurring. Uh, and we walked through that in the breakdown here. You can see the description of tasks that follows. Um, it's not intended to be exhaustive, but we have tried to include what we thought were all the key types of tasks. And uh, again, you've had this since the advanced briefing book, so I won't read these all point by point. Um, I just do want to note that the appendix uh, in the document is a summary of this same with without comparison in a table format, and, and that's modeled on Appendix D of the 2011 Trawl Rationalization Cost Recovery Committee report that the gap in this uh, council has referenced before. So that's just another depiction of the same um, analysis. So in conclusion, um, we see that the with and without comparison illustrates that NIMS has seen very little actual savings uh, and no net savings, uh, instead uh, a large net cost increase with the program. Uh, so we feel the method we've been using to identify incremental costs and to calculate cost recovery uh, is consistent with the MSA, uh, the trawl program regulations, the NIMS catch share policy. So uh, we plan to continue using this method. Um, but I wanna note that we recognize that while rationalization has brought a lot of benefits, uh, it seems lower costs have not been among them. And, and the overall 
program costs of the trawl program are a significant underlying concern. Uh, that's the reason that NIMS supported the cost evaluation project that the council will hear about in its next agenda item. Uh, and just further underscore that NIMS rec recognizes and shares an interest in seeking cost savings within the program, even with higher net costs overall. And we do remain committed to continually seeking efficiency in all the tasks. And that concludes my report. All right, thank you very much. Questions for Ryan? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Ryan, for the report. <clears throat> it's uh, On one hand, it's a little disturbing that none of these created any savings, but and I think that's for another day to talk about those. I think we've got a, a catch air review coming up, and I think there's some issues we could address at that time. But the question I have is, I know there's a with and without comparison, and the data I see missing in the report is really the with or without quantification or estimate of what without it something would cost, particularly like observers, as you do specify 25% was, you know, was happening before the, before the program, so that isn't charged but it would really, it would be more transparent to understand total costs and have a column that shows the estimate of wit without, and then what the charge is to cost recovery with. So you can understand the difference and that that, and see it transparently. And I think that could be done pretty much on a majority of these items and bring a lot more transparency to the process. And I think that's what I've heard from industry over the years that they're not, they see the numbers, but they don't know how, how they compare to what we used to do. And I, I, I guess I would look at, you know, the new database that takes care of the quota accounting virtual uh, versus, you know, paper log books. And I remember particularly in Whiting, um, there was a, a person that was dedicated to tracking that throughout the season and pretty much weekends, it didn't matter that she was doing that. And uh, it, it, you know, it seemed to be a lot more intensive. And so a couple comments there. If what we're doing now is way more expensive, then why are we doing it? Maybe we should go back to what we were doing it before, if that's the better way to do it. So I think that's what we're looking at. But I, I do see some other innate things that we should really, not innate, that's not the right word, uh, some por portions of this that would be better addressed in our five-year review. And one of them is, you know, the economic data reports that the council mandated. They're not part of the annual reports, are not mandated by uh, Magnuson, so to speak. They're, they're that, that was a council uh, mandate and i don't know of any other lap programs that are doing annual cost data reports to this degree that we're doing them so um i think that's a for another day i i appreciate the report appreciate the analysis on this it it, it helps us and uh i think once again and you make the mention of it we need to we need to compare this to the holiday guidance and the other guidance that's in the that the council directed at the time of final decision and when was brought went forward and and has been acknowledged as both here and in past as being the guidelines so i think that's another day but i appreciate the report thank you ryan yeah thank you uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Dooley, for the comments. Um, uh, I appreciate that. Fully agree that there's a lot in this report that lead to potential future discussions, either under the next agenda and more the get chair review. Um, and I'll leave that to the council to do. But to answer your clarification question, in case I didn't um, explain as much, I mean, we struggled, and this is why you have a qualitative analysis, you know, because it's relatively easy for us to quantify our with costs, you know, our current costs. The without costs are a little bit more challenging for multiple reasons. We just don't have costs. It's been so long since we've been implemented the program. So many things are different. So it's just difficult and uncertain to do that. And it was, we just, 
thought a qualitative, at least at this point, uh, could at least highlight what we believe was going to be the same um, result, which is there are very few tasks that we're not doing um, and very little opportunity for savings on the NIMP side. Uh, but that's not to say that certain changes to the program would change that um, comparison, but at least that explains hopefully the clarification of why we don't have that quantitative data on without in this report. Further questions on the NIMS report? Corey. Yeah, yeah thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ryan. On, um, I'm just trying to, this, this does not change your conclusion. I don't, at, that um, the electronic fish tickets aren't incremental at all, but I'm just trying to understand a, um, a bit what you're saying here is um, the states have, we're doing the, the fish ticket processing um, before ETIX existed, in, including the paper entry. We're still doing that for a lot of fisheries. Um, and that's supported in large part by the PAC Fin grant that comes from you all. But if you've heard us say before, it's been flat funded for for probably, uh, you know, it's over, over 17 years I've lost count. So um, can you ex explain that one a little bit more about you know what what fish ticket work you all were doing um but I, again it doesn't change your um i don't see it changing your your conclusion at all that it is an incremental cost hey thank you mr Niles, for the program i think you kind of hit on it right i mean the e-tickets for the trawl fisheries incremental it's a quiet requirement of the program and while They've eliminated the need to manually enter data from the paper tickets. I mean, as you noted, that was primarily done by state staff and it was only part of our responsibility and therefore eliminating that didn't necessarily result in savings here <laughs> that we could highlight. So I think you kind of already touched on at least what we found in our qualitative analysis. Any further questions? Thank you very much, Ryan. We have one report. We have a gap report. Uh, Jeff Lackey, I understand, is online. Welcome, Jeff. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Chair and Council Members. I'll be reading from Agenda Item G2B, Supplemental Gap Report 1, Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report on Trawl Cost Recovery Annual Report. The gap received an update on cost recovery from Mr. Chris Beagle and Ms. Maggie Summer and offers the following comments. The GAP appreciates NIMS' effort to more fully explain program costs. The GAP notes progress in the continued reduction in 2022 of cost in the research and information technologies categories. Uh, see that in the table one below. Electronic monitoring video review costs are included in 2021 and 2022, so costs are elevated in that category. And then in the table, you can see the trends over the last five years in the categories. Uh, the GAP acknowledges the NIMS sentiment expressed in NIMS Report 2 that, quote, to attempt a precise quantitative with and without comparison would be time intensive and highly uncertain, end of quote. However, the GAP continues to view the original cost recovery methodology developed by Council as tasked in the Magnuson Stevenson Fishery Conservation and Management Act to not yet be implemented. Absent such an exercise, the industry does not benefit from the savings for a far more certain set of mortality data under catch shares and industry self-management that lessens burdens and uncertainty on fishery management all around. The gap doesn't anticipate a near-term action to remedy the issue of methodology. Therefore, the gap views the upcoming catch shares program review as the most practical vehicle to continue these explorations with the ultimate goal of ensuring, ensuring the catch shares program is managed efficiently, efforts to streamline the program elements, such as EDC program, are identified and implemented, and costs borne by the agency and fishery participants are minimized to the extent practicable. The program review could benefit from a holistic look at program requirements for monitoring and the incurred cost and examine if there are efficiencies to be gained while still achieving sufficient compliance in Ketchup County. Industry pays for 100% coverage on the water and 100% on the dock. Industry further pays for oversight of these monitoring functions in cost recovery. The three layers of monitoring cost are a significant burden. Going into Ketchup's program, 
participants were made aware that there would be an additional there would be additional cost. However, the intent in program design and expectation of participants was that program benefits would outweigh program costs. The feeling among much of the bottom trough lead is that has not been the case. And that concludes the report, and I'll be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. Are there questions of Jeff? Corey Niles. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jeff. I think I get your, your message here is clear about um, taking a close look at some of these as part of the, the review. But um, I'm just having, um, I'm, I'm tired this afternoon, but not on your on your second to last paragraph there about you saying if you're basically saying if the methodology was done differently, maybe getting towards what Bob was speaking to a bit ago, but that you expect there to be a larger cost savings and I'm just not understanding what you what you're you all at the gap are seeing those cost savings would could you just elaborate a little more to help me out yes thank you are you asking what those cost savings would be yes what, well it's difficult to say without the without the methodology being completed in the width and without comparison as, as this report two points out there would need to be assumptions but in general the industry believes that without the program, you would have lots of other problems that would take lots of time and money to deal with. And some of those would be the same issues you had as, as uh, uh, Mr. Dooley referenced in before the program. There was a lot more labor intensive um, uh, work. There was also a lot less certainty. And in the trial program, uh, there's a lot of self-enforcement in the individual accountability um, and, and in the monitoring. And so we, we can't say specifically other than to point to certain functions that were done beforehand, but we are, um, we're, we're way more accountable. We provide a way more accurate set of data, mortality data with much more accuracy that has much more built-in enforcement um, and, and fishery management to prevent overfishing than, than was prior or would be without. And so it seems sort of self-evident that we've got a system that's better and industry funded for that function. And so it would be, it would be difficult to, to try to get too quantitative and qualitative without such an exercise, but we feel like the exercise has, has never been done. And if you take the, if you take what we have under catch shares, you have a much more accurate data set that somehow takes more money for oversight than a less accurate data set did before. And that's just sort of counterintuitive. All right, any further questions on the GAP report? Thanks very much, Jeff. Thank you. Last I checked, there's no public comment. So I'm gonna gather there's still no public comment. So that will take us to our council discussion. We don't have an action here. Any comments on the report other than those that were implicit in questions <laughs> raised during the report? All right, I'm not, oh, Corey. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just to, to voice some thought, yeah, I just want to appreciate, uh, yeah, and thanks to uh, Jeff and the Gap for for Jeff for elaborating there. Um, I think, and, and I know this has been going on for a long time, and it's it's um, thanks to NIMS and to and to industry for continuing to talk through it. I think that as the Gap suggests, the place to really think about this is you know we're coming up on our next agenda item in, in the five year review, but yeah, I think I understand what NIMS is saying in terms of how they did the analysis i kind of see it very similarly in a similar way um and yeah it is, it's hard maybe to do perfectly but i don't um i don't know what the cost savings you know still still wanting to hear more but um yeah we have better data on what discards are but that's um mainly for the individual accountability you know our um for those who don't get to go to the, the chair's briefing. Our um, our executive director was su surprised to remember that we only have one in-season item now, instead of the multiple ones we used to have under under the troll. Um, 
uh, the triple net fishery, which okay, that that was one saving, but is it is it um, that would come out in 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 NIMS's analysis of what a triple net fishery would look like? So, yeah, thank you. I guess um, thank you for the the dialogue. It's been going back and forth, and I think the um, we'll be looking at these questions of costs um, and what can be done about them, and, you know, upcoming in the upcoming review. Thank you, Corey. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I just, I just think that you know, I get it that it might cost more to to do the to do the work than the, the value, but just simply in catch monitoring, for instance, it didn't cost zero before. There ought to be some rational way of figuring out how many people they had assigned to that task before that are you know with without the program. And what they are now, don't have to worry about dollars so much because it's hard to compare 13 years ago or 14, 15 years ago, what was going on. But we certainly know the, should be able to know the tasks and should be able to do some type of a comparison there to show that, okay, it cost X, you know, when we didn't have the program and now it cost X plus this and, and, and understand the trade-off. And that's really what the guidelines speak to. And I think that uh, we, we, I don't think, I think it's easy to say, well, we just did a cursory look at it and it would cost more to do it than not. But I think you got to do it because that's what the program says. I mean, we need to know uh, the offsets there. And I think that that's what industry has been clamoring for for a long time. There is another component, probably next agenda item, there are programmatic things that the council policy-wise put into this program that we need to analyze whether they are still relevant. I mean, I, I don't know that we need to know, uh, you know, we, we put in the yearly requirement for uh, the economic data report. Is that really as relevant now 13 years later on an annual basis or can we get that information by doing it? But that's a council decision that made that happen. It is in the NIMS decision. So anyhow, I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bob. All right, I'm not saying, oh, I am saying, <laughs> Vice Chair Pettinger. I'll lay it here. Um, you know, we really don't have a before and after cost. And I think it's getting those numbers are really, which is, which is not gonna happen. And so, because um, they're not available to us. And I think I'm, I'm ready to give up on that fight and I think that um, I think um, Ryan mentioned the the uh, you know this, the program review is really the best time to look into figure out where those cost savings could be. We really ought to put most of our effort into that. You know, this council uh, went down a path of uh, setting this program up based on some assumptions over eleven years ago, thirteen year four, thirteen years ago. And I think we ought to be very open to see what do we really need, what don't we need to make the same work in an efficient manner. And that I guess where we need to put our effort. And um, I, um, I appreciate Ryan seeing that as the um, as the, the vehicle to really make a difference in what in uh, on what this program costs. And I would also say, you know, we're underachieving big time as far as the OI attainment. And I think once this fishery attains does that, I think you see the cost percentage go down because we're actually achieving what we set out to do, to achieve. And so that'll make the real difference. So we actually have an efficient, profitable troll fishery. So anyway, thank you. All right, great. Anything further? All right, uh, let me turn back to Dr. Seeger and see how we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, the task here was just to, uh, after hearing these reports, to uh, provide comments. I think you've had a, a good discussion, and uh, I sort of identified the uh, the landscape that you're working in here, both uh, with respect to this agenda item, uh, with respect to the next agenda item on the cost project, and re with respect to the upcoming uh, catch or uh, review, all of which provide context and opportunity for continuing these discussions. All right, great. Well, that concludes this agenda item. We'll break until three o'clock, and then we'll come back for the last agenda item of the day, the closely related uh, G3.
Yeah. All right, if everyone could uh, find their way back to their seats, and we will get started with our last agenda item of the day, G3 tra uh, Trawl Cat Share Cost Project Update, Dr. Seeger. Oh, and welcoming to the table, our alum, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last year, National Marine Fisheries Service provided the council with uh, funds for contract work to look more closely at the catch share fishery costs that are borne by industry and NIMS. And uh, council staff then engaged Mr. Daryl Brandon, who's with us here at the uh, front table today, uh, to conduct the, that work. The cost project he was asked to work on uh, covers three broad objectives, documentation of industry concerns, and identifying costs related to specific program elements, comparison of those costs to similar catch share programs, and organization and presentation of the information to inform future deliberations. Mr. Chairman, uh, with that introduction, uh, I think we are ready to move to uh, Mr. Brandon's presentation. All right, uh, not seeing any clamoring to ask you any questions, so we'll move forward. I uh, welcome Daryl Brandon to the table. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. For the record, my name is Daryl Brandon, and I have a PowerPoint presentation that I'll walk you through. I'll, there, I've got probably too many slides. I'll try and go through it pretty quickly and, and just kind of hit the high points. Um, next slide, please. Um, as, as Dr. Seeger um, mentioned, one of the tasks of this is to look at different catch air programs and I provide some background and look at the cost of those programs where it's available. This slide shows the, the catch air programs that I considered in this. Of course, there's the West Coast program. There's the Northeast Sector program, which is not a LAP program. Um, the AFA Poly program, the British Columbia IVQ program, and the Central Gulf of Alaska Rockfish program. I selected those programs based on guidance from the council and its advisory groups as well as um, just those being some of the primary trawl catch or programs and that are, are um, relevant to the program that is in place here. Um, I, I've also um, collected some stakeholder input and recommendations that are included in the document. Uh, I summarize the available cost data and, and have a very detailed appendix and this is a kind of a check-in. Um, it's an initial review draft, but it's not a complete initial review draft. And so I've got a very detailed appendix. My plan is to provide a lot more summary information in the next version of the document that'll be brought up front in the primary body of the text for the, the comparisons. Next slide, please. Um, this is kind of the timeline that we've been working under. As you recall, in September of 2022, I gave an introductory um, presentation on the project. Um, we're at the point of first check-in for you to provide guidance on if I'm on track, off track, um, things that you'd like to see in the document that I haven't included so far. And we're scheduled for a final review in September of 2023 at your council meeting. Next slide, please. Um, Dr. Seeger went through these study goals, so I'm not going to belabor those. Next slide, please. Just briefly looking at some of the stakeholder input I've received, and there were some questions about how I went about contacting people, and I know you'll probably receive some um, feedback that 
Um, additional people will want to provide input um, after this meeting, and I intend to reach out and accept as much input as people want to provide. Uh, what I did for the first go around was I took the um, email addresses for all the people that had a, a limited entry permit uh, or a first receiver's license, and I emailed all the people on that list. I think I sent out about 120 different emails to people, and I've probably talked to about 20 different individuals, 20 plus individuals, to get the feedback that I've gotten so far. And as I said, I anticipate that there'll be additional people want to talk to me after after this check-in. Um, in general, people felt that the program has done very well at uh, achieving its goals of rebuilding stocks, reducing bycatch and discards, and accounting for all catch. People were also generally in agreement that the program has been less successful in creating new markets for products, increasing the harvest of available quota, and increasing net revenues in the fishery. And there was a, a list of specific concerns that people provided, and it's kind of a summary in this overview. But of course, one of the big ones was observer costs. And there's detail tables, as I said in the appendix, where it breaks out the costs of all the different sectors. Um, currently, based on discussions with individuals in the fishery, Observers cost about $550 a day, midnight to midnight in the non-whiting fishery, and about $600 per day in the whiting fishery, with almost everybody using EM currently. Um, there was a, um, individuals that expressed concern that all their catch counts against their quota pounds and must be retained by regulation. I know I've had some discussion with staff and members of the groundfish management team that that is not necessarily the case in all fisheries. There's sablefish and lingcod that have a, a kind of a credit for survival rates that I will update in the next version of the document. Next slide, please. Um, people that I talked to, the stakeholder input, indicated that there have not been the development of fresh markets and in some cases, the fresh markets may have declined. This was attributed to delivery patterns, as well as over, overall declines in demand for high-valued fish species domestically and worldwide. And the delivery patterns kind of went back to the, the old trip limit system that was in place before the catch here program, where people were required to deliver fish um, on a more regular basis to stay within their limits in the, in the, over the, in the two-month window delivery time periods. And that has been condensed more. And so... That was um, a concern why fresh markets have not been um, created as much as people may have hoped. Next slide, please. Stakeholders also indicated that the program has removed interest in trawling in some regions. And I, this specifically came out of the San Francisco Morro Bay, um, Monterey discussions I had with stakeholders. Um, there were uh, two or three trawlers that I talked to in that area that we're struggling to um, generate enough revenue and given the current cost to pay themselves and pay the crew to, to do some of the maintenance and things on vessels. They also indicated that because of the complications and dealing with regulations that there are captains that would just simply rather fish in the pink shrimp fishery or the whiting fishery because they don't have to deal with the bycatch regulations and other issues. They also asked that the council consider alternatives to allow higher quality products to be delivered. And there's a very specific recommendation that was provided and it has to do with the requirements of weighing fish and de-icing fish and re-icing fish and how that reduces product quality um, at, at when it's, once it's delivered to the processor. Uh, it, as I said, it's a, it was a very detailed and specific recommendation. I included it verbatim in the document um, based on the, the individual that provided it saying it was okay to do that. Next slide, please. Um, stakeholders also requested that the council consider more flexible quota limits. Um, there was a request that you remove strike tail rockfish from the shelf rockfish group. And the person that requested that acknowledged that that probably goes well beyond what we're tasked with doing here. But I wanted to give people the freedom just to 
provide their concerns and me not judging them or talking about the viability of them under this program, but just allow them to come to light and let people talk about them. There was a request that the council develop EM options for shore plants and continue the development of EM for the whiting fishery and in the non-whiting fisheries. There was also a request that the council streamline activities associated with recoverable costs to what is necessary. Um, next slide, please. I'm gonna briefly go through kind of a description of the, the various programs that I looked at, starting with the Northeast Sector Program. And as I said before, um, this program is, is not a LAP program uh, as defined in Section 303A of the Magnuson Act. It was implemented in 2010 and allocates 13 ground fish stocks. Um, sectors are allocated a limit for each of the Northeast species stocks. Um, estimated catch, both landings and discards, are deducted from the limit. Um, because the program is not a LAP, and it's not a LAP because when the Magnuson Act was authorized, reauthorized, reauthorized um, there was a specific provision put in there for the Northeast that they couldn't implement a LAP program without a, a, a super majority of the stakeholders in the industry voting to, for the, the LAP program. And so instead of going through that process, they just decided to go with kind of a, a quasi LAP, kind of the sector model, which in some ways operates as cooperatives. Um, so because it's not a LAP program, it's not subject to all the requirements that are in 303A, such as the cost recovery program. And so the sector program doesn't have a cost to recovery component like um, many of the, like the LAP programs do around the country. Um, I would note that that's kind of similar to in Alaska, the freezer long line fishery in Alaska has a a voluntary cooperative. The North Pacific Council reduced the number of licenses in that fishery to the extent where the sector could get, or the groups could get together, the license holders could get together and form a voluntary cooperative among themselves with that. And so because they did that on a voluntary basis, they don't receive uh, a permit with a specific quota amount assigned to it. And therefore they're not subject to cost recovery either. And so those are the two kind of programs that I know about that operate like cooperative programs around the country that aren't subject to cost recovery. Um, in the Northeast sector, the, the percentage of quota harvested varies by year, but for the most highly valued species is, is well under 100%. There's a table in the document that I was able to provide um, looking at this, um, the last 10, 15 years. I can't remember exactly how many years it was at this point. Um, but you can see that in, for a lot of the species, um, it was 50% or 60% or less of the highly valued species. Next slide, please. The other issue that was specifically asked that I look at um, coming from the gap um, when I brought this in September was to look at the monitoring program in the Northeast. Um, prior to 2013, the monitoring program was structured to achieve a 30% coefficient of variation for discard estimates. And because the, the, the sectors are managed, um, the, 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 the apportionments to the sectors are managed based on deductions for both catch, for landed fish and discard fish. They tried to achieve this 30% coefficient of variation to have a reasonable estimate of discards. In the, to be deducted. Um, in, in a lot of years, they did not achieve that, that coefficient of variation, and it was increased in some years over time. In 2023, they implemented Amendment 23. Um, and for the next four years, um, their goal is to have 100% monitoring on trips if fun federal funds are available to support the, the costs. In years five and beyond, the target is 40%, but allows for increased ACSI monitoring coverage in years five and beyond if there's federal funding available. Looking at what the coverage rates that were actually realized in the fishery from 2010 through 2019, it ranged from about 14 to 32%. And for most years, it was 100% federally funded. There were two years where part of the year was funded by industry, um, but it was about they probably paid about 13% of the total cost in those years. 
Next slide, please. Um, the British Columbia Groundfish IVQ program. Um, this catch here, they in integrated the groundfish fishery and the sablefish fishery into a single catch care program in 2006. The program assigned catch history to about 140 groundfish licenses and about 40 vessels are currently active in that fishery. Um, again, this program has been pretty successful in meeting its conservation and management objectives. There are a few rockfish species that are still th threatened or endangered um, under the program, but overall it's been pretty successful. The fishery requires 100% at sea monitoring or EM and 100% shoreside monitoring. It's 100% funded by industry. I would note that it was in 2020 after a two year pilot program that EM went into place for the at sea monitoring and it was done because of COVID issues and the reluctance to place at sea monitors on vessels at that time. So they did a really quick turnaround um, within like a one week period of saying, okay, you don't have to have at sea monitors and it's okay to use EM. Um, the way they do cost recovery or their version of cost recovery is different from what we do in the, in the US. They, they kind of tack a fee on to their trawl licenses. So trawl licenses are issued on an annual basis based on a flat fee, plus a fee for each pound of allocated species assigned to the license. And the, the, the cost per pound, or the fee per pound varies by species and it's kind of based on the value of the species that, that's assigned to the license. And as we go through the tables a little later, you'll see what, how that kind of compares to the, the cost recovery fees in our program. Um, there was a request that, you know, we consider using a ground fish equivalents, kind of like they do in, in the British Columbia program for caps and, and, and usage. And I provide information in the document and how, how they did it, the, these, um, groundfish equivalents for cap, determining caps and things. And it was essentially, it was based on the value of the relative species with, you know, hake um, being like 0.14, POP being one, and sablefish being like 6.3. So in, for determining caps, it would take 45 pounds of, of hake to equal one pound of sablefish in the cap calculations. It's just a different way they did things. Next slide, please. The Alaska Pollock Program uh, was formed in 1999 for the catcher processor sector um, and 2000 for the mothership and shoreside sectors. All shoreside catcher vessels are required to have 100% monitoring coverage. Uh, motherships and catcher processors are required to have 200%. Catcher vessels delivering to motherships aren't required to have observers on board because it's done at the catcher, um, the, the mothership level. The information um, or the quota that's allocated are, are pollock and Chinook salmon under that program. And pollock quotas are harvested at pretty close to 100% of the allocation each year. Next slide, please. Um, and I included the Central Gulf of Alaska Rockfish Program. It's a trawl catch share program in Alaska that's specific to the Central Gulf of Alaska. Um, it, all the catch um, harvested under this catch share program must be delivered to the community of Kodiak, Alaska, the processors located in that community. Um, the pilot program expired 10 years after it was implemented. Um, and NIMS was required to renew the permits under most catch share programs. It's a 10 year permit, but it's automatically renewed unless um, the council decides to change the program. They did something a little bit different under that program. And they spent quite a bit of time and money um, reauthorizing the program after 10 years because they had to go through the entire process of, of renewing those permits. Um, catch share vessels have 100% monitoring coverage. EM is currently not an option in this fishery. Uh, as it is in the Pollock fishery that was just passed a few meetings ago. And plants are also have, required to have 100% coverage. The cost recovery fees from 2018 through 2022 range from 2.53% up to 3% um, over those years. Um, and so it's pretty close to the 3% cap each year for the cost recovery fees. Next slide, please. 
Um, the data collections. Um, there's some that was some discussion in the previous agenda item about the economic data collections, and because that's really relevant relevant to what I'm trying to do in this this program to look at the costs and compare the costs. Um, as you're well aware, on the West Coast, you conduct annual surveys of catcher vessels, motherships, catcher processors, and first receivers, and you collect very detailed information on both fixed and variable costs. And in the Northeast, at sea observers collect trip level cost data. Um, and as you recall, the coverage levels varied by year, and the fixed costs are collected on a voluntary basis. And so for the for the trip level cost, they have to use an econometric models to cal to um, estimate what the trip cost should be and expand it out to all the unobserved trips. The the fixed costs were conducted on a voluntary basis. The surveys were conducted on a voluntary basis in 2011, 2012, and 2015. Um, because it was a voluntary survey for the trawl sectors, the response rate declined from about 30% in 2011 down to about 7% in 2015. British Columbia does not have an annual cost survey. The information that I utilized in this document was based on 2009 data. I would note that for both the Northeast and British Columbia, I was told that they had surveys conducted for 2022, but the information wasn't available yet. In the Pollock fishery, a very limited data is collected on an annual basis, and that's basically fuel costs and Chinook salmon lease costs. In the Central Gulf Rockfish Program, vessels are required to supply cost information on fuel, fishing gear, and labor costs. And it also includes um, the collection of true li crew license numbers. And this was done in part um, so that the council could understand um, which crew members were participating in that fishery. And it, we've used a lot of that for social analysis that had been conducted. And I know you had an EEJ discussion earlier today. But one of the reasons the council collected that, when they had the crew license number, they could track that crew member, determine where they came from, you know, what, that they're participating in this fishery, and actually have some information where crew are and, uh, and how th that fishery impacts the crew. For shore side processors, we collect labor information on employees by month and, and water and electric usage, and that was collected at the request of Kodiak because they supply the infrastructure for the processors and had to do with how much they needed to ramp up for peak usage. I'd also note that the North Pacific Council is in the process of considering revising all of their economic data collections. And in the North Pacific, they have very detailed data collections for the CRAB rationalization program for the amendment. And um, other fisheries may not be required to provide any information. And so the council is considering revising all their collections to have more of a standardized approach that would apply to all fisheries. And the options they're currently looking at are fairly limited in the amount of information they would collect. Next slide, please. I'm going to walk through a few figures um, using data from the West Coast economic data reports. Um, and I'm just going to use them as examples. As I said before, in the analysis, there's very detailed um, tables in the back of the document and the appendix. And my intent is to provide a lot more summary information, pull it forward in the, the document for the next go around that you would review. But here's an example. This is all the cost data that's collected on the, on the economic data um, collections um, for the California catcher vessels. And this shows the percent of cost um, by each group. Um, it's hard to read, and I apologize. But if you look at the, the figures, the orange towards the bottom shows when um, cost recovery went into place. Those orange bars are the percent of their total re gross revenue at the ex-vessel level that went towards cost recovery. If you look at about halfway up the figure, just past the blue, you can see kind of what was going on with observers and monitoring costs over the time period. 
you can see before the catch up care program went into place, the green bars are relatively small and they seem to increase in size over a time period uh, that's considered. Next slide, please. And since we looked at them on a percent, the cost on a percentage basis, I wanted to also provide it on a dollar basis because it kind of shows a little bit different information. It shows how the value of the fishery has declined over time. And so while the percentages are important um, in, in looking at what costs are, I think it's also important to think about, you know, has the, the program actually resulted in increased value being realized by the catcher vessel? in California. Um, and you can see there's a steady decline with 2017 kind of being an outlier. Um, there's similar uh, figures that I have in the PowerPoint. They're at the back of the PowerPoint. I just didn't want to take time to walk through them all on a state level. Um, next slide, please. This is similar information from other ships. Um, just point out that there's a lot of inconsistency in terms of what the, the, the total cost net revenue is. Uh, the last couple of years, it's been pretty close to zero. In some years, it's, it's higher. Um, just to give you a, a quick view of that. Um, the ne next slide, please. And this is for catcher processors. Again, there's a lot more detailed information in the back, but you can see for the catcher processors, the First wholesale value um, it has increased over time. Um, and the total cost net revenue is positive and it appears to be expand, increasing over time. Next slide, please. This is just a, 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 a piece of information that was derived from the Northeast um, five year review. You can see the data only goes through 2015. And this is looking at the variable costs. And you'll recall that I mentioned that the variable costs are collected on a trip basis and provided by industry. And you can see when the program went into place in 2010, the for, for all sectors, the there's a modest, I would say, increase in, in mean value, um, net value. Um, and the median also shows a modest increase over time. Next slide, please. This is just the summary of information from their their crew from their um, fixed cost surveys that they conducted in 2011, 12, and 15. The four bars on the left um, are for all the fisheries except the Hake fishery, essentially. The bars on the right, the small mesh trawl fishery, represent the Hake fishery, and you can just see how they they changed over time and. The um, the categories that were included in their surveys don't necessarily match up with what we have in our survey and the West Coast. Next slide, please. And then again, this is the BC um, IBQ catcher vessel cost data. Um, you can see the monitoring costs in the at the bottom. Um, the co the license co management fees. Are, are the fees uh, of that license fee that I talked about earlier. Um, and you can see the earnings and the earnings in this case are before interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization. Um, next slide, please. And this is kind of a summary table of, of the various programs and how the costs kind of shake out. And just because of the, the, the costs that have been talked about quite a bit and that seem to be of interest, the license management slash cost recovery fee for the West Coast catcher vessels has averaged 2,000 or 2,000, 2.7% for the years 2014 through 2019. Um, for the catcher processors, it's averaged 0.1%. And in the BC program, um, using <clears throat> their, their license based model, their fee in 2009 was about 2.9 percent. If you look at the next row down, it's the observer's EM um, for West Coast catcher vessels. Again, it's 2.7 percent and it's 0.5 percent for the motherships and catcher processors of their of their um, first wholesale value. And in BC, it was 5.1 percent. And again, it was 5.1 percent in 2009. They've gone to EM, and I assume that that number, that percentage, would decline um, based on their current model. Um, next slide, please. 
This is just a quick look at the shoreside processors. And, and again, I apologize, it's hard to read. Um, but what I was trying to point out was that for the small processors specifically, they had a lot of negative net revenues. And in 2018, that group drops completely out of the figure. Um, it's not because there are no more small processors, but there were too few to report in the data and meet confidentiality requirements. You'd also note that um, there, were, there was negative numbers in some years for negative net revenues in some years for the large processors, medium processors, and the large processors in 2019. If you look closely at the chart, you can see that's largely driven by um, purchases of equipment and, and property that were out of line with other years. Next slide, please. And again, this is a, a quick table summary of the, the various costs that are borne by the, the, the processors of various sizes. You can see that using the 2014 through 2019 numbers, the total net revenue is negative in each case um, on average. Um, for the small processors, you can see that fish purchases and labor make up 105% of their revenue. And so even before you get into those other costs, those two primary components of costs um, make their costs greater than their revenue. Next slide, please. End of work to do. Um, just uh, a, things that I want to do before the next version of the analysis is, is released is add data from the most recent surveys were available. And this may, could include things like um, fish eye data for 2021, that's your cost survey. The 2022 surveys that were conducted in the Northeast and British Columbia. I'd like to add additional information on um, trip costs um, from the New England sectors that are specific to the trawl fishery, update stakeholder feedback to the extent that it's provided, update the document to finalize sections, provide more detailed summaries of information and include additional information that's been requested by the GAP and, and the council and develop an executive summary and conclusion section. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that completes my presentation. All right, thank you very much. I imagine there may be a question or two on the presentation. I'll look right, I'll look left, I'll look right again. Corey Niles, followed by Brad Pettinger. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, just might have a couple questions here, one at a time, though. The um, Can you re just ask me repeat what you said about the processing slide and you, you I just missed what you said about causing them to go negative in the total cost revenue. Your point, I think you were pointing to one thing, but I, I missed what that was. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Niles, um, I, the one thing I was pointing out for the for the large processors was in 2019, um, they, they had a large negative net revenue estimate. And that was largely driven based on what the information in the slide by the purchases of equipment and um, buildings, I think. And so it was probably a processor changed hands or some purchase of a processor. And so that seemed to be driving that big negative number that one year. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, I know it's on slide seven, uh, the first bullet point, it talked about program removed interest in trawling in some regions. And I would challenge that. I think there's processes that are happening prior to rationalization of the fishery. And that was mainly one of the environmental uh, group uh, went out and bought all the trawl permits in central California. And then, uh, so very few trawlers are left. And then, but uh, well, the, the infrastructure that was there wasn't necessarily in great shape when those were bought, but it, I think it really took it past the point of return because there's so few boats there to keep it going. So I would say that the program removed that interest. I would say that was probably not quite accurate. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Pettinger, uh, thank you for that comment. I, I, I think I heard a lot of that in my discussions with industry about infrastructure availability and, and problems with like rock, certain rockfish species before the program went into place. And um, what I was attempting to do in the stakeholder input section was basically tell you what they told me 
without trying to verify the accuracy of it or whether it's doable or any of those things. I, I, I was just trying to give them a platform to, prov to provide concerns. And, and I think your statement is very reasonable and I think it's probably correct. Um, given that you know a lot more about these fisheries than I do. <laughs> um, but, but, but I was just basically trying to reflect what people told me. Go ahead. A couple more questions here, actually. On the sea of the BC ground fish, um, you mentioned that all monitoring is 100% industry funded. Has that changed since 2000? I was up there in 2002, I believe, or 2003. And my understanding that the, at least on the troll vessels, it was 50% industry, 50% government uh, paid for observers back then. Has that changed? Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Pettinger, the information I got for the BC program was based on uh, kind of their annual report as well as a phone call with Bruce Turris. Mm -hmm. And Bruce told me that it was 100% industry funded and I provided the section I wrote up on BC back to him and he verified and provided some edits on that section. So I assume it's correct. Okay, well, Bruce would know. And then um, didn't deal with data collection. Um, we have an annual survey, as you, you know. Um, and the Southern North Pacific uh, Council has um, uh, annual surveys for some of theirs, but it, it, I guess the overall direction they're going is to is the less um, thoroughness of annual surveys like we do, or something to more. What, what are they going towards? Do you think? Um, they're in the process of develop, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Pettinger. Um, they're in the process of developing that currently. Um, and it varies by fishery. Some fisheries don't do anything now, and so they'd be subject to more intensive reporting. Some fisheries um, basically do similar to what you do in this, in the West Coast, in terms of the data collection reporting. I think what they're <clears throat> considering is doing more like we did in the rockfish program when we implemented that, and look more at crew kind of concerns, um, things that may be helpful with EEJ considerations, um, you know, maybe collect some information on fuel or some other specific costs, but not the very detailed, thorough annual surveys that are conducted as you conduct them. Chris Dispenson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you for the comprehensive report. Uh, my question's on slide 24, which is... Um, talking about processor cost summary table. And I'm just wondering, uh, you called out on the small processors, the two categories, fish purchasing and labor, um, came in at over the total cost of net revenue. And in looking at those two line items, fish purchasing is almost double what mid and large size um, percentages are. And labor is significantly less than it's not quite half but i'm just wondering if there's any clarity on on what's causing those drivers to be so radically different between tiers and categories from the research you've done um mr chairman uh, um I, I i would have to do more detailed look at that but my suspicion is that we're looking at a small um processing firm that has a lot less um, costs overall, perhaps um, a lot less investment in capital and things than some of these large processors that have fillet machines, um, you know, botters, all kinds of equipment purchases. And since we're looking at it on a percentage basis, you know, knives are cheaper than a million dollar fish processing machine. And so <laughs> I think it has to do with those kind of relationships, but I'm not 100% certain. I would have to look into it in more detail. Bob Dooley, followed by Corey Niles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Darrell. It's good to see you here again. Thank you, Mr. Dooley. Great report. I know it's halfway there, anyhow, or getting, getting down the line. Um, I didn't have a question on what Krista was talking to, but I do have a comment on that, and maybe you could look into it. I'm, I'm thinking that maybe the small processors that are in there maybe might be uh, sablefish buyers that don't have a lot of maybe processing, you know, overhead, but just something to look at. And I, I don't know that I just, it just occurred to me, but my real question is <clears throat> in the Alaska AFA Pollock program, 
you don't show who pays for the you know the observer coverage, nor do you you look at the uh, the cost recovery. And they know they do pay cost recovery, and uh, the same with the Alaska uh, Gulf Alaska Rockfish program. I don't see the who pays for the observer coverage and how it's paid for. I think there's there's been a change a little bit in the Alaska Pollock program, but over the time of this program until recently, I think they've there's. So I'm just curious, would you? Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dooley, um, in the Alaska Pollock Program, um, the, 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 the Pollock fishery that's under the Catch Air Program, the AFA Program, is, is directly paid for by industry contracting di directly with observer providers. And if you go through the analysis and look at the information I provided, I, I think I came, the, the most recent estimate we did up there was, came out to about $417 per day for observer costs in the Pollock fishery. And that was an analysis that we did when we were looking at comparing at sea observers versus EM costs. And the council just approved um, allowing the AFA um, vessels in the Pollock fishery to use e EM. They've been under a pilot program. And I think the estimate for EM cost per day was about $87 per day, if I remember right. There, the, the Gulf of Alaska Pollock Fishery isn't under um, a catch air program and they pay a 1.65% X vessel fee to cover um, observer coverage and all the vessels, regardless of the fishery they're in, uh, if they're not under a catch air program and uh, uh, have less, they they fall under that 1.65 percent fee instead of paying the the observer companies out of their own pocket. Follow up. Follow up. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Daryl. That's um, good info. I'm. You note in the Alaska pilot program that uh, there's cost recovery fees, but you say they're not a lap. Is it, I, I, um, Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Dooley, the, the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands portion of the Pollock fishery is a lap. The Gulf of Alaska portion is not. And so uh, there is cost recovery fees for the, for the AFA Pollock. There are, uh, like in our fishery, it's a pretty small percentage and they don't have to pay it every year because some years they may overpay and they, they get kind of a credit and they wouldn't have to pay the next year. Things like that have gone on. I just noticed noticing on slide 13, I think it is, the bottom says cost recovery fee percentage 2018 to 22, shows all these different percentages, but you're telling me that's not a lap program? Slide 18, um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dooley, slide 18. It is a lap program, and, and those are the cost recovery fees. They're just in, do, in terms of dollar values, they're so small, they just don't show up on this chart. Okay, thank you. Corey Niles. Yeah, I think I wonder if you could put up a slide 27, which is not one, I, don't, I think it's one of your backup slides here. And I think I finally started to understand these graphs as you were, as you were talking. Um, we've seen similar styles here before, and you showed us California, which was, uh, you showed a decline, but um, I think especially for the, the bottom trawl, which is where a lot of the concern has been, this Oregon is where the state where that fishery really happens. There's not, if you look down a slide, Washington hardly has anyone left for the white, and it's also, you throw in Alaska boats there too. Um, but on, so let me just make me sure I'm, I think I'm following now, but on the Oregon, on that one, so the height of the bar in total of all the bars, bars together is the total amount of revenue that the boats and that on those categories earned in aggregate as a, together all and then the brown bar on top or except in 2020 when it's on the bottom for non wedding is is what we would call um would be most like profit um the blue is you know is, is labor cost which you know i think we understand it goes to captain and crew salaries if, or, or that might fall into there but so am i am i reading these right so we can see that the oregon portion of the bottom trial has been has increased increased over the until about 2017 looks like pretty profitable and then 
hit the pandemic or even dropped in 2009. But am, am I, did I finally re- understand how to read these things? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Nels, you're absolutely correct. Okay. That's exactly how you read these. Okay. And the, the, the bar is basically gross ex vessel revenue for the catcher vessel side. And so the height of the bar shows the total gross ex vessel revenue and the, the components of it listed on the, the chart are how much each of those components composed of the total. Go ahead. And so I get, and they, I'm hoping you'll be available after we hear the, from the advisory bodies and public that if we could still be for questions, but I guess the next step and maybe not for this next phase of your report, but if there is a phase two, I think as you've heard, where are there opportunities to reduce costs? Um, and I guess, and so maybe just have you think about that of, of where, where you would go next to diagnose this. I'm looking at this and looking at the green on the right in the whiting fishery and how it's, you can hardly see the uh, observer's EM anymore on the, the whiting side. You see they're bigger on the, on the non-whiting side, but uh, yeah, I guess just um, if you're willing, after we hear from folks and um, thought in my mind, how would you use this information to help us along with that? You know, where, where is there room to um, reduce cost as, as we were discussing in the, in the, in the previous agenda item. But um, yeah, so I'm, I think I, you nodded your head that you will be available. So that, that would be great. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Niles, I, I will be available after um, you take your other reports. And, and I would also like to note that um, I've been, <coughs> excuse me, talking with Mr. Seeger and, and one of the things that I want to put into the next version of the draft is kind of look at each component of the catch share program elements and kind of talk about where I can, what costs are associated with that component. And, you know, like obvious ones are the increased observer coverage or the cost recovery fee, but there may be other components of the, the program that resulted in costs and to the extent possible, I'd like to provide some sort of summary table to, to talk about those as well. All right, Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Daryl, for the lovely report. Um, it was very informative. I had a question relative to your graph um, on the California overall participation over year, where we see a, a really um, steady decline since you know post implementation of the program. Um, Specifically, my question is, you know, your report speaks to some consolidation in various ports, Central California, no, notably. Um, I'm wondering if in any of your discussions with industry, the the issue came up with a lack of ability to make contact with dockside observers. Um, we've heard some information that as there is less and less participation, there's less and less interest in having staffing availability. And so I'm really, I'm interested in what is the cost of not being able to go fish when you have all the other resources um, lined up. And then some of these observer coverages may be um, more of a hindrance than an ability to fish. So thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, Ms. McKnight. Um, it was mentioned in passing. I wouldn't say people dwelled on that a lot, that it was a huge issue. Um, you know, they spent a lot more time talking about infrastructure and just being able to offload fish in certain areas and getting access to lifts to take the fish off the boat and, and those kinds of things. But I can certainly uh, follow up with people um, and, and talk to them about that. And when I, when I talk to people, I tried not to direct the conversation and have a set list of questions. I wanted people, I wanted people to be able to just tell me what their concerns were and notify them what I was doing without getting into surveys or that kind of thing. Go ahead. Thank you for that response. Yeah. And I, I certainly appreciate that the information flow without any, um, you know, guidance is, is initially a great step to take. Um, I, I think as you move forward, if there's other opportunities to investigate more, some of these specifics, I think it might be a value. Thank you. All right. Further questions before we get to our reports. Thank you very much, but you'll be around. So We'll go now to, we have two reports from the ground fish management team and one from the GAP. So we'll go first to the GMT and Whitney Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, council members. My name, for the record, my name is Whitney Roberts and I will be reading agenda item G3, supplemental GMT report one on trawl cat share cost project update. 
The Groundfish Management Team reviewed Attachment 1 in the briefing book and received a presentation from Mr. Daryl Brannon during our team's webinar on March 27th. The GMT generally does not advise the Council on cost recovery or, or administrative costs associated with West Coast fisheries. However, we did see value in providing some clarifications regarding the draft report's description of the individual fishing quota fishery, and the GMT sees merit in revising the draft report to reflect those clarifications. On page nine of attachment one, the report states that quota pound holders are not credited with an amount of discards that are expected to survive. However, section 2.6.1 of the groundfish stock assessment and fishery evaluation document points out that quota pounds for ling cod caught and discarded in the trawl cat shares fishery are debited from IFQ accounts based on the gear specific discard mortality rates used in stock assessments and year end catch, year -end catch accounting. This is also true for sablefish. Table 212 of the SAFE shows the current ass assumed gear specific discard mortality rates for each species. The GMT also points out some clarifications regarding statements made on page 10 about the at sea whiting sectors, specifically with regard to the catcher vessel obligation requirement and the mothership processor cap. As of January 2023, there is no longer a requirement that catcher vessels be obligated to a mothership ahead of the fishing season, and the mothership processing cap of 45% was removed. Lastly, the GMT is aware that some participants in the trawl cat share fishery were not contacted with an opportunity to provide input. Moving forward, we hope Mr. Brandon is able to contact all fishery participants who may be interested in weighing in and to thoroughly document the outreach methods used within the report. In general, the team appreciated the thorough characterization of stakeholder input received to date and anticipates that the management related requests will be incorporated into the ongoing trawl cat share program review. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Any questions on the GMT report? All right, thank you very much, Whitney. Uh, and now we welcome Dan Waldeck with a gap report. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. I am Dan Waldeck, the at sea processor rep on the Groundfish Advisory Subpanel, and I'll be reading our report on the Trawl Catch Share Cost Project update. The GAP received an overview of this agenda item from Dr. Jim Seeger and a presentation from Mr. Daryl Brannon. The GAP provided detailed recommendations related to the scope of this project in our September 2022 GAP report. The GAP continues to recommend that these topics should be focus areas of this project because the information should be relevant to ongoing discussions about trawl fishery cost recovery and the upcoming review of the CAT shares program. To highlight a specific area of interest, as noted by the GAP in September 2022 and in our current cost recovery report, monitoring costs are one of the most significant costs borne by trawl fishery participants in all sectors, whiting and non-whiting harvesters and at sea and shoreside processors. Therefore, the GAP strongly recommends this be a focus area of this cost project. As detailed in the initial review draft, the current report provides a comprehensive review of the operational aspects of the Grandfish Trawl Cat Share Program and information about other cat share programs. This is helpful background information. However, fishery participant input detailed in the current report is generally more about aspects of the program rather than costs borne by industry for participating in the cat share program. As highlighted above, it would be helpful to document the entirety of costs of these costs including payments to NIMFs for cost recovery and direct industry costs, such as monitoring costs, as well as those from participation in fishery cooperatives and other individual and sector costs. To this end, the GAP encourages Mr. Brannon to continue to seek out industry input. Finally, clearly this project, the cost recovery program and the pending cat share program review are all closely related. The GAP recommends that efforts be made to ensure the cost project information and analyses are informative to ongoing cost recovery program refinements and the CAT share program review. Uh, that ends the GAP report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Dan. Any questions on the GAP report? Thank you. Yeah, all right. And look to see if we have uh, Dr. Seeger. A microphone. Thank you. <laughs> I was anticipating that you were not going to have any public comment. I just want to make a quick comment before going to council discussion. I was just needing to confirm I have none and I'm just received word from on high that we have no public comments. So please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, so just uh, just to set up the uh, council discussion a little bit more, as you've heard now, uh, you'll have a final report from Mr. Brandon coming in September. Uh, this is your opportunity to provide uh, guidance for that report and make requests that are within the scope of the, uh, the contract. Um, I also wanted to note that uh, NIMS was asked for a second year of funding uh, in relation to this project and has indicated that we'll be providing that funding. Uh, so content for the second year of that contract can be taken up when the council receives the final report under the current contract, again, that will be coming up at your September uh, meeting. All right. So we have our action here, which is to provide guidance. And I'll look around the table. Maggie Summer, thank you. You've always rescued us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You weren't in need of any rescue here. Um, I first wanted to uh, thank the council and uh, Mr. Brannon for this work on this project. We really appreciate it. We um, certainly feel that uh, evaluating costs related to the required program elements is, um, is important and we concur with the gaps concluding statement. Uh, we hope that information provided in this report will really help the council as it moves into the program review and considering potential modifications that could provide cost savings and evaluating trade-offs that would come with changes. Um, Mr. Brandon has provided a lot of information in this report and the, the gap has uh, requested more on costs related to items um, both uh, that derive from the program's uh, design and regulations, as well as other costs, labor-related costs, fuel, et cetera. Those are very important contexts, but given the, the council's purview and what we'll be looking at in the program review, I, I certainly would encourage a particular focus on those design elements, as Mr. Brennan noted, since that's where the council would have the potential to, uh, you know, to make changes and to find uh, potential cost savings there. Thanks. Thank you. Lynn Mattis. Lynn, I echo the thanks on the report. Uh, just wanted to go back to the GMT report about trying to reach out to additional participants. Um, I think you've reached out to a fair bit and got a pretty good response rate. And maybe with this draft report being out there, some additional folks will be interested now that they, they know what the information is going to be used for. Um, so just guidance is if possible to reach out for some additional participants for this survey. I think it's a good point in particular based upon what might have been a disconnect um, that uh, Vice Chair Pettinger noted. Bob Dooley. Yep, th th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, I, I think this was excellent go so far, and I agree with Maggie's comments that we should focus on program cost, I think, rather than the profitability of the whole fishery. I think it relates, but probably have enough done there. Um, as far as contacting other people, I know when we spoke last night, you talked about uh, that you contacted permit holders, but there are several different folks even around this table that have a lot to offer. And, you know, how are you going to vet those out, who, who, who to talk to without some maybe recommendations? And maybe there's a place to, for people to actually request to be co for comments. Maybe there's a, a place on a website or someplace to, to do that so that you know who to contact and just a suggestion. But I think this will be very useful information as we go into the catch share review. So um, appreciate the efforts to date, but looking forward to the next one. Thank you. M Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dooley, uh, and, and I do appreciate any suggestions that you may have for how to better reach people. Um, and, and I think the methodology I use may have worked well for small mom and pop um, operations probably worked less well for large industrial um, businesses um, because the email may not be the person that makes those kinds of decisions. 
I do have a pocket full of business cards with me. I'm happy to give them to anyone who wants to give me a call and talk about the project. If you want to create a list of people that I should contact directly, I'm more than happy to do that. I, I'm, I'm more than willing to do whatever the council thinks is the appropriate way to get in touch with the people that I should talk to, and I'm happy to do it. Yeah, I think that using the council as a resource for that is an excellent idea. Let's see if there's further discussion and guidance. Corey Niles? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, a question for, for Daryl on... Um, yeah, on the gaps, I agree with, with comments made, especially where our focus will be is really wanting to um, hone in on what the council has some control over. So I guess the first question I would have is um, the gap has a general request to make this as re relevant as, as you can to our up upcoming um, our, uh, deliberations. Did you have, do you have any thoughts uh, from those discussions with the gap and others um, on, on where you might do that between now and September? Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Niles. Um, yeah, I think we do. Um, in fact, um, Dr. Seeger and I over lunch were kind of going over a, an appendix from the original cat share program that lists each of the um, items in the program. And we were kind of talking about, you know, will this affect costs or will it not affect costs and kind of trying to develop more of a a list of those pieces of um, like levers for the catcher program and talking about do they affect costs or not and talking to the extent we can um, saying what those costs are based on the information that are collected from the economic data reports. And so pulling a lot of that information in a more summary form and, and laying it out specifically in a table are the things that I hope to be able to do between now and the next version. I, I'm the first to admit that the version that you have is, is definitely a work in progress. It's got a lot of information in it, but it's not summarized to the extent that it should be um, for a final report. And, you know, I, you know, to be perfectly honest, Dr. Seeger tried to encourage me to have a, a June initial review when we first started this project. I said, no, I can probably get enough done by April. And of course, Dr. Seeger was probably right. Corey, yeah, thank you for that answer. That's um, that sounds real promising uh, um, to me. And yes, I've I've learned probably listen to Dr. Seeger myself on what you can actually accomplish um, over a certain. But the I guess so. This and Jim is also saying probably don't worry about this now. Um, we're in September after your other report is due. But I'm wondering, just looking and looking at that slide for the slides you put forward from the from the R, from the fishery we we manage and it, it seems to be the bottom trawl sector is is in Oregon is doing pretty well the whiting sectors are doing well in Washington and in, in Oregon um but what we hear your know, costs I think we have a duty under the Magnus Act in, in National Standard 7 I believe in, in National Standard 5 to look at efficiencies and lowering costs but the other I'm kind of wondering, uh, just reading some of the feedback you got, if you have any sense on, you know, from business, it's pretty, you know, you get, you can lower costs or you can, you can increase your revenues. Um, r really the two ways of, of um, growing a business or, or growing profits. Um, and what we hear, especially in the gear, in the context of our gear switching discussions is that revenues are a, 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 an issue and that there was more revenues that, could be earned from from species like Dover sole and thorny heads. Um, so, did you get? Do you have any sense of um, where you would think if your attention to both is warranted? But whether from your your initial discussions of if you've you've had um, what is relatively more important to increasing the value in over a broader geography here, um, you had some discussion about this, the processing sector and, and not growing not growing as, as we had hoped that we would when we started this program, but yeah, any thoughts on the revenue side and what might be, um, are we are we too focused on costs here? Um, is it revenues the more important? Um, what could be possible to look at in a, in a second phase of this, of, of a project? Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Niles, uh, both are important, obviously. Um, uh, and in the focus of this project is certainly on the cost side of things. But there's a placeholder in the document currently where I want to look at um, product or 
quota utilization rates um, in the fishery by species. That was something I had attempted to get into this version of the analysis and I got the request in too late and it took more time than I thought than it, that it would to get that information together to provide some information on, you know, how much of the the fish are being left in the water because oh, achieving a Y was one of the goals of the program initially and how well are, is the council doing at achieving that goal. Um, and so I want to provide some of that information and and some text around it to the extent possible in terms of why people think it might we might not be achieving a why. I know I I got some fairly strong feedback from some members of the whiting fishery um, in, in the mothership sector that they weren't able to deliver maybe only half of their quota because of the, the way the markets are structured and things. Um, and so and so they're both very important um, and and I think we can do better at d documenting those in the analysis. Um, I probably won't get exactly to where people want to go, but it, it'll, it'll be more than is in there currently, certainly. Further discussion or guidance? I'm going to turn to Dr. Seeger and see if he can recap what he has heard, and then I'll turn back to the council and see if that is complete and accurate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think there are uh, two main themes I, I heard. Uh, one is to focus on pro uh, program costs related to design elements that the council might be able to make adjustments to down the road. Uh, another is to uh, conduct this outreach, uh, rely on the council as a research for doing that outreach. Um, and to, to do an, uh, extend the effort that has already been made. Uh, beyond that, there have, has been uh, some other discussion about, as we just finished here, about uh, you know what's more important, costs or, or uh, revenues, and, and some other inquiries into the data. But I think those are the two themes that I've walked away with here at this point. Let me look around the table. I'm not seeing any hands or consternation or negative nonverbal clues. So I think, I think that's where we, we're gonna end this agenda item. Thank you very much, Daryl, for coming and for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. All right. Um, that concludes our agenda for today quite remarkably um, and I don't I'm going to turn to executive director Merrick Burden thank you mr. chairman and uh, I'll ask you later why you're surprised at how remarkable this council is but uh, great work again um, it, it is obvious but yes <laughs> great work again uh, I do not have any announcements for this afternoon all right well, those of you who will be watching the basketball game tonight, um, I hope your team wins. And uh, with that, we'll conclude uh, festivities. We do have one open agenda item. We'll be going over tomorrow on salmon. But other than that, we've completed our business of today's agenda. <laughs>